Hi friends, my name is Maruti and I am the co-founder of Kraku. In this video, we will be looking at 25 very important LRDI sets for CAT. Initially, we will uh, display the question. Please pause the video at that time and try to answer the question on your own. And after that, look at the video solution. We have uploaded this kind of uh, series in the last few years also. So, you can look for other important LRDI sets. The links for all of those videos are given in the description of this video. In addition to it, many people ask me what is the best way to use the remaining uh, days for CAT. I would recommend them to take as many mocks as possible in the run up to CAT. Kraku dash cats are uh, very well prepared and they are expected to be very close to actual examination. Each of the question has been meticulously prepared by me and my team and all the questions have detailed video solutions. Kraku dash cats are taken by thousands of students and I believe that it will benefit you quite a lot. If you don't have time to take all the dash cats, at least take the first five dash cats. I am sure if you are taking a lot of mocks, it will help you on the day of the examinations. In addition to it, we are providing free material. We are providing all the previous papers for CAT, ZAT, SNAP, CMAT, all of them with detailed uh, solutions, both video as well as text solutions. You can download the PDFs in our website. I hope that this video will be useful for you. If you are having any difficulty with respect to any of these LRD assets, please do comment below the video. I look at all of those questions and try to answer them to the best of my ability. I hope that you are preparing well and all the best for CAT. In this question, we are given some information about a concert and the number of people who have attended the concert. It is mentioned that the total number of people who have attended the concert is capital N. These included some men and these included some women. So for example, there were some men who attended the concert and there were some women who attended the concert. The information that is given to us is that the tweets by all the men were unique. The number of tweets by all the men were unique. And similarly, the number of tweets by all the women were also unique. It is given that amongst the men, Sheru tweeted the most. So let us say that Sheru tweeted the most. And in women, Sherni tweeted the most. It is also given that the number of uh, nobody tweeted exactly 300 times. So there was no person who tweeted exactly 300 times. It is also given that the number of tweets by Sheru was less than the number of men who attended the concert. And similarly, the number of tweets by Sherni was less than the number of females who attended the concert. So let us assume that the number of men who attended the concert was small n and the number of women who attended the concert was small m. Then capital N which is the total number of people who attended the concert is equal to small m plus small n. We are also given some information that the number of tweets by Sherni is less than that of Sheru and the difference in the number of tweets by Sheru and Sherni is equal to the number of females who attended the concert which is equal to small m as we have assumed. This is the information that is given to us. Now if you look at it, we are told that all the tweets, the number of tweets by all the men were unique. Same is the case for the number of tweets by all the women. We are also told that the number of tweets by Sheru is less than the total number of men who attended the concert. So if the number of tweets by Sheru was say some number f, we are told that f is less than n. Now the person who has tweeted lesser than Sheru who has come second in the number of uh, tweets if say he has tweeted some number say G then G will be less than F and it will be less than N and so on. Now if you fill up the table of all the men and put the number of tweets by all of them you would get that there are N entries in this table. Now there are N entries in the table because there are N men all the entries are also unique. But we are told that the largest amongst them, that is F, is less than N. The only way in which this is possible, that is the only way in which you can put uh, N unique numbers, N unique uh, whole numbers, all of which are less than small n, will be if all the numbers are 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 till N minus 1. If for example, Sheru has uh, tweeted any number which is much less than N minus 1, you will not be able to find n numbers less than the number of tweets by Sheru, all of them being unique. The only way this is possible is if the n numbers are 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 till n minus 1. So we can assume, we can infer that the number of tweets by Sheru is n minus 1. The male who has tweeted second highest would have tweeted n minus 2 and so on. And there will be one man who has tweeted once and there will be one man who has tweeted 0 times. That is, he has never tweeted. This is the distribution of all the tweets by the men and you would get a similar distribution for all the tweets by women. So for example, we know that Sherni also has tweeted 
less than the total number of females who have attended the concert which we have assumed as m and we are also told that all the tweets the number of tweets by all the women is also unique that is again if you list down all the women in descending order of the number of tweets you will get m entries all the m entries are unique whole numbers and we are told that the highest amongst them is actually less than m the only way this is possible is if the highest is m minus 1 the second highest is m minus 2 and so on and the smallest amongst them is 0 so this is for the men and for the women the number of tweets are 0 1 2 dot 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 till m minus 1 we are also given one more information we are told that the number of tweets by sheru minus the number of tweets by sherni is equal to the number of females who attended the concert what is the number of tweets by sheru it is n minus 1 and what is the number of tweets by sherni this is minus m minus 1 this is equal to m which is the number of females who attended the concert this would imply that n minus m is equal to m or n is equal to 2m therefore the number of men who attended the concert is 2m and the number of women who have attended the concert is m and the total number of people who have attended the concert which is m plus n is equal to 3m we are also given one more information just to keep in mind that no person has tweeted exactly 300 times this is basically the information that we have let us go ahead and try to answer the questions that follow If the total number of people who attended the concert is 30, that is we are given that n is equal to 30. What is the value of n? As we have discussed earlier, the value of n is 3m. So m will equal 10. This is the number of women who attended the concert. Therefore, the number of men who have attended the, the concert is twice that of the women, which is 20. Then what is the total number of tweets that the people who attended the concert have tweeted? Now we have discussed earlier, if you are dividing it amongst men and women the man who has tweeted the most is sheru he would have tweeted n minus 1 so that is 19 times the second highest would have tweeted 18 times and so on and finally the lowest has tweeted zero times this is the only way in which you are going to get 20 unique entries all of them being uh, distinct from each other and all of them are whole numbers which are greater than or equal to zero note that this 20 comes from the number of men who have attended the concert similarly if you are looking at women the highest has been tweeted by sherni and she would have tweeted m minus 1 which is equal to 9 times the second highest woman would have tweeted 8 times and so on and the least number of tweets by women is by 0 again this is the only way in which you can get 10 unique numbers all of which are integers greater than or equal to 0 such that the highest is less than 10 now if you are counting the total number of tweets the total number of tweets by the men will be 1 plus 2 plus dot 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 till 19 and the total number of tweets by the women will be 1 plus 2 plus dot 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 till 9 the first one you know the sum for the first n natural numbers that is 1 plus 2 plus till dot 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 till n the formula is n into n plus 1 divided by 2 we'll just use it two times in the first case it will be 19 into 20 by 2 this is equal to 19 into 10 which is 190 in the second case it will be 9 into 10 by 2 this is equal to 9 into 5 that is 45 so the total will be 190 plus 45 which is 235 let us look at the next question find the minimum number of people that could have attended the concert we know that the number of women who attended the concert if you have assumed this to be m the number of men will be 2m and the total number of people who have attended the concert will be 3m now can m be equal to 1 in which case the only woman who has attended the concert would be sherni but it has been given that sheru and sherni are not the only uh, people of their gender to have attended the concert so we know that there is at least one other woman who has attended the concert so the minimum value of m has to be 2 which would imply that the number of men which is equal to 2m is at least 4 therefore the total number of people who have attended the concert will be at least 3 into 2 that is 6 so the minimum number of people who have attended the concert is at least 6 now we have to figure out what is the maximum number of people who could have attended the concert 
Now, is there any restriction on the maximum number of people who could have attended the concert? There is only one restriction and that restriction is that there is no person who has tweeted exactly 300 times. The number of tweets by any single person was not exactly 300 times. Now, what we know is that if there are m women and 2m men, the tweets by the women are m minus 1, m minus 2 and so on till 0. And the uh, tweets by the men are 2m minus 1, 2m minus 2 dot 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 till 0. If we are told that there is no person who has tweeted exactly 300 times, it would imply that the maximum value of the highest of all these numbers has to be 299. Or this would imply that 2m minus 1 has to equal 299 or 2m will equal 300 or m will equal 150. So the maximum number of women who can attend the concert is 150 which would imply that the maximum number of men who could have attended the concert is 300. Therefore the total number of people, the maximum number of people who could have attended the concert is 150 plus 300 which is 450. If you get any more people to attend the concert, you will find actually exactly one person who has tweeted 300 times, which is not allowed. Let us look at the next question. If the total number of tweets by the people who attended the concert is 970, find the sum of the tweets by Sheru and Sherni. Again, you have men and you have women. Let us assume that you have M women and 2M men. So the number of tweets by Sheru is 2M minus 1 and the number of tweets by Sherni is M minus 1. So what we are required to find out overall is 2M minus 1 plus M minus 1 that is 3m minus 2. We are required to find out the value of 3m minus 2. Total number of tweets by all the men will be 2m minus 1 plus 2m minus 2 plus dot 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 till 0. And the sum of all the tweets by the women will be m minus 1 plus m minus 2 plus dot 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 till 0. So we can find out the total number of tweets by the men. We can find out the total number of tweets by the women. We can sum them up. We will get a function in m. We will equate that to equal 970. Then calculate the value of m. And then calculate what is the value of 3m minus 2. So in this case the total number of tweets by the men is 1 plus 2 plus dot 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 till 2m minus 1. And the total number of tweets by the women is 1 plus 2 plus dot 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 till m minus 1. The sum is 2m minus 1 into 2m divided by 2. And over here it is m minus 1 into m divided by 2. You can cancel this as 2m square minus m plus m square by 2 minus m by 2. This is equal to 970. You can multiply everything by 2. So you are going to get 4m square minus 2m plus m square minus m is equal to 1940 or 5m square minus 3m minus 1940 is equal to 0. This is a quadratic function. You can easily calculate the value of m. You can use the b square, the quadratic equation formula. That is the root of the quadratic equation ax square plus bx plus c is equal to 0 is minus b plus or minus square root of b square minus 4ac whole divided by 2a. We will apply the same over here or if you want you can even factorize it. If you are looking to apply the same, this would equal or you can even factorize it. So this is 5m square minus 100m plus 97m minus 1940 is equal to 0 or 5m plus 97 into m minus 20 is equal to 0 or m is equal to minus 97 by 5 or 20. The number of women who attended the concert has to be a whole number. It can't be a negative uh, rational number. So the answer has to be 20. So the value of m is 20, which would imply that the total number of tweets by Sheru and Sherni is 3m minus 2. So that is 3 into 20 minus 2. So that is 60 minus 2, which is 58. Google search crack for free cat mock. Click on the first link. You can attempt a free mock test which was attempted by 30,000 cat aspirants in the actual exam format. After completing the test, you get detailed solutions, analysis and percentile along with your scorecard to gauge your All India performance.
click on the solution to get video solutions from our expert faculty. In this question, we are told that there are five friends Ananya, Bharati, Charitra, Deepthi, and Isha. So let's call them A, B, C, D, and D. They have gone for a trip. Now, all of them decided to meet at the airport, but all of them traveled different distances and they used different cars which had distinct speeds and the mileage is also different. So, this is a typical arrangements question where you have to figure out uh, the order in which the cars have uh, the speed of the cars, the distance that the cars have traveled, and the mileage of the cars. So let us first draw a table and the table, the column will be the names of the people. The first column will be the names of the people. The second one will be the mileage. The third will be the speed and fourth will be the distance that the cars have traveled. You can name the all the five people as the five rows one two three four and five so this is a b c d and e now in any arrangements question once you have the table ready iterate through all the clues and figure out what you can fill in and once you have filled out some of the information then keep reiterating and keep filling in as and when you can figure out the information so the speed of Deepthi's car is less than that of Chitra's car and there is no person whose speed is in between them. So in this table we are going to fill out the ranks. So basically for mileage, speed and distance, the number 1 represents the least and the number 5 represents the highest. So for example if you want to say that the mileage of the car that E has travelled in is the highest, we will fill in 5 here. We don't know that but in general we are going to do that. So if we figure out that somebody's mileage is the least, we will fill in 1 in that number. In this case, the first clue says that the speed of Deepthi's car is less than that of Chitra's car. So in speed, Deepthi is less than Chitra and there is no person in between them. So basically they are consecutive numbers. Uh, the mileage of the person who travelled the maximum distance is more than only one other person. So mileage is the rank of mileage is 2 for the person who has travelled the max distance. Ananya travelled the least distance. So Ananya in distance will be Ananya in distance will be 1. The speed of Charitra's car is more than the speeds of 3 other cars. This would imply that Charitra's number would be 4 in speed because her speed is greater than 3 other persons. So Charitra in speed will be 4 while her car has the least mileage. So her mileage is 1. The mileage of Ananya's car is more than that of Deepthi's car. In mileage, Ananya's car is more than that of Deepthi's car. The number of persons whose car has gives less mileage than Bharti's car is 1 more than the number of people who have covered more distance than Charitra. So how many people have covered more distance than Charitra? We don't know that because we don't know how much distance Charitra herself has covered. So we'll keep this, we'll come back to this once we have some more information. The time taken by each of them to reach the destination is the same. This seems like an important clue. What this means is that the time taken by all these people who are traveling different distances to reach the final destination is the same. This would imply that suppose the speed of a person is S and the distance he has covered is D then what is being told is that D by S is the same for all the five people. This would imply that somebody who has more speed also has covered more distance and somebody who has less speed also has covered lesser distance. D and S are basically proportional or the ranks of a person in speed and the rank of a person in distance is exactly the same. So we will fill in whatever information that we can fill in. So for example in Ananya's case we know that she has travelled the least distance this would imply that she has the least speed. Similarly, in Charitra's case, we know that her uh, rank in speed is 4, that is, she is the second highest. So, she has also travelled the second highest distance, which is 4. Now, we have filled in some information. Let us reiterate through all the points and try to use whatever we can to fill in the data. For example, the speed of Deepthi's car is less than that of Charitra's car. So, this would imply that the speed of Deepthi's car would be 3 because we know that there is nobody in between Deepthi and Charitra and therefore her distance is also 3. 
So this we have completely used up now. The mileage of the person who has traveled the maximum distance is more is uh, more than one other person. That is this, but we are yet to figure out who has traveled the maximum distance. The maximum distance would have uh, uh, the number five. That can be either Bharti or that can be person E Isha. But what we know is whoever has traveled the maximum distance, the mileage number over there would be two. Ananya has traveled the least distance. This we have completely taken care of because we have put in one in the table. Speed of Charitra's car is more than the speed of three other person's car while her car has the least mileage. This also we have completely used up by the row for Charitra. The mileage of Ananya's car is more than that of Deepthi's car. So over here Ananya's car and Deepthi's car mileage is more but again we haven't uh, used it much because we don't know what is the, the, mile, the rank of Deepthi's car in mileage uh, column. So we don't even know the uh, rank of Ananya's car in the mileage column. So we'll keep it. We won't cross it. The number of persons whose car gives less mileage than Bharati. So the mileage rank of Bharati is one more than the number of persons who have covered more distance than Charitra. How many people have covered more distance than Charitra? Her rank is four. So there is only one person who has covered more distance than Charitra. This would imply that the number of persons whose car gives less mileage than Bharati is 2. Therefore, in mileage, the rank of Bharati will be 3. Now, this would imply that the person who has traveled the maximum distance has to be Isha because we knew that the person who has traveled the maximum distance is either Bharati or Isha. We have the ranks of all the other people, 1, 3 and 4. And amongst these two, we also know that the person who has traveled the maximum distance, the mileage rank will be 2. This would imply that there is only one person remaining and that is Isha. So her speed is 5 and her distance is 5 and hence her rank in mileage is 2. Now there are only two numbers remaining in the speed and distance. So this will be 2 for Bharati. And in mileage we also know that in mileage there is a relationship between A and D. Let us just go again so that we won't make any mistake. The mileage of Ananya's car is more than that of Deepthi's car. So in mileage, Ananya will be 5 and Deepthi would be 4. So now we have filled in the table. Now let us go ahead and answer the questions that follow. The mileage of whose car is the maximum? The mileage of Ananya's car is the maximum. Remember that 5 represents the highest and in mileage column, Ananya has 5. The speed of whose car is the maximum? The speed and distance of Isha's car is the maximum. Who among the following is ranked the same in mileage and distance? So if you're looking at mileage and distance covered or mileage and speed basically, it is not Ananya, it is not B, it is not C because 1 and 4 are different, 4 and 3 are different and 2 and 5 are different. So for all 5 of them, the ranks of mileage and distance are different. So the correct answer will be none of this. Which among the following statements is true? The mileage of Bharti's car is more than that of Ananya's car. In mileage column, if you are comparing Bharti and Ananya, Bharti is 3 and Ananya is 5. Therefore, Bharti's car has lesser mileage than Ananya. So this is not true. The mileage of Isha's car is less than that of Deepthi's car. Isha and Deepthi, Isha's rank is 2 and Deepthi's rank is 4. So Isha's car has lesser mileage than Deepthi's car. So this is true. So the answer is B. But just for completion, let us look at C and D also. Bharti traveled with the maximum speed. This is false. Isha traveled with the maximum speed. The speed of Deepthi's car is more than that of Isha's car. In the speed column, rank of Deepthi is 3 and Isha is 5. So Deepthi traveled with lesser speed than Isha, not more than Isha. So this is also false. So the correct answer is option B. We at Traku provide all the previous year CAT papers along with many other MB examinations such as IIFT, ZAT, SNAP, MAT, CMAT, TIS and PGDBA in the actual exam format. You can attempt them as a test and get a detailed analysis of your performance or download them as PDFs. In this question, we are given a graph, we are told that this graph represents the distribution of uh, papers 
in three cities. There are three papers. It is the Hindu, the Times of India and the Indian Express. We have been given the total distribution of these three newspapers. It is given as 1000, 1500 and 1800. So this distribution is across three cities. The three cities are A, B and C. Now how do we know how much of each of the paper is distributed in all the three cities? We know that by looking at the graph. The graph might initially seem to be very complex but it is actually quite easy to understand. So if you look at the graph, for example if you are looking at the Hindu, in the 75% line there is no city. In the 50% line there is only one city that is A. In the 25% line there are two cities that is B and C. So for A, B and C, for the Hindu, if you are looking at the percentages, A is 50%, B and C are 25%. Each. The total also adds up to 100%. Similarly, if you are looking at the Indian Express, in the 75% line there is no city. In the 50% line there is city C. So for Indian Express, the distribution in city C is 50%. In 25% there are two cities. There is city A and city B. So this is 25% and this is 25%. Similarly for Times of India, in 25% there are two cities A and C. So this is 25% and this is 25%. And in 50% there is B. And in 75% there is no city. So here we know the distribution by percentage of all the three newspapers across the three cities. Now we have been given the total distribution for Hindu it is said that it is 1000. For Times of India it is 1500. And for Indian Express it is 1800. Now this will help us in identifying how much of the newspaper is sold in each of the three cities. We will again draw a matrix basically a table. This is A, this is B and this is C. For Hindu the total production is 1000 of which 50% is sold in A so that is 500. 25% is sold in B so that is 250. And 25% is sold in C so that is also 250. If you are looking at Times of India the total distribution is 1500 of which 25% is in A so that is 375. That is basically 25% into 1500. 50% is in B, so that is 750. And 25% is in C, so that is again 375. Similarly, if you are looking at Indian Express, the total distribution is 1800, of which 25% is in A, so 25% of 1800 is 450. 25% is in B, so again 25% of 1800 is 450. And 50% is in C, so that is 900. Now if you are looking at the total viewership or the total readership across all the three cities, across the three newspapers, in A the total will be 500 plus 375 plus 450. So if you add them up this will come to 500 plus 300 is 800 plus 400 is 1200 plus 125 is 500, 1200 so 1325. 250 plus 750 is 1000 plus 450 is 1450. And for C it is 950, 200 plus 300 is 500 plus 900 is 1400 plus 125 is 1525. So now we know how many newspapers of all the three types are sold in each of the three cities respectively. Now let us go ahead and answer the questions that follow. Let us look at the first question. By what percentage is the circulation of newspapers in the city with the least number of newspapers less than that of the city with the highest number of newspapers? The least number of newspapers we have seen were sold in city A, they were 1325 and the highest number were sold in city C, they were 1525. So the required percentage is 1525 minus 1325 divided by 1525 into 100. This is equal to 200 divided by 1525 into 100. You can use your calculator or you can simplify this further as uh, by dividing both the numerator and denominator with 25. This is equal to 8 by 61 into 100 so that is 800 by 61. You can calculate this, this will be approximately 13.11%. So 
So the required answer is 13.11%. Let us look at the second question. Which of the following cities has the highest circulation of newspapers? That is city C. The production in exactly one of the newspaper companies doubled while the production in the other two companies and the distribution of the uh, newspapers in the three cities have remained the same. Which of the following could be the maximum percentage increase in the total number of newspapers in any city? So if you look at the distribution initially, in A it is 1325. In B, it is 1450 and in C, it will be 1525. Now, if the production of the newspapers has doubled, for example, if uh, the Hindu has doubled, we will consider all the three cases. Case 1 is when the Hindu has doubled its production. Case 2 is when the Times has doubled its production and case 3 is when Indian Express has doubled its production. In each of the three cases, we will find out which of the city has the maximum increase in its uh, distribution maximum increase in the number of newspapers that are sold and out of these three cases we will pick the highest so for example when the hindu doubles its production thousand additional newspapers of the hindu are sold and they are sold again in what uh, percentage they will be sold in 50 percent 25 percent and 25 percent so in the case where hindu doubled the additional newspapers that are sold will be 500 in a 250 in B and 250 in C. So clearly the maximum percentage increase will be in A which will be equal to 500 by 1325. This is the first case. In the second case times has doubled its production and what is the percentage uh, distribution it is 25, 50 and 25. So the additional 1500 that are being distributed will be distributed according to 375 in A, 750 in B and 375 again in C. In this case, which city will have the maximum percentage increase? Clearly, it will be B, which will be 750 by 1450. This is the second fraction. And what is the third fraction? The third fraction is when Indian Express has doubled its production. So in addition to the 1800 that it was selling earlier, now it is selling 1800 more. And in what percentage are these 1800 distributed? They are distributed in 25, 25 and 50 percent. So that will be 450, 450 and 900. So out of these three cities, which city will have the highest increase in percentage terms? It will be city C. The increase will be 900 by 1525. This is the third fraction. So out of these three increases, which is the maximum? You can clearly see that one is less than half, 50%. Even the second one is just about greater than half because 750 into 2 is 1500. But the third one is clearly much greater than half. So the answer will be the third one, which we can just simplify. So the required answer will be 900 by 1525 into 100. If you are dividing this by 25, the numerator and denominator, that is, will be 36 by 61 and 3600 because you multiply it with 100. So the required answer is 3600 by 61. If you simplify this, you can use your calculator. The answer will be 59%. Let us look at the last question. All the three newspaper companies decide to start circulating in a new city called D and the way in which they give distribution to D is 20% of A, 30% of B and 20% of C are diverted from these respective cities to D. Now by what percentage is the number of newspapers in B more or less than the number of newspapers in D? So how many newspapers will be there in D? There will be 20% of A, that is 20% into 1325, 30% from B, so that is 30% into 1450 and 20% from C, so that is again 20% into 1525. If you simplify this, so this is 1325 by 5, so this is equal to 265. 30% of 145 will be basically 1450 will be 145 into 3 which is 435 and 20% of 1525 will be basically 1525 by 5 so that is 305. So if you sum this up 265 plus 435 is 700 plus 305 is 1005. 
this is the distribution of D. This is the number of newspapers that are sold in D. How many newspapers are now sold in B? Initially, there used to be 1450. But of that 1435 are diverted to D. So the remaining will be 1450 minus 435. So that will be 1015. So the percentage of uh, newspapers which are sold more in B as compared to D will be 1015 minus 1005 divided by 1005. So that will be 10 divided by 1005 into 100. You can approximate this as 1% because this will be 1000 divided by 1005. So that will be slightly less than 1% but the correct answer is the one which is closest uh, to it so that is 1%. Google search Kraku Cat Formulas PDF. Click on the first link. You will get a list of topics for cat. Click on one of the topics. Download the PDF to get a list of formulas for the topic. In this question we are told that there is a online grocery store which delivers groceries in Mumbai and it, it has been told that or it has been observed that out of every 100 products that uh, the company produces then 25% of them are defective that is 75% of them are good and 25% of them are defective they are bad now having 25% as defective products which are being delivered is actually bad so what they wanted to do is they wanted to decrease it Normally in any business you can't uh, make the defective products to be equal to zero but you can always try to improve upon what you have currently. So then they started something called a conveyor belt. So a conveyor belt goes through all the 100 products and it will identify if a, per, if a product is defective it will identify it 85% of the time. But there is also an issue with it that uh, even a non-defective product if 100 of them are sent then 15% are identified as defective. Now once something is identified as defective by the conveyor belt irrespective of whether it is actually defective or not the product is uh, returned back to the warehouse and there is no profit or loss on this and only the products which are identified as non-defective are actually dispatched. Now once a product has been dispatched based on whether it is defective or non-defective there are different profit and loss situations which we will see as we are going to go ahead and answer the questions. But before we do it, to understand better as to how many goods are being delivered based on how many goods the company actually has, let us try to calculate the ratios. Again, just for ease of calculations, purely on basis of ease of calculations, let us assume that the company has say 2000 goods with it. So initially it has 2000 goods. Some of them are defective, some of them are not defective. These are 2000 goods. This is the total. Now the percentage of goods which are non-defective is 75%. So 1500 of them are non-defective and 500 of them are defective. This is normally the case. Without the conveyor belt they would dispatch all the 2000 goods and based on the feedback their profit and loss will differ. But because they want to avoid giving away so many defective goods they have brought the conveyor belt. Now out of this 2000 goods it will go through all of them and for non-defective goods it will identify some as defective and for defective goods it will identify some as non-defective. Just to get an understanding in the 1500 non-defective goods it has it identifies 15% of them as defective. So 15% of 1500 so if you are looking at a total of 2000. Fifteen hundred of them are good; they are non-defective, and five hundred of them are defective. Out of the fifteen hundred uh, non-defective one, an ideal conveyor would identify all fifteen hundred as non-defective. But because it identifies fifteen percent of non-defective goods as defective, so fifteen percent of fifteen hundred is two hundred and twenty-five. So two hundred and twenty-five it will identify as defective. And the remaining 85% that is 1500 minus 225 that is 1275 it will identify correctly as non-defective. These were non-defective goods and it is identifying them as non-defective. As far as the 500 defective goods are concerned again if the machine was perfect it would identify all 500 of them as defective. But the machine is not perfect it can identify only 85% of the goods as defective. So of the 500 goods 85% of them which will be 85 into 5 which will equal 425 
will be identified as defective and the remaining 75 even though they are defective the machine will automate uh, will identify them as they are non defective they are good uh, products so what will happen in this case is out of the 2000 goods that you have totally 225 and 425 that is a total of 650 will be returned back to the warehouse and 1350 are actually delivered to the customer of these 1350 1275 are actually good these are non defective products which are actually identified as non defective products and there are additionally 75 defective products which the machine has categorized as non defective so this is basically how things work this we have assumed if the total number of goods which are there which are produced or which are there with the company are 2000 then this is how the this is the proportion in which each of the uh, flowchart will go through that is 650 will return back to the warehouse 1350 are delivered to the customer of which 1200 1275 are good and 75 are defective now once we have identified how things are let us try to go ahead and answer the questions that follow this navratras the gib gasket dispatched 27000 orders on day one so the total number of orders delivered is 27000 after using the conveyor belt setup how many defective products will be delivered to the customer so if you look back and uh, think of what exactly happened out of the 2000 products 650 are actually returned back to the warehouse so the only products which are delivered are 1350 now if 1350 products are delivered 1275 are good and 75 are defective now if 27000 are delivered then how many are defective that is quite easy to answer that will be 27000 divided by 1350 into 75 this you can simplify as 20 so this will be equal to 1500 so if 27000 goods are delivered then 1500 of them will be defective and 25500 will be non defective so the correct answer is 1500 profit and loss is calculated only on the dispatch products again as we have discussed earlier and uh, which has been stated multiple times if there are 2000 products in the company and 650 are returned to the warehouse they don't influence the profit and loss calculations the profit and loss calculations are only influenced by the 1350 which are actually delivered to the customer so in this case we are told that the store earns 24 percent on every non-defective product which is dispatched and it earns a loss of 40 percent on every defective product that is dispatched the conveyor belt itself costs one percent of the of every product that is dispatched what will be the net profit percentage of the store assuming that the cost price is the same so let us assume that the cost price of all the products which are delivered is 1 rupee let us again assume that 1350 products are delivered why are we assuming this to be 1350 because we know that the ratio of good to defective products is 1 to 75 is to 75 we have done this calculation so it makes the calculations easier so let us assume that the total number of products which are dispatched is 1350 so the total cost price of the goods which are dispatched is the total cost price is 1350 but you have to add 1% as the conveyor belt setup fee so the total cost price the effective cost price will be 1350 into 1 1.01 we are just adding the 1% for the conveyor belt setup now how much revenue did they get the total selling price the total revenue is dependent on how many products are actually non defective and how many products are defective out of this 1350 as we have discussed earlier 1275 will be non defective and 75 will be defective and for every non defective product we are making a profit of 24% so the selling price will be 1.24 and for every defective product that is for 75 defective products the selling price will be because there is a loss of 40% the selling price will be only 0.6 now using this calculation we can get the total selling price you can use your calculator to do this calculation which i will also do so it is 1275 into 1.24 is 1581 plus 75 into 0.6 is 45 so the total is 1626 and the total 
कॉस्ट प्राइस इज वन थ्री फाइव जीरो इंटू वन पॉइंट जीरो वन दिस इज वन थ्री सिक्स थ्री पॉइंट फाइव सो यू आर द टोटल सेलिंग प्राइस एंड यू आर द टोटल कॉस्ट प्राइस यू कैन इजीली कैलकुलेट द नेट प्रॉफिट परसेंटेज विच इज बेसिकली द डिफरेंस बिटवीन दिस टू दिस इज वन सिक्स टू सिक्स सो दिस इज टू हंड्रेड एंड सिक्सटी टू पॉइंट फाइव दिस इज द प्रॉफिट परसेंटेज इज टू सिक्सटी टू पॉइंट फाइव डिवाइडेड बाई द टोटल सेलिंग टोटल कॉस्ट प्राइस सो दैट इज वन थ्री सिक्स थ्री पॉइंट फाइव into 100%. So if you do this calculation, you can use your calculator to do it. You are going to get the answer as approximately 19.25%. So the correct answer you can find it even in the options is 19.25%. Now let us go ahead and solve the third question. The next question says that after a lot of testing, they actually bought the conveyor belt setup. Initially it was only on hire, only rented, so they were paying 1% commission. Now to pay that they had to pay 2 lakhs for the entire setup and again the store runs 24% for every non-defective product and 40% loss for every defective product that is dispatched. Now we are required to find out what is the minimum number of products that the store needs to dispatch so that they can be more profitable in this setup as compared to the no conveyor setup provided that the cost price of every product is 2000. So let us calculate both the cases and then we will equate to see how many products need to be dispatched. Let us assume that the number of products that need to be dispatched is n and let us uh, assume that the cost price even though it is given as 2000, let us assume that this is equal to c, we will substitute the value of 2000 in c towards the n because this will just make our calculations easy and not very clumsy. We will substitute the value of c as equal to 2000 towards the n. We are doing this just because it will make our calculations easy. There won't be any clumsy calc multiplications that are involved. If there are any simplifications or cancellations, we can do that easily. So let us assume that the cost price is C. Now let us calculate what will be the total profit in the first case. And then we will calculate what is the total profit in the second case after we are using the uh, conveyor belt. And then we will uh, try to equate and get the value of N. In the first case, that is without a conveyor belt. The total number of goods dispatched is n out of which 70% are non-defective. So 3 by 4 of n are good and 1 by 4 of n are defective. The cost price is still the same. The total cost price is n into c. Now 3 by 4 n would give us a profit on each one of them as 3 by 4 n into 1.24 c. And in the second case, it will be 1 by 4n, the total selling price, into 0.6c. Therefore, the total revenue in the first case will be 3 into 1.4, 1.24, plus 0.6, whole divided by 4 into nc. This is 3.6, 3.72, plus 0.6 is 4.32 by 4 nc, which is equal to 1.08 nc. This is the total selling price that is by selling n uh, products how much uh, profit did they make how much revenue did they make therefore the profit will be total selling price that is 1.08 nc minus the total cost price that is nc so the profit is equal to 0.08 nc in the first case whenever they are dispatching n products now let us look at the second case in the second case As we have discussed earlier, after they are using the conveyor belt, if they have actually dispatched 1350 of them, 1275 will be correct, which will be, be non-defective, and 75 will be defective. Now, in this case, again, if they are dispatching N goods, then the total cost price will be NC, but in this case, they also have to buy that conveyor belt, which cost them 2 lakhs. So, it will be NC plus 2 lakhs. This is 2000, 20,000 and 2 lakhs. The total selling price will differ though. In the total selling price, if they are dispatching N products, how many of them are actually good and how many of them are bad? The fraction of defective will be 75 divided by 1350. This is equal to 1 by 18 because it is 75 into 4 is 300 
so 75 into 16 is 1200 so it is 1 by 18 and 17 by 18 will be non-defective so 17 by 18 will make up for the 1275 and 75 will make up for the 1 by 18 so the total selling price is 17 by 18 into 1.24 nc this is the revenue that they make from the non-defective goods plus 1 by 18 into 0.6 nc so again you can use your calculator to find out this will equal by 18 17 into 1.24 will equal 21.08 plus 0.6 nc this will equal 21.68 by 18 nc if you simplify this this will come to approximately 1.2044 nc this is the total selling price now what is the profit in the second case the profit will be 1.2044 nc minus nc this is the profit this is equal to 0.2044 nc there is also a 2 lakhs which you shouldn't forget so this is 20,000 2 lakhs so the total profit is 0.2044 nc minus 2 lakhs this is the profit in the second case when they are using the conveyor belt and the profit in the first case without using the conveyor belt is 0.08 nc you want the profit in the second case to be greater than the profit in the first case so you want this to be greater than 0.08 nc or you want 0.1244 into n into c to be greater than 2 lakhs c if you substitute c as equal to 2000 remember what we have discussed earlier that we will substitute it towards the end so this will become 100 so the value of n should be greater than 100 divided by 0.1244 you can use your calculator again to calculate the exact answer so 100 divided by 0.1244 comes to roughly around 803.6 so you want at least 804 you want to dispatch at least 804 products so that the profit in the second case that is after using the conveyor belt is greater than the profit in the first case GIB plans to deliver 33 750 products this is the number of products that they want to actually deliver and it can't deliver any product that has been identified as defective by the conveyor belt what is the minimum number of products that GIB should produce to meet the target remember what you have discussed earlier if GIB produces 2000 products the number of products which are dispatched is only equal to 1350 and out of this 1350 1275 are good and 75 are bad the remaining 650 are returned back to the warehouse you should remember that and you should notice that some of the products which are returned to the warehouse are actually good but they have been identified as defective by the conveyor belt the number of goods which were good but were uh, returned to the warehouse is 225 we have done these calculations earlier so if 2000 goods are actually produced only 1350 are delivered so if 2000 goods are produced 1350 are delivered if 33750 products are delivered then how many goods need to be produced the answer is quite simple it will be 2000 divided by 1350 into 33750 again you can use your calculator to get the answer for this it is 33750 divided by 1350 so this is actually 25 so 2000 into 25 is 50,000 so if GIB actually produces 50,000 goods the conveyor belt will identify 33,750 as non-defective and they will be dispatched. You can actually do more calculation out of this 33,750, uh, 17 by 18 will be actually correct which they will be non-defective that is 31875 will be non-defective and the remaining will be approximately 1875 they will be defective goods. There will be defective goods which are miscalculated or misidentified by the conveyor belt as non-defective and they will also be dispatched. This will give them a loss. Anyway, the question that was asked is, what is the number of goods that JIB should produce? That is 50,000. In that case, the conveyor belt will identify 33,750 goods as non-defective and they will be dispatched. Google search crap for free cat mock. Click on the first link. You can attempt a free mock test which was attempted by 30,000 cat aspirants in the actual exam format. After completing the test, 
you get detailed solutions analysis and percentile along with your scorecard to gauge your all india performance click on the solution to get video solutions from our expert faculty in this question we are given two line charts they represent the sales and the expenses of two companies a and b this is the sales chart and this is the expense chart both these information both these financial details are given for 6 years starting from year 1 to year 6 but they have been indexed to year 1 so if you look at the line charts of uh, sales for example both of them start at 100 for year 1 they go to 120 and 110 for year 2 and so on so we don't know the exact amount of sales for both the companies over the 6 years but we are given a ratio of their sales with respect to their respective sales in year 1 similarly if you are looking at the expense report both the companies have been indexed to their expense in year 1 respectively so for example you know that the expense of uh, company a in year 2 is 130 and year 1 is 100 so we know that it is 30% more in year 2 we don't know exactly what the numbers are and we can't even compare the expenses of uh, company 1 and company 2 company a and company b we can only compare the expenses across the years for company a and sales across the years for company a and b both expenses and sales we can compare only with respect to the same company so let us try to put the information that is given in both the line charts in a table so that it makes it easy for us to compare the performance across the years of both the companies let us assume that the sales of company a in year 1 is 100a therefore the sales in year 2 will be 120a sales in year 3 will be 140a in year 5 in year 4 is 150a in year 6 is 180a in year 5 and in year 6 is 160a similarly let us assume that the sales of company of uh, company b in year 1 is 100b so its sales in year 2 is 110b its sales in year 3 is 125b its sales in year 4 is 140b its sales in year 5 is 155b and its sales in the 6th year is 140b let us assume that the expense of company a in year 1 is 100c therefore its sales in year 2 is 130c its expense sorry its expense in year 3 is 160c its expense in year 4 is 180c its expense in year 5 is 170c and its expense in the last year is 160c similarly the expense of company b in year 1 let us assume is equal to 100d so its expense in year 2 is 120b its expense in year 3 is 140d its expense in year 4 is 175d 185d 170d we are also given some more information about both the companies we are told that they made no pro, uh, losses across the 6 years so what has been given to us is that uh, neither of the company made a loss so in all the 6 years the sales of company a is greater than its respective expense in that particular year same is the case even for company b so in in each of the 6 years the sales of company b is greater than the expense of company b so using that we can get a relationship between a and c and we can also get a relationship between b and d without that information the four variables a b c d are completely independent of each other but because we know that neither of the two companies made a loss we'll get some relationship between the sales and the expenses of both the companies so if you are looking at it only for say company a in year 1 we know that it did not make any loss so 100a which is its sales is greater than 100c or a greater than or equal to so a is greater than or equal to c similarly did not make a loss in year 2 so we know that 120a which is its sales in year 2 is greater than or equal to 130c or the value of a is greater than a by c is greater than or equal to 13 by 12 so we'll try to take the ratios of the uh, coefficient of a and c in each of these years for example if you're looking at year 3 140a is greater than or equal to 160c or a by c is greater than or equal to 16 by 14 which is 8 by 7 if you are looking at the next year it is a by c 
is greater than or equal to 180 by 150. What is 180 by 150? It is 6 by 5. If you are looking at the next year, A by C is greater than 170 by 180, which is 17 by 18. And if you are looking at the last year, which is the sixth year, 160A and 160C, again we know that 160A is greater than or equal to 160C or A by C is greater than or equal to 1. So all of these inequalities should hold true. The value of A by C should be greater than or equal to 1. It should be greater than or equal to 13 by 12. It should be greater than or equal to 8 by 7. It should be greater than or equal to 6 by 5, 17 by 18 and even 1. So what this would imply is in the right hand side, the number which is the highest amongst all of this is 6 by 5. So we know that A by C is greater than or equal to 6 by 5. This is equal to 1.2. Similarly, let us look at the sales and expenses of company B for each of the respective years. The first year says that the sales is 100B and the expense is 100D. So we know that B by D has to be greater than or equal to 1. If you are looking at the second year, it is 110B and 120D. So B by D has to be greater than or equal to 12 by 11. If you are looking at the next year, 125B and 140D. So B by D has to be greater than or equal to 140 divided by 125. This will be equal to 28 by 25. This I think will come to around 1.12. If you are looking at the next year, 140B is greater than or equal to 175D. So B by D should be greater than or equal to 175 by 140, which is equal to 5 by 4, which is equal to 1.25. The next one is 155B and 185D. So B by D has to be greater than or equal to 185 by 155. This will be equal to 37 by 31. If you are looking at the next one, it is 140B and 170D. So B by D has to be greater than or equal to 170 by 140, which is 17 by 14. So B by D has to be greater than each one of them. It has to be greater than 12 by 11. It has to be greater than 1.12. It has to be greater than or equal to 1.25, 37 by 31 and 17 by 14. So of all the numbers on the right hand side, the highest number is 1.25. So we know that B by D has to be greater than or equal to 1.25. This is basically the information that is given to us. Other than that, we have been given just a definition, which is that profit percentage is equal to sales minus expense by sales into 100. This is the information that is given to us. Let us go ahead and answer the questions that follow. In the first question, it is given that what can be the minimum profit percentage for the company A in year 6. What is the sales of company A in year 6? It is 160A. This is sales. And what is the expense of company A in year 6? The expense of company A in year 6 is 160C. So what is the profit percentage? The definition of profit percentage is given as sales minus expense, which is 160A minus 160C divided by sales, which is 160A into 100. This is given as the definition of profit percentage sales minus expense by sales into 100. We can cancel 160 in the numerator and denominator. So this will be equal to A minus C by A into 100. We know that A is greater than or equal to 1.2 C. So if you are looking at it, this will be 1 minus C by A into 100. So if you are trying to calculate the minimum profit percentage, we know that C will be less than or equal to A by 1.2 or C by A is less than or equal to 1 by 1.2. So if you are trying to calculate the minimum percentage, we will substitute C by A to equal 1 by 1.2. So this will equal 1 minus 1 by 1.2 into 100. This will give us the minimum profit percentage. This will be equal to 2 by 1.2 into 100 or 1 by 6 into 100, which is equal to which is 100 by 6, which is equal to 16.66%. Now let us look at the next question. For how many years did the sale of company B increase by more than 10% as compared to the previous year? So we are trying to look at only the sales numbers of company B and we are, have to identify for how many years the sales have increased by more than 10%. From year 1 to year 2 they have increased by only 10% exactly so this doesn't count. We are looking for more than 10%. In year 2, the sales was 110B and year 3, it was 125B. So here, if you are only looking at 1.1 times of year 2, this would be 1.1 into 110B, which is 121B. As the sales in year 3 are greater than 121B, this will count. 
If you're looking at year four, we have 140 by 125, which is also greater than 1.1 because 125 into 1.1 will be 137.5. So this also on year in year four also it increased by more than 10 percent. In year five, it is 155B. What is 1.1 into 140? It is 154. So we know that as year five sales are 155B, even in this year, the sales have increased by more than 10 percent. In the last year, the sales have actually decreased, so this doesn't count. So the number of years in which the sales have increased by more than 10 percent of last year is three. Let us look at the next question. If in year 5 the profits of company A and company B are in the ratio 4 by 9, we are told that profit of A by profit of B is 4 by 9 and the expense of A and expense of B, we are told that expense of A by expense of B is in the ratio 2 by 3, then we need to find out the ratio of the sales of A divided by sales of B. This is equal to how much? This is what we are supposed to find out. We know that EA is given as 2 by 3 into EB and profit of A we know is equal to sales of A minus expense of A divided by profit of B which is sales of B minus expense of B is given as equal to 4 by 9. We can cross multiply so we are going to get 9SA minus 9EA is equal to 4SB minus 4EB. We can substitute the value of EA to equal 2 by 3 into EB. So 9 times expense is equal to 9 times expense of A will equal 6 times of expense of B. So this given equation can be transformed into 9SA minus 6EB is equal to 4SB minus 4EB or 9SA is equal to 4SB plus 2EB. As we are supposed to calculate the value of SA divided by SB that is the sales of A by sales of B. Let us divide the entire equation by SB. So the left hand side will become equal to 9 into SA divided by SB which is what we are supposed to calculate is equal to 4 plus 2 times EB divided by SB. Now we are supposed to calculate the value of SA by SB but to calculate the value of SA by SB we need to know the value of EB by XB, EB by SB that is we need to know the expense divided by sales of company B or expense divided by sales of company A. We need more information and without that information we will not be able to calculate the value of SA by SB. So the correct answer for this is can't be determined. Let us now look at the last question. What would be the minimum profit percentage of company B in year 1? In year 1 the sales of company B is 100B and the sales of the expense of company B in year 1 is 100D. So what is the profit percentage? It is sales minus expense that is 100B minus 100D divided by 100B into 100. We can divide uh, the numerator and denominator by 100. So here we are supposed to calculate B minus D by B into 100. Or we are supposed to calculate the value of 1 minus D by B into 100. What is the minimum value of 1 minus d by b? To calculate the minimum value of 1 minus d by b, we need to calculate the maximum value of d by b. What is the maximum value of d by b? We know that b by d is greater than or equal to 1.25. So d by b will be less than or equal to 1 by 1.25, which is equal to uh, 100 by 125, which is 4 by 5, which is 80 percent, 0.8. So the minimum value will be equal to 1 minus 0.8 into 100 which is equal to 20 percent. So the minimum profit percentage of company B in year 1 is 20 percent. We at Kraku provide all the previous year CAT papers along with many other MB examinations such as IIFT, ZAT, SNAP, MAT, CMAT, TIS and PGDBA in the actual exam format. You can attempt them as a test and get a detailed analysis of your performance or download them as PDFs. This is an interesting question where uh, if you look at the data it might sound confusing but once you spend some time a few minutes understanding what exactly is given and putting the data on the paper solving it is very straightforward. So if you get started uh, this question has two proposals proposal A and proposal B. Now some students support proposal A, some students support proposal B, some students don't support either proposal and some students support both the proposals. 
now let us write down proposal a and proposal b now also there are two candidates sunita and ragini now students who support sunita don't support ragini and vice versa and all the students support one of the two so this is sunita and this is ragini now what we are supposed to find out is the overlap between each of this so there is also some information given now using this let us try to understand exactly who supports what that is who supports which person for president and who supports which proposals of uh, between a and b now you, if you look at the information that is given the total number of students who are surveyed is 500 so the total number of students is 500 this is given to us of which 250 students supported a that is the total number of students who supported a is 250 and 250 students supported b now note that uh, there can be overlap between these two uh, proposals we can't really say much about it we are also told that among 200 students who preferred sunita so the number of students who preferred sunita is 200 therefore the number of students who supported ragadi is 300 80 percent supported proposal a so people who supported sunita and supported proposal a is 80 percent of 200 80 percent of 200 is 160 Therefore, people who supported proposal A and don't support Sunita is actually equal to 250 minus 160. This is equal to 90. Now, but notice that Sunita and Ragini are completely disjointed. So, people who don't support Sunita will support Ragini and vice versa. So, the number of people who support Ragini and support proposal A is 90. Now, interestingly, this is the same information that is conveyed in the third point. So I actually think the third point is unnecessary. It is just reiterating that 30% of people who preferred Ragini, that is out of 300, 30% preferred proposal A. So 30% of 300 is 90, which is actually what we derived using the earlier information. Now if you just look at the information given over here slightly more closely, uh, students who preferred uh, Sunita and supported proposal A is 160. Therefore students who preferred Sunita but don't support proposal a is equal to 200 minus 160 which is equal to 40. Uh, for this question we will use this uh, symbol as not. So not, this is people who don't support proposal a. So anyway students who preferred uh, Sunita and don't support uh, proposal a is 200 minus 160 which is 40. We will do the same for even Ragini. Students who prefer Ragini but don't support proposal a is 300 minus 90 which is equal to 210 this is the information that we have derived now let us go to the next information that is given about proposal b till now we have looked only at proposal a and sunita and ragni now we will look at similar data for proposal b we are told that 20 percent of those who supported proposal b preferred sunita now total number of people who pro uh, preferred proposal b is 250 so 20 percent of them is 50 now these people support Sunita. So people who support Sunita and support uh, proposal B is 50. Therefore people who support Sunita but don't support proposal B is again 200 minus 50 which is equal to 150. Similarly out of uh, 250 who support proposal B, 50 of them support Sunita. The remaining 200 support Ragini. So people who support Ragini and support proposal B is 250 minus 50 which is equal to 200. Now people who support Ragini in total are 300 of which 200 support proposal B. Therefore people who support Ragini but don't support proposal B is 100. This is also information that we could derive from just this one statement. So this makes it interesting because this again makes statement 5 redundant. Statement 5 just says that 40% of those who did not support proposal B preferred Ragini. Now remember that 250 people supported proposal B. So the number of people who don't support proposal B is 250 which is 500 minus 250. The total number of people who are interviewed is 500. Now what this is saying is 40% of those who did not support proposal B preferred Ragini. So this is saying Ragini intersection Ragini and not of B is 250 into 0.4 which is equal to 100. But this is something that we have actually derived earlier. So again I think fifth point is also redundant as was third point. 
but uh, this is not contradictory this is just reinforcing what we have derived earlier so we'll go to the next statement the next statement says that every student who preferred sunita and supported proposal b also supported proposal a <coughs> so people who supported uh, proposal b and preferred sunita is 50 now we are looking at the intersection between a and b now let us draw the venn diagram to understand exactly how many people who supported sunita supported proposal A and how many supported proposal B and how many supported both of them. So this is the total universe of all the people who supported Sunita. Now the total number of people in this universe is 200. This was already told to us at the start that the total number of people who supported Sunita is 200 of which some of them support A and some of them support B. This is A and this is B. Now we know that the total number of people who support A who are in the universe of people who are supporting Sunita is 160. So this is 160 and number of people who support Sunita and support proposal B is 50. So this is 50. Now this information is actually saying that every student who preferred Sunita and supported proposal B also supported proposal A. This is basically saying there is nobody who supports only proposal B and doesn't support proposal A. This would imply that the intersection of these two is 50 which is the entire set of uh, B. This would again imply that the number of people who support proposal A but not proposal B is 160 minus 50 which is equal to 110. So the people who support Sunita but don't support either A or B is 200 minus 110 minus 50 this is equal to 40. Now the last information is basically the same thing but for Ragini. So we will do the same thing for Ragini. In the universe of all the people who are supporting Ragni, the total over here is 300. Some of them support A, some of them support B and some of them don't support either. <coughs> it is actually given that 20% support neither of the two candidates. 20% of 300 is 60. So 60 people don't support either A or B. Now we are also told that Ragini and A is 90. So this is 90. And people who support Ragini and B is 200. Over here is 200. So using this we can again easily find out the intersection. The total number of uh, people in these three segments 1, 2 and 3 has to be 300 minus 60 which is 240. So the intersection will be A plus B minus 240 that will be 90 plus 200 minus 240 which is equal to 50. So the intersection over here is 50. This would imply that the number of people who support only proposal A is 90 minus 50 which is equal to 40 and number of people who support only B is 200 minus 50 which is equal to 150. Now we have gotten everything sorted. We know exactly how many people support Sunita, how many people support only Ragini and amongst the people who support Sunita, how many support proposal A, how many support proposal B and how many support neither of them. We have done the same thing for even Ragini. So now let us look at solving the questions. Now we are required to find out among those surveyed who supported proposal A, what percentage preferred Sunita for student president. So if we go to the information that we have, uh, among those who, uh, who were surveyed, who supported uh, proposal A, it is 250. The, percentage, the number of people who supported Sunita is 160. So the required percentage is 160 by 250 into 100. This will come to 64 percent. What percentage of students surveyed who did not support proposal A preferred Ragini as the student president? So 40 people <coughs> amongst those who don't support proposal A preferred Sunita and 210 people amongst those who supported uh, who did not support proposal A supported uh, Ragini. So the required percentage over here is 2110 which is the number of people who don't support proposal A and Ragini by 210 plus 40. This is all the people who support who don't support proposal A which is actually equal to all the people who don't support proposal A Ragini plus all the people who don't support uh, proposal A and Sunita. If you look at the percentage that is needed it is 210 by 250 into 100 this is equal to 84 percent now so the answer is 84
let us look at the next question what percentage of students surveyed who supported both proposals a and b preferred sunita as student union president so we we'll look at a and b and pro uh, people who supported sunita we we'll look at a and b and people who supported ragini then we can find out the required uh, percentage if you look here the number of people who supported sunita and preferred uh, who supported sunita and preferred both the proposals a and b is 50 which is the intersection so a b and sunita is 50 similarly in the venn diagram for ragini the number of people who supported both the proposals and ragini is 50 so the required percentage that we are looking for is this is 50 and this is 50 so the required percentage is 50 by 50 plus 50 which is equal to 50 percent so the required answer is 50 percent now let us look at the last question how many students surveyed supported proposal b that is b did not support proposal a not a and preferred ragini as the student president so we are looking at people who preferred ragini preferred uh, proposal b but not proposal a now if you look at it we'll first go to ragini the number of people who supported a but not b is 40 and the number of people who supported b but not a is 150 so ragini b and not a is 150 ragini a and not b is 40 this is all given in the venn diagrams that we have done before now let us look at go and answer the question we are looking to find out the number of people who supported proposal b did not support proposal a and preferred ragini so r b not a is 150 so the required answer in this case is 150 to solve this question we should first understand what is the information that is given to us the information that is given to us is that there are proposals A and proposals B. There can be an overlap between these two. And there is Ragini and Sunita. And there is no overlap between those two. Once you understand that, you solve for the set A. You understand what exactly is given, all the information. Figure out all the people who support A and not B. And B and not A in case of Sunita and in case of Ragini. And then you are done. Google search Kraku Cat Formulas PDF. Click on the first link. You will get a list of topics for CAT. Click on one of the topics. Download the PDF to get a list of formulas for the topic. In this question, we are told that there are three salesmen. The names of the salesmen are Tohri, Hokli, and Lahore. They went into an apartment complex and they sold some items across two days. We are also told that on each of the days, they went to different number of households. This information is given, we are required to calculate across the two days, how many uh, items did they sell and how many households did they visit. So let us draw two tables, one will record the number of items that they sold, another will record the number of households that they visited. Both of them will have certain number of rows and certain number of columns, it will be something like this. This is the first table and this will be the second table. Okay, the first one will be items sold. And the second one will be households visited. In both of them, let us write down their names. The first one is, this is day one, this is day two, and this is total. This also is day one, day two, and total. This is story. Hokli and Lahur. This also is Tohri, Hokli and Lahur. We are told that over the two days, all of them met the same number of households and each of them sold a total of 100 items. So the total items sold across the two days for all three of them is 100. The number of households visited is also the same. On both the days, Lahur met the same number of households and sold the same number of items. So if he sold the same number of items across both the days, on both the days he sold 50-50 items each. Let us assume that on both the days he met A number of households. So this is A and this is A. So the total number of households he met is 2A. 
So the total number of households all of them met is 2A. Hockley could not sell any item on the second day. So on the first day he sold 100 and on the second day he sold no item. Because the first household he met complained against him. So this would imply that the number of households that he met on the second day would be 1 and this will be 2A minus 1. Tohri met 30 more households on the second day as compared to the first day over here. If you assume that the number of households he met on the first day is y, the number of households he met on the second day will be y plus 30. This is equal to 2a or 2y is equal to 2a minus 30 or the value of y is a minus 15. So the number of households he met on the first day is a minus 15 and the number of households he met on the second day will be a plus 15 because the total is equal to 2a. We are also told that Tohri's success rate was twice that of Lahur's on the first day. What is Tohri's success rate uh, on the first day? That will be x divided by a minus 15. This is equal to 2 times Lahur's on the first day. Lahur's on the first day is 50 divided by a. So now if you cross multiply, you are going to get that ax is equal to 100 times a minus 15. Similarly, we are told that a Tohri success rate on the second day is 75% that of Lahut's. What is Tohri success rate on the second day? That is 100 minus x divided by a plus 15 is equal to 0 0.75 into 50 by a. So here we have two equations and two unknowns a and x. We can solve them to calculate their respective values. If we cross multiply the second equation, we are going to get 100a minus ax is equal to 0 0.75 into 50 is 37.5 into a plus 15 or 100 a minus 37.5 into a plus 15 is equal to a x which is actually equal to 100 a and 100 into a minus 15 this is equal to 100 into a minus 15 or we can just simplify this you are going to get that 37.5 into a plus 15 is equal to 1500 or a plus 15 is equal to 40 or a is equal to 25. If a is equal to 25 we can write down the values a minus 15 over here this will be 10. This is a plus 15 that will be 40. The total number of households visited for each one of them is 2a which will be 50. This is a so this is 25. This is a so this is 25. This is 2a minus 1 so that is 49. We can also calculate the value of x. x can be calculated from any one of the equations. x divided by a minus 15 is equal to 2 into 50 by a. a is 25 so x divided by 10 is equal to 100 divided by 25 this is 4 or the value of x is 40 so this is 40 and this will be 60 100 minus 6 let us go ahead and answer the questions that follow what is the total number of households met by tori hookley and lahore on the first day that will be 10 plus 49 plus 25 10 plus 49 is 59 plus 25 is 84. How many trick items were sold by Tohri on the first day? Tohri sold 40 items on the first day. How many households did Lahore visit on the second day? Lahore visited uh, 25 households on the second day that is between 21 and 29. How many households did Tohri visit on the first day? He visited 10 households, so that will be 10 or less. Which of the following statements is false? Among the three, Tohri had the highest success rate on the second day. Let us calculate the success rate for each because if you look at it, all the options involve success rates across the two days. So this is T, H and L. We are only looking at success rate on day 1 and on day 2. Tori's success rate on day 1 is 40 divided by 10 which is 4. 
on the second day 60 divided by 40 this is 1.5 for hockley it is 100 divided by 49 which will be approximately 2.02 approximately and on the second day it is zero he visited one household and he sold no items lahore's is 50 divided by 25 on both the days so this is 2 and this is 2 now let us look at the options among the three tohri had the highest success rate on the second day this is false because the higher success rate was with Lahore. So, you can immediately tick option A as the answer. But just for the sake of completion, let us look at the remaining three options also. Tori had higher success rate on the first day as compared to the second day. This is true. His success rate on the first day is 4. On the second day, it is 1.5. Among the three, Tori had the higher success rate on the first day. This also is true. His success rate is 4. The remaining two were 2.02 .02 and 2. Among the three, Tohri had the lowest success rate on the first day. Lahur had the lowest success rate on the first day. This also is true. Lahur's success rate is 2. Tohri's is 4. And uh, H's uh, is between 100 by 49, which uh, approximately I think will be uh, 2.04, I think, which is greater than uh, 2. So, this also is true. So, the remaining three options are uh, true. Only the first option is false. So, that will be the correct option. Google search Crapo free cat mock. Click on the first link. You can attempt a free mock test which was attempted by 30,000 cat aspirants in the actual exam format. After completing the test, you get detailed solutions, analysis and percentile along with your scorecard to gauge your All India performance. Click on the solution to get video solutions from our expert faculty. This is a very interesting set uh, from uh, CAT 2019 slot 2 LRDI which I think is very time consuming. In an ideal situation if this kind of a set comes in the examination, I would recommend you not attempting it. You should be able to understand that this is a time guzzler. If you try to attempt this set it will take a lot of time. Uh, so in an examination it is better if you avoid attempting these kind of questions. Uh, the second interesting thing about this set is that uh, this is a missing uh, uh, values in a table kind of a set but it also has shades of sudoku so somebody who is solving sudoku fast uh, will be able to answer this question uh, faster than the normal person so let us get into it so this question has uh, <coughs> details about a rifle shooting competition there are 10 participants and uh, six of them participate in each round in all there are 10 rounds so the person who wins the round gets seven points the person who comes second gets three points and the person who comes third gets one point in that particular round we are given the total of uh, the each individual, uh, each uh, of the participant after round 6 and we are also given the total after round 10. <coughs> so let us try to put the information that is given in table and then see what is missing. So first there are uh, 10 participants. So there is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I and J. Now let us assume that these are the scores in each of the round. So round 1, round 2, round 3, round 4, round 5, round 6 and this is the total after round 6. The interesting thing about uh, this question is that you can separate this into two parts. One, let us first analyze only the first six rounds and then let us analyze the rounds between seven and ten. Now we can put the total that was given after six rounds for each one of the ten participants and then try to see how much each one of them has scored in each of the rounds. So if you see the score, uh, the total of the first uh, Amita after uh, six rounds is eight, then two, three, 6, 3, 10, 17, 1, 2 and 14 and we should also recognize that not all of them have participated in all the 10 rounds. If you look at the information that is given, players from round, uh, uh, players numbered 1 to 6 have participated in round 1. So players from 7 to 10 have not participated in the first round. Similarly, the players from 2 to 7 have participated in round 2. So, the others haven't participated. You can continue doing it. You can easily observe a pattern. For example, in round 3, players from 3 to 8 have participated. So, you can extend this further and you can observe a nice uh, pattern. At least 
as far as who has participated in all these rounds is concerned. So cross over here would suggest that that uh, participant has not participated in the round. So once you get this table, let us try to analyze and try to fill it up as fast as we can. Now the first thing that you should observe is that uh, the second participant that is B scored a total of 2. So and he has participated in 2 rounds. The only way this is possible is if he has scored 1 in each of the 2 rounds. The second thing that you should observe is participant J has scored 14 and he has participated in 2 rounds. So he has scored 7 in both the rounds. Remember that the only 3 non-zero values possible are 7, 3 and 1. Next if you observe uh, person A, he has participated in 2 rounds, 1 and 6 and he has scored 8. So he has scored 7 and 1. Now because B has already scored 1 in the first round, it would mean that A has scored uh, 7 and 1 in round 1 and 6 respectively. There is some more information given about rounds 1 and 6 which says that Gordon that is the 7th participant did not score in consecutive, did not score in any 2 consecutive rounds. And the total that Gordon has scored after uh, the first 6 rounds is 17. The only way that is possible is if it is 7 plus 7 plus 3. Now so he has scored in at least 3 rounds and he has participated in a total of 5 rounds. This would mean that he has scored in rounds 2, 4 and 6. Now it is easy to notice that uh, in round 6 Joshin has already scored 7. So that would mean that Gordon has scored 3 in round 6. It would also mean that he has scored 7 in rounds 2 and 4. Now you can notice that uh, we have got all the 3 values of 7, 3, 1 in round 6. So we have completed that. So let us mark zeros for others because it will avoid uh, confusion. Similarly now if you observe the ninth person that is Ikea. He has scored 2 and there are only 2 remaining rounds left. So it would mean that he has scored 1 in both the remaining rounds. Then if you observe the 8th participant H. You know that he has scored 1 but he couldn't score 1 in 4 and 5 because the participant number 9 IK has already scored 1. It would mean that his 1 has come in round 3. So let us mark again zeros in the rounds which are uh, which we already know. Uh, then if you observe the number of 7s, we got the 7 in first round, we got the 7 in uh, the second round, we didn't get the 7 in the third round but we got 7 in 4th, 5th and 6th rounds. Now if you are looking at 7th in the 3rd round, the only person who has a score which is greater than 7 is the 6th participant Fatima. So it would mean that she has scored uh, 7 in the 3rd round. Now if you observe we have finished all the 7's, we were able to identify all the 7's in all the 6 rounds. We are also able to identify all the 1's in all the rounds. Now we need to just identify the 3's in the all the rounds. We have only one 3 in round 6. Now if you look at each of the participant, we have identified A, we have got uh, where he has, in which round he has scored 7 and 1. We have identified uh, B, we have figured out where they have got their 2's. We haven't identified C, there is a 3 which we have to identify. For D there are 2 3's which we have to identify. For E there is 1 3 we have to identify. And for F also there is 1 3 that we have to identify. We have identified G, H, I and J. Now if you look at it. There is another information that is given which says that Eric and Fatima both scored in a round. Now Eric has already scored a 7 in round 3. Now so Fatima also has 1 3 left and she has only 1 3. So that 3 has to come in round 3 because there is no other uh, alternative left. The only other alternative is that uh, Eric and Fatima both scored 3 in the same round which is not possible. So it would imply that Eric has scored 3 in the same round, Fatima has scored a 7. So again let us fill up uh, zeros in the remaining rounds, in the remaining uh, columns which we know people have not scored. So we have even finished Eric. Now all we need to do is we have 4 3's left. There is 1 3 from C, there are 2 3's from D and there is 1 3 from E. Now the thing that we should observe is that the 2 3's that uh, David has scored can't be in the first and second rounds because there are only uh, C that is Chen has participated only in the first and second rounds and in one of the two of them he has definitely scored a 3. So that would imply that in the fourth round D has definitely David has scored a 3. This is important to notice because once we have figured out that David has scored uh, 3 in round 4 we can even identify that Fatima has scored uh, 3 in round 5 because she can't score uh, 3 in round uh, 4. So once we have all of this 
the only two that are remaining are who scored three in round three in round one and who scored three in round two this information we can't uh, pinpoint it can be either of the two so it can be either three or zero or zero or three similarly it can be zero or three or three or zero what we know for sure is in the first round and in the second round uh, the third that is the person who came second is either chen or david now once you have it you have figured out which participant has scored how much in all the first six rounds now we'll do is something we'll do something similar for round seven to ten and then try to identify who has scored what in each of the rounds let us again draw a different table a b c d e f g h i and j this is the seventh round this is the eighth round this is the ninth round this is the tenth round and over here this is the total from rounds seven to ten only now let us try to first find out the individual totals of each of the ten players from round seven to ten then identify which of the rounds they have actually played in and then try to identify what points they have scored in each of the rounds for identifying how much they have scored in each of the rounds we have to just uh, subtract the first column's value from the second column's value for example in the case of amita it is 18 minus 8 so that is 10 similarly it is 3 3 0 7 0 0 3 15 and 3 this is the total that each one of them has scored in the four rounds 7 to 10 now let us identify which of the players have participated in each of the rounds. We know that in round 7, players 7 to 10 and 1 and 2 have participated. So in round 7, these guys have participated. So C, 3, 4, 5 and 6 have not participated. Similarly in round 8, it will be 4, 5, 6 and 7 who don't participate. And likewise for the remaining 2 rounds. So for example in round 10 players 10 and 1 to 5 would participate. Now once you have this again let us try to identify if we can immediately fill the table with any of the values. The first thing that you should observe is that Eric has uh, scored 7 and he participated in only one round so it is 7. Similarly all the guys who have scored 0 we can try to fill them up so that we will avoid any confusion. Now the second thing you would observe is that IK has scored 15 so that would mean that he has scored 7, 7 and 1 and there is some more information given about uh, around 7 to 10. It is said that only two players have scored in three consecutive rounds and one of them is Chen and no other player scored in any two consecutive rounds. Once you know that Chen has scored in three consecutive rounds and the total he scored is 3, it would mean that he has scored 1, 1, 1 in all the rounds that he has participated in. So, and the second player who has scored in three consecutive rounds would obviously be IKEA because he has scored 771 in the rounds. Now, the one that uh, IKEA would have scored would come in the first round because Chen has scored one in rounds uh, 8, 9, and 10. So, in round 7, IKEA would score one. This would imply that he has scored seven in rounds 8 and 9. Now, we know the 7 uh, scored in round 10, we know the 7 scored in round 9 and in round 8. If you are looking at the 7 that is scored in uh, the round 7, the only person who has a score greater than 7 left is A, Amita. So she has scored a 7 in round 7. Now let us try to understand what is the information that we already have. So now in this table we have all the 4 7s and we have all the 4 1s. What is remaining is just uh, where all the 4 3s would go. So we need to figure out uh, who scored, uh, who came second in each of the four rounds and then we are done. Now for example, there is one three that is coming from Amita, there is one three that is coming from uh, Bala, Chen is complete, David is complete, Eric is complete, Fatima is complete, Gordon is done, there is one three that is coming from Hansa, IK is done and there is one three that is coming from Joshin. So these are the four people who are remaining and they have scored one three in each of the four rounds. Now let us see the information that is given. It is told that Joshin scored in round 7. So this 3 is from Joshin. Now once we know that Joshin scored in round 3, we can identify that Hamsa scored 3 in round 8 because she has participated only in round 7 and round 8. Now once we know that, let us again fill up all the other uh, tables. So we are also told that Amita scored in round 10. So Amita scored 3. 
this would imply that ball has scored in round 9. So once you have this information, we know that all the table has been filled up. We know which player has scored uh, what in each of the 10 rounds. Now let us go and try to answer the questions. Let us look at the first question. The first question says what were the scores of C, D and E respectively after round 3. So let us figure it out. For C, after round 3 he would have scored uh, 3 because it is 3 or 0 in the first round, 0 or 3 in the second round and 0 in the third round. So C would score 3, similarly D would score 3 and E would score 3 because it is 0 plus 0 plus 3. So the first answer is 333 3, 3, which is option B. Which three players were in the last three positions after round four? So this is quite interesting. So because we have to calculate the cumulative scores of all the players after the first four rounds. So let us do that first. The total for A is seven. The total for B is two. For C, D and E, it will be, for C it will be three. For D it will be six. For E it will be three. For F it will be seven. For G it will be 14, for H it will be 1, for I it will be 1 and for J it will be 1. So when we are asked uh, which three players it will be H, I and J who have scored 1 each. All the others have scored more than 1. So the answer is option D. Which player scored points in the maximum number of rounds? So we have to figure out the player who has scored something in the maximum number of rounds. It is not asked whether he has scored 7 or 3 or 1. So if you look at it, again we can identify that A has scored twice in the first 6 rounds and twice in the next 6 rounds. So he has scored a total of in total of 4 rounds. Similarly B has scored in 2 rounds in the first 6 and uh, 1 round in the second uh, 4. Similarly C has scored in 1 and 3. So 1 plus 3 is 4. D, E, F. So similarly D has scored in 2 rounds in the first 6. E has scored in 1 round in the first 6. F has scored in 2 rounds in the first 6. G, H, I and J. G has scored in 3 rounds in the first 6. H has scored in one round in first six, I has scored in two rounds in first six and J has scored in two rounds in the first six. Now let us add the total in the next uh, four rounds. D has scored in no rounds, uh, E has scored in one round, F has scored in no rounds, G has scored in no rounds, H has scored in one round, I has scored in three rounds and F uh, J has scored in one round. So the total will be 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, I has scored in 5 and J has scored in 3. So the person who has scored in the maximum number of, maximum number of rounds is I who has scored in 5 rounds. So the answer is option D. Now if you are looking at the last question, which player scored points in the last round? So we need to identify who has scored points in the 10th round. It is a, E and C. A, C, E is the answer. They have scored 3, 1 and 7. So if you look at uh, the answer, it is option D. As you can see, this is a very lengthy question. Solving the, identifying which rounds the players have played itself takes some time. Then writing the tables and identifying the players who have scored points in the first 6 rounds and in the 7th to 10th round again takes more time. Once you have solved all of them correctly, uh, cumulatively finding the answers also is not very easy. You will have to again uh, go back and find out which player has scored in the maximum number of rounds or those kind of things again takes time. So even after you have solved the group information, solving the individual questions again takes time. Having said all of this, having done all of this, there is still a chance that you have made some mistake somewhere. So it is important that you identify which of the sets are time consuming and which of the sets are quite easily answerable. This set is of the former type which should not be attempted in the actual examination.
We at Traku provide all the previous year CAT papers along with many other MB examinations such as IIFT, ZAT, SNAP, MAT, CMAT, TIS and PGDBA in the actual exam format. You can attempt them as a test and get a detailed analysis of your performance or download them as PDFs. In this question, we are told that nine alphabets P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, and W and X are part of a crossword table and each of them represents a single digit natural number. That is, each one of them is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9. So, one of them is part of one of these nine distinct natural numbers, and the sum of three numbers in every row and column add up to 70. What this would imply is that P plus Q plus R is equal to 17 r plus s plus t is equal to 17 t plus u plus v is equal to 17 and finally v plus w plus x is equal to 17. Now if you look at the questions we are required to identify what are the different possibilities for p q r s t u v w and x. Now one of the first things that you should know is when you know that P, Q, R, all these nine alphabets are part of these nine distinct natural numbers. So the mapping is not known but each one of them is exactly one of the nine distinct natural numbers. You know that P plus Q plus R plus S plus T plus U plus V plus W plus X that is the sum of all those natural numbers is equal to 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9. And what is the sum of the first 9 natural numbers? It is equal to 9 into 10 divided by 2 which is equal to 45. So if you sum up these 4 equations, all of them are repeated exactly once that is P plus Q plus R plus S plus T plus U plus V plus W plus X. But 3 alphabets are repeated twice. R is there twice, T is there twice and V is there twice. So plus r plus t plus v is equal to 17 plus 17 plus 17 plus 17 that is 17 into 4 which is 68. As we know that p plus q plus r plus all these 9 numbers is equal to 45. What this would imply is that r plus t plus v is equal to 23. What is the highest possible sum of 3 natural numbers out of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9? If you have to maximize the sum the three numbers will have to be 7, 8 and 9. And what is 7 plus 8 plus 9? 7 plus 8 plus 9 is equal to 24. Here we are supposed to find three natural numbers which sum up to 23. Now the only possibility for finding three natural numbers which sum up to 23 is if the three natural numbers are 6 plus 8 plus 9. If you are looking for three distinct natural numbers, all of them are less than 10. That is all of them are less than or equal to 9. And if you want their sum to be equal to 23, the only possibility is if it is 6 plus 8 plus 9, this will equal 23. So we know that R, T and V, these three are 6 or 8 or 9. We don't know which is which. We just know that all three of them will map to 6, 8 and 9 because their sum is equal to 23 which is quite high. Now if you are looking at R plus T plus S, R plus T plus S is equal to 17. This is known because all the rows and all the columns add up to 17. Now if R and T are 8 and 9 in some order, they too will sum up to 17 and the value of S will be 0. This is not possible. So R and T will not simultaneously be 8 and 9 in some order. Or you know that 6 has to be 1 of R and T. R and T cannot be equal to 8 and 9. So 6 also has to be 1 of R and T. Similarly, if you are looking at T, U and V, T plus U plus V is also equal to 17. Now if R and V are 8 and 9 in some order, their sum will equal 17, which is not possible because in that case U will equal 0. So you know that 6 is also one of T or V. So you know that R and T, one of them is 6. You know that T and V, one of them is 6. The only way in which this is possible is if T is equal to 6. So you know that t is equal to 6 and you know that r and v are 8 and 9, 1 of 8 and 9. We don't know whether r is 8 or v is 8. 
and on some level you feel that this is not determinable that is whether r is it or v is it can't be determined because this is a symmetrical cube this is a symmetrical crossword there is no other information that is known to us which is specific to r and which is not specific to v once you convince yourself that there is no additional information that will help us in identifying r and v you will uh, try to fill in and try to find the different cases the reason we were able to find out t was because t is not symmetrical t is the only number which is in the center of all the columns and all the rows that is the reason we are able to find out the value of t but r and v on some level are completely symmetrical there is no information which will tell us any more information about r which uh, is not told to us about v so once you are convinced about it let us try to find the different cases the first case we will write it over here so the first case is that uh, r is equal to 8 and the second case is that v is equal to 8 now you have p you have q in the first case r is equal to 8 t is equal to 6 and v is equal to 9 therefore the value of s will be 17 minus 6 plus 8 so this has to equal 3 and the value of u will be equal to 17 minus 6 minus 9 so that is equal to 2 and you have x and w this is the first case and in the second case you have p q in this case r is equal to 9 uh, you will have t equal to 6 and the value of s in this case will be 2 and the value of u in this case will be 3 and v will be 8 and again you will have x and w. Now in both these cases there are only 4 numbers left. You have been able to identify 6, 8 and 9 you have been able to identify 2 and 3. So the only 4 numbers which are left are 1, 4, 5 and 7 these four numbers have to go for p q x and w now you also want p plus q in the first case to sum up to 17 minus 8 which is equal to 9 if you are only looking at the first case first and x plus w to sum up to 17 minus 9 which is equal to 8 so in the first case as p plus q have to be equal to 9 the only possibility is that they are equal to 4 and 5 so over here you have p is 1 of 4 and 5 and q is the remaining of 4 and 5 and x and uh, w will have to equal 8 in the first case so they have to be 1 and 7 so again we don't know whether x is 1 or w is 1 but we know that this is 1 and 7 this is also 1 or 7 similarly in the second case it is the exact mirror opposite even in this case the numbers which are remaining are 1 4 5 and 7 in this case p plus q is equal to 8 because p plus q plus 9 is equal to 17 so p plus q is equal to 8 so the two different numbers for p and q will be 1 and 7 again in some order we are not able to identify which order it is this is also 1 or 7 and in this case x plus w will equal 17 minus 8 which is 9 so x and w will be 4 and 5 so as we have just discussed we have two cases possible individually and each of these cases also has subcases. So we are not able to identify everything correctly. We just know that t is equal to x and r and v are 8 or 9. And based on the respective value of r and v, we are able to identify the respective value of s and u. They have to be either 2 or 3. Once the value of r and v has been finalized, we can even calculate the value of p and q, but we don't know whether p and q which is which. We know that p and q have to be either 4 or 5 in one case or 1 and 7 in another case. But we don't know which is which. So this is basically what we know. Let us go ahead and answer the questions that follow. What is the total number of arrangements uh, possible for the alphabets to numbers mapping? In this case, we know that t is equal to 6. There is case 1 where r is equal to 8 and case 2 where r is equal to 9. In the first case when r is equal to 8 this is the first case and this is the second case in the first case we are able to identify the value of uh, which alphabet is 3 which alphabet is 2 and which alphabet is 9 we know which two alphabets are 4 and 5 but we don't know which of them is which individually so we have two subcases similarly we have two subcases for which alphabet is 1 and which alphabet is 7 because we know that uh, x and w are 1 and 7 but we don't know which is which similarly over here we know that p and q are 4 and 5 but we don't know which is which so there are basically 2 into 2 which is equal to 4 subcases in the first case where r is equal to 8. 
similarly when r is equal to 9 we know for sure that v is equal to 8 we know that s and u are 2 and 3 respectively these are things that we know in the second case we also know that p and q are 1 and 7 but we don't know which is which so there are two subcases for p and q and again there are two subcases for x and w we know that x and w are 4 and 5 but we don't know which is which so again there are four subcases over here so the total number of cases is 8 the total number of arrangements that are possible is 8 how many alphabets can be uniquely determined the value of t is the only alphabet only number that could be uniquely determined no other number we could uh, determine uniquely if x is equal to 7 what is the value of p plus q if x is equal to 7 this would imply that this is the first subcase because in the second subcase x and w have to be 4 and 5 which is not possible so if x is equal to 7 we will be able to identify many of the alphabets we first know that this is the first subcase so we have t is equal to 6 s is equal to 3 r is equal to 8 u is equal to 2 and we have v is equal to 9 we also know that x is equal to 7 so this will be 7 and 1 for p and q unfortunately we don't know which is which we still know that they are 4 and 5 but we don't know which is which but over here we are asked the value of p plus q so the value of p plus q will be 4 plus 5 because irrespective of whether p is 4 and q is 5 or the other way around the sum will remain 4 plus 5 which is equal to 9 let us look at the last question If p minus q is equal to 1, what is the value of w minus s? If p minus q is equal to 1, this would imply that p is equal to 5 and q is equal to 4. Remember that p and q can be either 4 and 5 or 1 and 7. If they are 1 and 7, then p minus q will not be equal to 1. If they are 4 and 5, we know that as p minus q is equal to 1, it would imply that p is equal to 5 and q is equal to 4. So in this case, again we are talking about the first subcase only. So let us fill out all the things that we know. In this case, p is equal to 5, q is equal to 4, r is equal to 8, uh, p, q, r, s is equal to 3, t is equal to 6, u is equal to 2, we know that uh, v is equal to 9, and we know that w and x are 1 and 7. We don't know which is which, we know that w and x are 1 and 7, and here we are required to calculate the value of w minus s. We know that the value of s is 3. What we don't know is what is the value of w w can be 1 or 7 s is definitely equal to 3 so the value of w minus s can be either minus 2 or 4 because uh, we don't know for sure what is the value of w minus s the answer will be can't be determined google search kraku cat formulas pdf click on the first link you will get a list of topics for cat Click on one of the topics, download the PDF to get a list of formulas for the topic. In this question, we are told the total number of admits into IMA across three years and we have been given this sum of triplets from 2006 to 2016. That is, if you are looking at the data that is given to us and if you assume that the number of people who are admitted into IMA in 2006 is A. The number of people who are admitted into IMA in 2007 is say B and in 2008 is C then A plus B plus C is equal to 752. Similarly the number of people who are admitted into the institute in say 2009 is equal to D then B plus C plus D is equal to 778 and so on. This is the information that is given to us. Based on this information and because we are also told the total number of people who are admitted from 2016 to 2018 we have to infer some data about the values of a b c d and so on to do that let us first draw a table the table is going to have 13 rows and it will have two columns and it will look something like this this is the year and this is the number of people who are present who are admitted into the institute This is year 2006, this is year 2007, this is year 2008, this is year 2009, this is the year 2010, 
this is the year 2011 this is 2012 this is 2013 this is 2014 this is 2015 this is 2016 this is 2017 and finally this is 2018 let us assume that the number of people who were admitted in 2016 is small a the number of people who were admitted into 2007 is say b and 2008 is say c as we have discussed earlier a plus b plus c is 752 if you assume that the number of people who are admitted in 2009 is d then b plus c plus d is equal to 778 now if you subtract the first equation from the second equation b plus c will get cancelled Therefore, the value of D minus A is equal to 778 minus 752, which is equal to 26. Or the value of D is equal to A plus 26. We can extend the same logic further. If you are looking at 2009, B plus C plus D is equal to 778. And if you are looking at 2008 to 2010, and if you assume that the number of people who are admitted in 2010 is E, then C plus D plus E is equal to 805. Or the respective difference, if you are looking at it, will be that E minus B, because now you will cancel C plus D, is equal to 27. Or the value of E is equal to B plus 27. Now, before we go further, we will notice that if you are calculating the differences between consecutive terms, it becomes easy. So, 752 and 778, the difference is 26. Over here, the difference is 27. Over here, the difference is 42. Over here, the difference is 31. Here, the difference is 92. Here, the difference is just 1. Here, the difference is 37. Here, the difference is 9. Here, the difference is 62. Here, the difference is 43. And here, this is the last one. Similarly, if you are looking at 2011, you will have to compare it to 2008 and the difference is 42. So, this will be C plus 42. There is no reason to be confused. If you are getting confused, we will again explain. If you are looking at the number of people who got admitted in 2006 to be A, 2007 to be B and 2008 to be C and 2009 to be D, 2010 to be E and F and so on. 2008 to 2010 is going to equal C plus D plus E. This is equal to 805. The next three will be D plus E plus F. This is equal to 847. Now, if you subtract the first equation from the second equation, F minus C will be equal to 42. Or the value of F is C plus 42. We will continue doing the same. In the next case, the difference is 31. So, the difference between 2012 and 2009 is 31. We know that 2009 is A plus 26. So, 2012 will be A plus 26 plus 31 which is equal to A plus 57. The difference between 2010 and 2013 is equal to 92. So, the value of the number of students who are admitted in 2013 will be 92 plus the number of students who are admitted in 2010 which is equal to B plus 27. So, this has to equal B plus 119. Similarly, the difference between the number of students admitted in 2011 and 2014 is just 1. So, the number of students who are admitted in 2014 will be equal to C plus 43. Because in 2011, we assumed that the number of students who were admitted is C plus 42. The difference between 2012 and 2015's number is 37. So, the number of students who are admitted in 2015 will be 37 plus the number of students who were admitted in 2012, which is A plus 57. This is equal to A plus 94. The difference between 2013 and 2016 is equal to 9. So, the number of students who were admitted in 2016 will be 9 plus the number of students who were admitted in 2013, which is B plus 119. So, this will be equal to B plus 128. The difference between 2014 and 2017 is 62. So, the number of students who were admitted in 2017 will be 62 plus the number of students who were admitted in 2014, which is equal to C plus 43. So, this is going to equal C plus 105. The difference between the number of students who were admitted in 2015 and 2018 is 43. So, the number of students who were admitted in 2018 will be 43 plus the number of students who were admitted in 2015 which is equal to plus A plus 94. This is equal to A plus 
137. What is the total number of students who are admitted from 2006 to 2018? That will be the sum of all of these 18 rows. So that will be A plus B plus C. You have A, B and C again. You have A, B and C again. You have A, B and C again. And finally you are left with 1A. So this is 4 times A plus B plus C plus A plus you have to add the constant terms. If you are adding the constant terms that is 26 plus 27 which is 53. 42 plus 57 which is equal to 99 plus 119 plus 143 which is equal to 162 plus 94 plus 128 which is equal to 222 plus 105 plus 137 this is equal to 242. Now let us again add them 53 plus 99 is 152, 152 plus 162 is 314. 242 plus 222 is 464, 464 plus 314 is 1078. So 4 times A plus B plus C plus A plus 1078 has to equal 4038. But we know the value of A plus B plus C that is equal to 752. The total number of admissions from 2006 to 2008 is known to us that is given to us that is equal to 752. So the equation that we are going to get is that 4 into 752 plus A plus 1078 is equal to 4038. 4 into 752 is equal to 3008. 4038 minus 3008 is 1030. One of the things that we made a mistake over here is that 464 plus 314 is actually equal to 778. So it is important that you don't make uh, these kind of silly mistakes. Silly mistakes happen to everyone. So A plus 778 is equal to 1030 or the value of A is equal to 1030 minus 778 which is equal to 230 plus 22 which is 252. So the value of A is 252. So now let us substitute that in the table that we have. A is 252. So what is the value of A plus 26? That is 278. What is A plus 57? That will be equal to 309. What is A plus 94? That will be equal to 346. What is A plus 137? That is equal to 389. So we know the number of students who are admitted across 4 years, 2006, 2009, 2012, 2015 and 2018 across 5 years and we also know the value of B plus C. Because A is 252, the value of B plus C will be equal to 500. This is the information that we have. Now let us go ahead and answer the questions that follow. How many students were admitted in 2006? That is equal to 252. Let us look at the next question. How many students were admitted in 2018? That is 389. If the total number of applicants in 2015 is 600, so the number of people who applied is 600 and the number of seats is 346. What is the approximate admission rate? That will be 346 by 600 into 100 or that is 346 by 6 which is 173 by 3. This is approximately equal to 57.66 or that will be 58 percent. IMA sent a shortlist of 2500 students in 2021. So the total number of students is 2500. What is the approximate probability of Krishna getting into the, the final admission uh, list? If the number of admits remains the same as 2018. So the number of admits is 389. So the required percentage is 389 divided by 2500 into 100. 
that is equal to 389 divided by 25. So, this will be approximately equal to 15.56. So, that is approximately 16% which is option A. Google search Krapo free cat mock. Click on the first link. You can attempt a free mock test which was attempted by 30,000 cat aspirants in the actual exam format. After completing the test, you get detailed solutions, analysis and percentile along with your scorecard to gauge your All India performance. Click on the solution to get video solutions from our expert faculty. Healthy Bites is a fast food joint serving three items, burgers, fries and ice cream. It has two employees, Anish and Bani, who prepare the items ordered by clients. Preparation time is 10 minutes for a burger, 2 minutes for an ice cream. An employee can prepare only one of these items at a time. The fries are prepared in an automatic fryer which can prepare up to 3 portions of fries at a time and takes 5 minutes irrespective of the number of portions. The fryer does not need an employee to constantly attend to it and we can ignore the time taken by an employee to start and stop the fryer. Thus, an employee can be engaged in preparing other items while the frying is on. However, for, uh, fries cannot be prepared in anticipation of future orders. Healthy Bites wishes to serve the orders as early as possible. The individual items in any order are served as and when ready. However, the order is considered to be completely served only when all the items of that order are served. The table below gives the orders of the three clients and the times at which they place the orders. So, these are the given orders. At 10 o'clock, we got one burger, three portion of fries, one order of ice cream. At 10.05, we have two portions of fries, one order of ice cream. And at 10.07, we have one burger and one portion of fries. So, this is essentially a scheduling question. So, in scheduling questions, what we do is we set up the machines or whatever people who are working on the processes on the vertical, negative vertical axis and uh, the time taken to do things on the uh, positive uh, uh, horizontal axis as such. So, uh, in this year, we have two people, Anish and Bani. And we also have a fryer which can work independently and does not require a person to operate it. So, essentially we can draw the uh, case as like this where we have uh, on the x axis we have the time in minutes. Then we have Anish, we have Bani and the fryer. And uh, we can uh, put this as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and so on. So, this is the time taken to do things. Okay, so uh, that is the information we have now. Let us see the first question. Assume that only one client order can be processed at any given time, any given point of time. So, Anish and Bani cannot start preparing a new order while the previous order is being prepared. At what time is the order placed by client 1 completely served? So, client 1, so let us say this point that is the is 10 a.m. So, this is when the first order comes in. This order is, uh, if let us just take a quick look, one burger, three fries, one ice cream. So, this is one burger. At 10, uh, 10 a.m., we have one burger, three fries and one ice cream. And we know that one burger is uh, 10 minutes, uh, three fries or uh, one fry or two fries irrespective is five minutes and one ice cream is two minutes. This is the information given in the uh, uh, case let as such. And at 10 a.m. Uh, we get these three uh, things that we have to do. And we can uh, use all Anish, Bani and uh, the fryer to do these things. The next order comes at 10.05. But it is given that they can only process one uh, client's order at a given time. So, they won't start with the next client's order at 10.05 until the first client is done. So, let us first try to answer when will the first client be done. So, the first client, uh, once the order comes, either of Anish and Bani can start with the burger and that will take 10 minutes. So, we will draw it out like this. At uh, 10 minutes, Anish will finish. If he starts with the burger, Anish will finish with the burger. He does the one burger. Uh, Bani can do the ice cream in 2 minutes. And the fryer can do the... Uh, the fryer can do the three fries in five minutes. So, by 10.10, 10, that is at this point, all three of these uh, things will be done and the serve, uh, order will be uh, completely served as such. So, the first cl uh, client will be completely served at 10.10 10 a.m. So, by using this quick uh, graph, we could figure out when the, uh, when the first order will be served.
The question is assume that only one client order can be processed at any given point of time. So, the same condition as last time. Uh, Anish and Vani cannot start preparing a new order while a previous order is being completed. At what time will the order placed by the client 3 be completely served? So, this is just the next step. So, after the diagram that we drew, we have to now show how much time it will take for client 2's order to be completed and then client 3's order. So, let us draw the this again. So, it was as we had drawn, this is time in minutes, this is Anish, Bani and the Friar. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. So, I drew a quick timeline as such. And let us put in uh, the values. One burger is 10 minutes, one fries or uh, two fries, three fries is 5 minutes and one ice cream is uh, uh, 2 minutes and at 10 am we have the first order of one burger, three fries and one ice cream. At 10 05 we have the second order, let us just see what the second order is, two fries, one ice cream, two fries, one ice cream and at 10 07 we have one burger and one fries. So, this is 10.07 and we have one burger and one fries, that is right. Okay, so this is what we have and we know that Anish and Vani cannot start preparing a new order while the previous order is being prepared. So, let us take a look at how much time each thing will take. So, uh, we have uh, the, uh, uh, so first we will start by the uh, drawing the order that we already had of Anish and Vani serving the first client. So, his order of uh, the first this took 10 minutes. So, that is 7, 8, 9, 10. So, 10 is here. This is the one burger. Then, uh, Bani does the 2 minutes. Uh, she finishes the ice cream and the fries take some 5 minutes. That is here. So, this is the first client's order. Now, they cannot start client 2's order until the first client's order is done. So, uh, neither Anish nor Bani can start with the second order till the first client is served. So, the second order will start at 10, 10 a.m. So, let us draw the second order. At 10, 10 a.m., they will start with making the two fries and one ice cream. So, the two fries will take uh, 5 minutes again till 15 minutes. This is the second client two fries. And uh, again, uh, either Anish or Bani can start with the ice cream. Let us say Anish does this this time. So, Anish does the uh, ice cream. So, that is 2 minutes. 2 is ice cream. Okay. So, that is uh, the client 2 is served at 10.15. So, client 1 is served at 10.10. Uh, 10. Client 2 is served at 10.15. Now, let us see when client 3 is served. So, client 3 comes in at 10.07 and he asks for one burger and one fries. Now, Bani, though she is free, cannot start working until client 2's order is completed. So, the client 2's order will start at 10.15 and it will go until 10.25. So, this is 10.25. So, at 10.25, the burger will be done. That is one burger and uh, uh, they also have one portion of fries which will take 5 minutes. So, this will be done at 10.20. So, this is one fries. So, the total time when the client 3 will be served. So, 3 will be served at 10.25. So, at what time is order placed by client 3 completely served? It is served at 10.25. So, the answer is 10.25. Suppose employees are allowed to process multiple orders at a time, but the preference would be to finish orders of clients who place their orders earlier. At what time would uh, is uh, is the order placed by client 2 completely served? So, we will start with the same process, except here we can have Anish or Bani working on the orders if they are free before another client's order is completed. So, we will draw the first basic diagram as it is. So, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 
21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. So that is the timeline. We have Anish, we have Bani and we have the Friar. Let's draw the first client's order. Uh, we know that the, uh, the order is uh, at 10 a.m. We have one burger, three fries and one ice cream. At 10.05, we have uh, two, uh, two fries and one ice cream. And at 10.07, we have one burger and one fries. So that is the orders that have come in. So let's, and uh, one burger is uh, 10 minutes. Uh, one fries, two fries or three fries is five minutes. And one ice cream is uh, two minutes. So we have these basic data. So let's start drawing uh, the first order. The first order, as I said, uh, Anish will start with the burger. He will be done at 10.10. This is uh, one burger. Vani will start with the ice cream. She will be done at 10.02. So this is one ice cream and the fries will be done at 10.05. So this is three fries. So at 10.10, .10, so this is when the first guy will be completely served. But at 10.05, the second order has come in. Now, Bani is free from 10.05 onwards. She can start working on the second order. So, at 10.05, she will put the fries on for the second order. So, at 10.10, the fries are over. Uh, let me draw it with a different color. So, this is client 2's order. So, that at 10.10, 10, the two fries are done. And uh, from 10.05 to 10.07, the one ice cream is also done. So, the client 2's order is done at 10.10 10 a.m. So, client 2 will be served in this case at 10.10 10 a.m. So, the answer is 10.10 10 a.m. Now, let's take a look at the last question of this. Suppose the employees are allowed to process multiple orders. So, now we can, as we had considered in the last case that one employee can start working on the next order. But the preference would be to finish orders of the clients who place their orders first. Also, assume that the fourth client came only at 10.35. Between 10 o'clock and 10.30 for how many minutes is exactly one of the employees idle. So, let us draw out the entire case. Then we will have to count the number of minutes where exactly one of them was idle. So, let us start with uh, let us start with our usual process. This is uh, there is Anish, Bani and the Friar. This is 10 a.m. and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. So, we are anyway concerned only till 10 a.m. to 10.30. So, our timeline is fine. Now, uh, let us put in the information, extra information we have. At 10 a.m., we have one burger, three fries and one ice cream. At 10.05, we have two fries and one ice cream. And at 10.07, we have one burger and one fries. So, that is all the information that we have. One burger is 10 minutes. One uh, fries, two fries, three fries is five minutes. You need not write all of this, but I am writing this so that uh, students who are seeing this for the first time are not confused about how I am going about solving this. But essentially, once you know the exact this, you can... Uh, just number the basic uh, numbers, see Anish, Bani and Friar and just start drawing, plotting the remaining graph without uh, having to put in all this extraneous information. And one ice cream is 2 minutes. So, let us draw out all the uh, clients that are, uh, how all three clients are served. So, then we will be able to know when ex exactly one of the employees free. So, let us draw out the first client's order. So, this is 10. So, An Anish is busy till 10.10. Uh, 10 making the one burger. So, this is one burger. Bani does the uh, ice cream in two minutes. So, this is one uh, ice cream and uh, the fries are done at 10.05 as such. Okay. After that, the, uh, the second order comes at 10.05. That is two fries and one ice cream. So, uh, Bani can start with the ice cream as such. In another two minutes, she will be done with the ice cream. That is two's ice cream. And uh, she can also start the fryer for two's ice cream or two's fries. So, two fries are done and uh, one's fries are these. 
So, essentially at 10 10 uh, both clients are served. Now, uh, let us come to at 10 7 we have one burger and one fries. So, at 10 7 uh, Bani is done with her uh, ice cream as such. So, she can start with the uh, burger. So, that will take her till 10 17. So, this is 10 this is 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15. So, this is 17. So, at 17 uh, I will take this color at 17 from here to here she will make the third guy's burger this is third's one burger and uh, he also has one order of fries so this is at 10 10 so 10 10 to 10 15 she will be finishing the third guy's one order of fries at 10 15 so this is one fries so at 10 17 everybody is served so uh, the first guy uh, so, from 10, 17 onwards, both of them are essentially free. So, this area is essentially immaterial to us. So, all we have to consider is from 10 am to 10, 17. From 10, 17 to 10, 30, both Anish and Bani are free. So, uh, not uh, exactly one of them will not be idle. Both of them will be idle. So, 10 am to 10, 17 is when we have to consider. So, there are two areas where uh, one of them is exactly idle. So, this finishes at 10, 10 and this finishes at 10, 17. So, for these 7 minutes, Anish is idle. Similarly, this finishes at 10, oh, uh, 10 0, 2 and this starts at 10 0, 5. So, for these 3 minutes, Bani is idle. So, at exactly one person is idle for 3 plus 7, that is 10 minutes. So, from 10, 10 a.m. to 10 30 a.m., uh, one of the uh, for the number of minutes uh, when exactly one of the employees is idle is 10 minutes. The fourth order is irrelevant because it comes after 10.30. So, for 10 minutes, exactly one of the employees is idle. So, this is how we could solve the set. As you could see that once we started drawing it out, it was very easy to visualize how to solve the set. So, we are trying to make sure that once you get the scheduling set, please just start drawing the diagram, uh, draw the timeline x in uh, on along the horizontal x axis. Uh, the machines that work, the people that work along the negative y axis and start drawing these blocks so that once you start placing the blocks, you can easily see when what will be finished as such. We at Kraku provide all the previous year CAD papers along with many other MB examinations such as IIFT, ZAT, SNAP, MAT, CMAT, TIS and PGDBA in the actual exam format. You can attempt them as a test and get a detailed analysis of your performance or download them as PDFs. This is a classic question of an arrangement, but uh, there are also uh, shades of permutations combinations that we should use to solve this question properly. So it is given that there are 12 items. The 12 items have to be kept in 16 shelves. There are 12 items. The 12 items are named from A, B, C, dot, 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 till L and there are 16 shelves. So, the 12 items are of 3 types. There are 5 biscuits, there are 3 candies and there are 4 savouries. Now, all the items of the same type have to be kept together in the shelves. So, all the 5 biscuits are together, all the 3 candies are together and all the 4 savouries are together between two different types of items there should be at least one empty shelf and so all the five biscuits if they are together there should be one empty shelf before you put the three candies together there should be at least one empty shelf before you keep the four savouries together also there cannot be more than two empty shelves together so that is also given now let us look at the additional facts it is given that in the first uh, instruction that a and B are placed uh, in consecutive number shelves in increasing order. So, A and B are of the same type of item. Similarly, I and J are placed in consecutive number shelves and both of them are higher placed than A and B. So, we know that I and J are also of the same pattern. We don't know whether I is before uh, J or J is before I, but both of them are of the same type. The next one is that D, E, F are savouries and are placed in consecutive number shelves in increasing order after all the biscuits and candies. So, we know for sure that D, E and F are three of the four savouries and they are kept after all the biscuits are uh, biscuits and candies are kept. Now, 
k is to be placed in shelf 16. So we know that if k is placed in the last shelf to the right and all the biscuits and candies are placed before savouries, it would imply that k is also a savoury and it is kept at the last. So we know that k is occupying uh, shelf 16, f is occupying shelf 15, e is occupying shelf 14 and d is occupying shelf 13 and all four of them are savouries. This is also known to us. L and J are items of same type while H is a item of different type. So remember that we know that I and J are of the same type and they are in consecutive shelves. So L is also in the same group. We don't know whether A and B are also in the same group or not but L, I and J are in the same group and H is of a different group. These two are different. C is a candy and is to be placed in a shelf preceded by two empty shelves. So we know that C is a candy. Now there are a total of only three candies. So this would imply that I, J and L are not candies. Because if I, J and L are candies and C is also a candy, there would be four candies. But that is not the case. So we know that I, J and L are three of the five biscuits. And H is definitely a candy because H is of a different type. So amongst candy we know that C and H are candies and I, J and L are biscuits. Now again you know that A and B are of the same type. Now if A and B are also candies, there would be 4 candies. This is also not possible. So we know that A and B are also biscuits. And the last one says that L is to be placed in the shelf preceded by exactly one empty shelf. So to paraphrase whatever we have done, to summarize, we know that all the biscuits are a, B, I, J and L. L is to be placed preceded by exactly one empty shelf. This means that amongst the biscuits L has to be placed first. Because if L is placed anywhere in the middle or at the last, it would not be preceded by an empty shelf. So we know that biscuits start with L, then it will have A and B and finally it will have I and J but we don't know whether it will be I first or J first amongst the two of them. So it can be L A B I J or L A B J I. In both the cases L is preceded by exactly one empty shelf. Now we also know that all the three candies, we know that two candies are C and H and if you see amongst uh, the others that is savouries and biscuits, the only item which is not named is G. So C, H and G are the three candies. Amongst the candies, because again C is preceded by two empty shelves, we know that amongst the candies C is first. So the order can be two empty shelves C and then HG or two empty shelves C and then GH. This is what we know. Now coming to the savouries, we know that the order is already determined. The order is D, E, F and K. Not just the order, we also know their exact numbers. D is 13, E is 14, F is 15 and K is 16. This is the information that we know from the instructions that are given in the question. Now let us look at the questions individually. In how many different ways can the items be arranged on the shelves? So amongst biscuits, candies and savouries, what we know for sure is that savouries come last. Now. There are two cases possible. It can be that biscuits come first and then candies. This is case one. Or the second case is that uh, candies come first, then biscuits come and then savouries come. Now if you look at the first case, the number of uh, ways in which uh, the number of different permutations that are possible are, first will be a blank space because in both the cases L is always preceded by one empty shelf. Then it will be L, A, B. This is fixed. Now we don't know the order of I and J. It can be I, J or J, I. So amongst biscuits there are two different ways in which we can arrange them. Then we know that candies come. Amongst candies we know that C is always preceded by two empty shelves. So there will be two empty shelves after uh, the biscuits end. Then it will be C but again we don't know whether it will be H or G which will come first. Now once this is done we know that there will be exactly one empty shelf and then the four savouries come and their order is already determined which is D, E, F 
and k. Now here you should know that there are four ways in which we can arrange them once we know that biscuits come before candies. Similarly, in the, way, in the second case where candies come before uh, biscuits, in this case the first two shelves will be empty because C is always preceded by two empty shelves. Then you don't know whether H will come or G or G will come or H. This is preceded, this is uh, succeeded by one empty shelf after which the biscuits start. Biscuits, the first three biscuits are known, they are L, A, B and the possibilities of change will be there only in the fourth and fifth which is between I and J. Once this is done, again there is a, uh, the order of the candy uh, savouries are known which is D, E, F, K in the last uh, four shelves. So again even in the second case, there are four possibilities in which we can arrange the different items. So the correct answer is 4 plus 4 which is 8. Now let us look at the second question. Which of the following items is not a biscuit? We know that the biscuits are here which is L, A, B, I and J. So L is a biscuit, A is a biscuit, B is a biscuit, G is not a biscuit. G is in fact a candy. So the correct answer is option D which is G. Let us look at the next question. In this question we are supposed to find out which of the following can represent the numbers of empty shelves in a possible arrangement. We have drawn all the arrangements in the first question so let us go back to this. In this question there are two cases as we have discussed before. For each of the cases let us write down the numbers of the empty shelves. In the first case one is empty this is the first one. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8 are also empty, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 and 12. So in the first case the empty shelves are 1, 7, 8 and 12. In the second case the empty shelves are 1 and 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 and 12. So the two possible arrangements in which we have empty shells are 1, 7, 8 and 12 and 1, 2, 6 and 12. Now if you look at it, 1, 7, 11 and 12 is not the correct answer, 1, 5, 6 and 12 is also not the correct answer, 1, 2, 8 and 12 is also not the correct answer but 1, 2, 6 and 12 is the correct answer because this is the arrangement of empty shells in the second case that is when candies come first, biscuits come second and savouries come third. So the correct answer is 1, 2, 6 and 12. Now let us go to the next question. Which of the following statements are necessarily true? All the biscuits are kept before candies. This is false because we have seen that it can be either biscuits first or candies first. Similarly the third option is also wrong which says that all candies are kept before biscuits. This also need not be true. Either A is true or C is true but A, neither of them can be always true. Now there are two empty shells between biscuits and candies. Now if you go here, uh, there are two empty shells between biscuits and candies is not necessarily true because in the second case where candies come before biscuits, there are two empty spaces before the candies start. But once the candies end, there is only one empty space before L begins. L is the first biscuit. So we again can't say for sure that there are two empty shells between biscuits and candies. This is only true in one case when the biscuits come before the candies. Now let us look at the last one. There are at least four shells between items B and C. If you look at again the two cases that we had drawn in the first uh, question, between B and C in the first case there are one, two, three and four shelves. So there are four empty shells between B and C in the first case. There are four shelves. In the second case between B and C there are 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. So between B and C there are at least 4 shelves in both the cases. So the correct answer is option D. Now this is a tricky question where there is a lot of uh, uh, cause, there is a lot of possibility for uh, students making mistakes. But if you keep a calm head and uh, solve and calculate all the questions, as you can see once we got uh, the instructions once you are able to put down all the information that was given in the question, in the question group and then after we solved the first question, the other three questions were just uh, extensions of the first question. So once you put down the initial effort of collecting the information that is given in the question, solving the remaining questions is not very difficult. 
Google search Kraku Cat Formulas PDF. Click on the first link. You will get a list of topics for cat. Click on one of the topics. Download the PDF to get a list of formulas for the topic. In this question, we are told that there is a school in which there are a certain number of students who are in the 11th standard. Now, the school has three streams. This is the art stream, the commerce stream and the science stream. So, a student is part of only one of these three streams. But each of the student who is part of these streams can be part of either the dance club or the music club. So, you can see the crucial word which is at least. So, whenever you see the word at least, you would know that a person can have more than one uh, type. That is, he can be part of either the dance club or the music club or both. Whenever you have this kind of a scenario, you know that this is a Venn diagrams question. But the overlap is not there in the streams. That is, all the students who are in arts are independent of all the students who are in commerce who are all independent of all the students who are in science. The overlap is there only within each of these streams. So, we will draw three Venn diagrams. This is for the art students. This is for the commerce students. And this is for the science students. So, once we are able to fill out these numbers, this is for arts, this is for commerce, and this is for science. Once we are able to fill out each of this, this is for dance club, this is for music club, dance club, music club, dance club and music club. Once we are able to fill out each of the areas, we will be able to easily answer the questions that follow. Now we are told that the total number of music students are 80 and total number of dance students is 65. So total number of music students is 80 and total number of dance students is 65. The 10 commerce students who are in dance club are also in music club. So in commerce, there is no student who is part of only the dance club. So this has to be 0 and all the 10 students who are in dance club are also part of the music club. So the overlap will be 10. The number of students who are in dance club but not music club is the same in both arts and science club. So the number of students who are part of only the dance club is this area. This we are told is the same between arts and science. So let us assume that that is equal to A. The number of students who are in music club, who are in music club but are in, not in dance club is 45 across the three streams. So let us assume that the number is M1, M2 and M3. So M1 represents the number of students who are in arts, who are part of the music club but not dance club. Similarly, M2 is the number of students who are in commerce, who are only in music club but not in dance club. And even M3 is the science students who are only in music club but not uh, dance club. We are told that M1 plus M2 plus M3 is equal to 45. Among the 35 art students, so we are told that the number of art students is 35. 5 students are in both music and dance club. So this is 5. The overlap in the arts category between music and dance is 5. This would also tell us that M1 plus 5 plus A is 35. Or M1 plus A is equal to 30. Finally, we are told that the number of science students who are in both music and dance club, so in science, the overlap, this is equal to the number of commerce students, this is the commerce students, who are in music club but not in dance club, that is M2. So now we know the total number of students who are in music and the total number of students who are in dance. So if you total it up, because we know that all the students who are in music is 80, we will get that. In arts, the number of students in music is M1 plus 5. This is M1 and this is 5. In commerce, it is M2 plus 10. This is M2 and this is 10. And in science, it is M2 plus M3. This is M3 and this is M2. This will total up to 80. So if you cancel 5 and 10, this will total up to 65. But we know that M1 plus M2 plus M3 is 45. So M1 plus M2 plus M3 will be 65 minus 45, that is M2 is equal to 20. So we are already able to solve one of the variables. There are four variables, M1, M2, M3 and A. If we are able to solve them, we can easily fill out the, all the Venn diagrams. We also know that all the, the total number of dance students is 65. The number of dance students in arts is A plus 5. The number of dance students in commerce is 0 plus 10, that is 10. 
and in science the number of dance students is a plus m2 this we are told is equal to 65 we can again solve it this is 5 plus 10 is 15 so 65 minus 15 is 50 we already know that m2 is equal to 20 so this is 30 50 minus 20 or 2a is equal to 30 or a is equal to 15 once you know that a is equal to 15 you can figure out that m1 is equal to 30 minus 15 which is 15 and if you know m1 and m2 m3 can be easily calculated m3 will equal 45 minus m1 plus m2 m1 plus m2 is 20 plus 15 that is 35 so m3 is equal to 10 so you know that m1 is equal to 15 m2 is equal to 20 m3 is equal to 10 and a is equal to 15 so we can easily substitute the the values in each of the venn diagrams so now we can go ahead and answer the questions the number of commerce students who are only in music club is in commerce students the number of students who are only in music is m2 and the value of m2 is 20 so the correct answer is 20. The number of science students who are only in the music club is this is science students who are only in music is m3 so that is equal to 10 so the correct answer is 10. The number of students who are in both music and dance clubs is 5 plus 10 plus m2 so 5 plus 10 plus m2 m2 is equal to 20 we already know that so this total will be 5 plus 10, 15 plus 20 is 35. And finally, the last club is the total number of students in the school in 11th standards, that is across all the three streams. In arts, we already know that there are 35 students. This has been given to us. In commerce, it will be 0 plus 10 plus M2. M2 is 20, so this is 10 plus 20, which is equal to 30. And in science, it is a plus m2 plus m3 a is 15 m2 is 20 and m3 is 10 so this is 30 45 so the total will be 35 plus 30 65 plus 45 which is 110 that is the answer google search crack for free cat mock click on the first link you can attempt a free mock test which was attempted by 30,000 CAT aspirants in the actual exam format. After completing the test, you get detailed solutions, analysis and percentile along with your scorecard to gauge your All India performance. Click on the solution to get video solutions from our expert faculty. Let's look at this question. So this is a coding and decoding based question. This is a sort of a puzzle based question where you deduce things. Every year there is a question like this, a math based puzzles. Cat authors love to give questions like this and many students found it very difficult to solve. It is not a very difficult question but you need to get the right order when you solve this question. Because if you start out on the wrong foot in this question, it will get a whole lot difficult after that. So you just need to solve it optimally going in the right order. Let's try to solve it. According to a coding scheme, the sentence peacock is designated as the national bird of India is coded as this big number. So first of all, you need not write down this entire thing. Many students write down peacock is designated as national bird of India and then the sequence that itself will take you about one minute. As and when you are solving, you can write down what is required and try to deduce or if you feel this is optimal for you, you can do it that way also. So let's look at the conditions. The coding scheme has the following rules. The scheme is case sensitive, does not distinguish between upper and lower case letters. Each letter has a unique code, which is a single digit from among 1 to 9. Okay. The digit 9 codes 2 letters and every other digit codes 3 letters. Okay. So they, they have given this as well. We know that there are 26 alphabets. Each of the digits 1 to 9 code for 1, 2 or multiple uh, characters. But here they have specified that digit 9 codes for 2 characters, while all the other digit codes for three characters so 8 into 3 plus 2 
so that will be 26 so all the 26 characters are coded by 1 to 9 where 9 codes 3 uh, 2 characters while all other codes 3 characters then the last condition says the code for a word is constructed by arranging the digits corresponding to its letters in a non decreasing sequence so that is it is arranged in an increasing sequence let's say this is what is 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 coded as 3 5 let's say if considering that is is coded as 5 3 then it, when it is coded it will be written as 3 5 because it is arranged in an increasing order the same will happen with all the words so we have to figure out which letter corresponds to which number let's try to solve it One, two, three, four, five. It is given in the question that nine is coded for two characters while all others are coded for three characters okay so how do we approach the question now first of all we need to look for small words as small as possible and they need to have some sort of repetition of a few letters the small words we have is is small as is small and off is small among these we can see that is and as both of them have s in common so let's write down is and as is is coded as 3 5 while as is coded as 5 6 so among both of this we can observe that only 5 is common s is common in the word and 5 is common in the code so s has got to be 5 so we'll write down 5 as yes and then we have i i stands for 3 we have i here and then we have a a is for 6 so we have a here until here we have got now we have three characters one s i and a using this which other word can we target so shall we target peacock there is nothing in that shall we target designated there is i s and a but it's very big word it's better to stay away until the last and then we have the there is nothing in common there is national again a little big word we have bird there is one letter in common and lastly we have india india has three of them i twice it comes and a comes once so the best one would be to target india let's write down india india is coded as one double three triple six so right now we know that i stands for 3 so we have two i's here those two threes you can cancel we have a a stands for 6 so a and 6 you can cancel now we have con we have confusion between n and d so this implies that n or d either of them is 1 or 6 n or d is either 1 or 6 so where can we find n or d which is the next one until now which are the words that you have done with now we are done with is we are done with as and now we are done with india only confusion we have is n or d is one of them is 1 or 6 so can you can either tar target national which has n or you can target bird since bird is smaller let's first take bird okay i'll write down bird bird is coded as 1334 bird is coded as 1334 what do we know we know that i is 3 so we cancel out 3 then we have b r d here d is either 1 or 6 there is no 6 present there is only 1 so this 1 got to be d you can write down d is 6 d is 1 we get d is 1 and n is 6 n is 6 d is 1 here so this arises one more confusion here there is one more choice that is b or r is either 3 or 4 we have two cases b or r is either 3 or 4 then let's go ahead let's target national we know that n is 1 we already got that n is 6 we got that let's say we will write down national national is coded as 13666689 so what do we know among this we know i is 3 a is 6 and n is 6 so n a n a all of them are 6 all these four go away i is 3 3 goes away then we have t o l and we have 189 so t o l and we have 189 we do not know either of the three so where can we find t or o or l if you look in the sentence then we have the the is there off is there off is a smaller one so it is better we target off let's say we target off i take of of stands for seven nine 
so what is common in these two only 9 is common so naturally o has got to be 9 o is 9 and f is 7 you get 2 from this i'll write down o is 9 and f is 7 after that still there is a confusion between t and l t or l is it is either 1 or 8 t or l is either 1 or 8 so let's take the 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 has the is coded as we can say it as 4 5 8 the is coded as 4 5 8 only 8 is common among these two so 8 is t here now get 8 this will arise another confusion that h or e is 4 or 5 so from this we have 8 is t and l is 1 so we we'll get 8 is t and l is 1 well, we know that h or e is 4 or 5. So, where can we find either h or e? We can find e in peacock, we can find e in designated as well. All the others are done, only peacock and designated is left. Peacock is smaller, so it is better we target peacock first. So, I will write down peacock. Peacock is coded as 5688999. 5688999. Eight, eight, nine, nine, nine. So, there are, I, am, I have a confusion between H or E and there is only E present. E is either 4 or 5. So there is only E 5 present once here. So, this E has got to be 5. So, E is 5 and H is 4. So write that down. E is 5 and H is 4. And I know A is 6. So, there is one A here. I will uh, target that. Apart from that, what do I know? I know that O is uh, 9. I scratch off 9. So, now we are left with P, C, C and K. So, this C, C can either be 8, 8 or C, C can be 9, 9. Now, you have to remember one important factor that they are given before. That 9 codes for only 2 letters. It does not code for 3 letters. So, let us take the case where C, C stands for 8, 8. Then P, K will be 9, 9. We already know that 9 codes for O. So, if both P, K codes for O, then 9 will have 3, uh, three characters coding. So, it is not possible. So, C has to be 9. So, we have C is 9 and P, K is 8. These two is 8, C is 9. This is the only possible case. We will write C here and we will write P, K here. And lastly, we have the word designated. Let us write down designated. D, E, S, I, G, N, A, T, U, D. This is coded as 1, 1, 3, triple 5, 6, 6, 7, 8. So, we have most, we know most of the stuff, D is 1, we know that, there are 2 Ds, we will cancel these 2, E we found it as 5, E is 5, S is 5, A and N is 6, so E is 5, S is 5, A N, both of them are 6, I it is 3 and then T, what is T, T is 8 and we have E, E is again 5. So, we are only left with G and we are left with 7. So, G has got to be 7. This is the last one. So, we get G as 7. So, we have reached the conclusion. We have used all the characters and finally, we are left with this one conundrum that B or R is 3 or 4. Among all the given letters, we have got everything except for B or R. B or R is either 3 or 4. Okay. So, let us look at the questions now. First one is what best can be concluded about the code for the letter L. So, we have already found L. L is number 1. So, it is 1. They have given the options. The answer is option A. Second one, what best can be concluded about the code for the letter B. Do you know where is letter B? No, we do not know. We have a confusion between it is either 3 or it is 4. So, what are the options? We have an option 3 or 4. So, this is the right option. Third one, for how many digits can the complete list of letters associated with that digit can be determined? Okay. How many digits? Let us say many students uh, fall into this bait and they will only mark as 1. That is because 8 codes for everything. But remember that 9 codes for only 2 characters. And 9 has also coded for everything that it can code. The maximum it can code. So, there are 2 such digits. What have they asked for? For how many digits can the complete list of characters list or letters associated with it? can be identified that is 2 one is 8 which has 3 characters and one is 9 which has 2 characters so the right answer is 2 last one which set of letters cannot be coded with the same digit 
S E Z is S C -E Z possible? Yes. For five, we can do S E is there. We can take S C -E Z. It is possible. I B M is I B M possible? I has B M come anywhere? No, we have not used B or M anywhere. B there is a confusion. B can come to either three or four. So certainly B can come here. M can also come. So I B M can be coded for the single one. That is number three. S U V is this possible? SE is already coded for phi, so SUV can never come because SE is already coded. So naturally, the answer is SUV. Let's also check XYZ. Is XYZ possible? XYZ is not used anywhere. This is not X. This is to represent that nine can only take two characters. XYZ is not coded, and two is entirely empty. So this can be XYZ. So XYZ is certainly possible again. So the right answer is SUV. We at Traku provide all the previous year CAT papers along with many other MB examinations such as IIFT, ZAT, SNAP, MAT, CMAT, TIS, and PGDBA in the actual exam format. You can attempt them as a test and get a detailed analysis of your performance or download them as PDFs. In this question, we are given nine slots. They are kept in three rows and three columns. We are told that in each of the nine slots there are three pouches, and each of the pouch contains some number of coins. In uh, the second table, we are given the maximum and the minimum number of coins in each of the pouches. For example, in column one and row three, out of the three pouches, the minimum number of coins in a pouch is two, and the maximum number of coins is four. We are also told that the sum of the coins in any of the three uh, columns. Is uh, a multiple of nine. Similarly, the sum of the number of coins in all the pouches in any single row is a multiple of nine. So, to solve this question, we need to find out the number of coins in each of the pouches in the nine slots. So, there are three pouches in nine slots, total of twenty-seven pouches. If we can figure out how many coins are there in each of these pouches, we are done. So, let us get started. Let us first draw a three cross three table. This is the three cross three table. These, uh, this is column one. This is column two. This is column three. This is row one. This is row two, and this is row three. Now, in column one, row one, the minimum number of coins is two, and the maximum number of coins is four. So there will be two. We don't know how much is there in the middle pouch, but we know that the maximum is four. Similarly, in the second one, we know that it is six. We don't know how much is there in the second one, and then there is eight. And in the third one, one and three. Similarly, there is three and five. In column two and row two, we know that the minimum is one and the maximum is one. So all the three pouches will contain one. In column three, we have six and twenty. In row three, we have one and two. Similarly, one and two. Similarly, two and five. Normally, if you look at it, we can get a sense that to find out. Uh, Uh, the information about each of the pouches. We need to calculate the sum of each of the column and sum of each of the row. We are given one important condition that all these sums should be multiples of nine. So we can figure out that okay, the numbers uh, should be in certain intervals. We'll start off with uh, numbers which are close to each other instead of going for six and twenty because six and twenty the interval is very wide. So trying to figure it out uh, is probably to be more time consuming. Anyway, we are also given one more additional uh, condition that the total amount of money in the first column, that is here, and the third row, that is here, that is this column, is four. We know that the minimum is one and the maximum is two. That is already three. So the middle number should also be one. This is the information that is given to us. Now, if you calculate, let us calculate the sum of all the numbers in column two. You can approach it in many ways. You can approach it either in column one or column two. I am approaching it in column two because I know that uh, all the three numbers here are one, one, one. So the total of this is three. The total of this column, this uh, uh, this lot is four. The total of this is fourteen plus x, where we do because we don't know the middle number. So this is seventeen plus x, and uh, when you are adding uh, the three here, and if you are adding the three of this, it will be twenty plus some number. But you know that the sum of the column two is a multiple of nine, and you know that uh, all the numbers that are there, other than the two numbers in uh, the first row and the third row, we know all the other numbers, and their sum is twenty. So the only multiple of uh, nine, which is close to twenty, greater than twenty, 
and which will fit this interval is 27. So, the sum of the column is 27. Why can it not be 36? Because for it to be 36, the sum of the two remaining numbers should be 16. But you know that the sum of uh, the numbers in R3, that is the row 3, the maximum is 2. So, this number is either 1 or 2 and this number is either 6 or 7 or 8. So, the sum will not be 16, the sum will only be 7. So, just to reiterate, you have 9 numbers in column 2 of which we know 7 numbers. We know 2 numbers in row 3, we know all the 3 numbers in row 2 and we know 2 numbers in uh, row 3. The sum of these 7 numbers is 20 and the sum of the 9 numbers is a multiple of 9 and we know that uh, the only multiple of 9 which will fit here is 27. So, the sum of the first row number, the middle number in the first row and the sum of the middle number in the third row is equal to 7. Now, once you know that, if say this is A and say this is B, we know that A plus B is equal to 7. But we also know that A is greater than or equal to 6 because A is the middle number, it is greater than or equal to 6. We are told that 6 is the minimum number and B is greater than or equal to 1. So, the only way in which A plus B will actually equal 7 is when A is equal to 6 and B is equal to 1. We can replace A with 6. So, we know that the middle number is 6 and uh, B is equal to 1. Now, so that is uh, the sum of column 2 is equal to 27. We can go for either C3 or C1. Let us go with uh, C1. In this case, again out of 7 numbers, we know out of 9 numbers, we know 7 numbers. We know all the 3 numbers of row 3. We know 2 numbers of row 2 and we know 1 number of row 1. If you calculate the sum of all the 7 numbers that you have, 2 plus 4 is 6, 3 plus 5 is uh, 8, so 6 plus 8 is 14, 14 plus 4 is uh, 18. So again, the sum of C1 will is greater than 18 and it is a multiple of 9. The only way this is going to happen is when the sum also equals 27. Again, clearly the sum cannot equal 36 because the sum of the two missing numbers cannot be 18 by themselves because both of them are less than or equal to 5. So, we know that the sum of the two numbers say again A and B, in this case A plus B is equal to 9. Why is A plus B equal to 9? Because the sum of the remaining 7 numbers is 18 and the sum of all the 9 numbers is a multiple of 9. So, the remaining two numbers should add up to 9. In this case, we know that A is less than or equal to 4 because uh, 4 is the maximum and B is less than or equal to 5. Again for A plus B to be equal to 9, both of them should equal 4 and 5. So, we can replace A with 4 and B with 5. So, what are numbers we have? Let us first uh, find out the sum of all the numbers in the slot. So, this is 4 plus 4 plus 2, so this is 10. 6 plus 6 plus 8, this is 20. 5 plus 5 plus 3, this is 13. This is 3, we already found out and this is 4. Now, we can calculate the sum of all the numbers in row 3 because we know 8 of the numbers. We know 3 numbers here, 3 numbers here and 2 numbers here. So, if you calculate the sum, it is 4 plus 4 that is 8, 8 plus 2 plus 5 that is 15. Now, we need a multiple of uh, 9 which is greater than 15. So, this has to be 18. So, the min, uh, middle number has to be 3. Similarly, we can uh, calculate the sum of R2. 13 plus 3 is 16, 16 plus 6 is uh, 16 plus 6 is 22, 22 plus 20 is 42. So, we need a multiple of 9 which is greater than 42. So, it can be either 45 or 54 or 63. But it can't be 45 because uh, the sum of the 8 numbers is equal to 42. So, if this is equal to 45, the middle number over here has to be 3. But it can't be 3 because it is greater than or equal to 6 and less than or equal to 20. So, we can rule out 45. Similarly, for it to be 63, the middle number has to be 21. This also can be ruled out because we know that it is less than or equal to 20. So, the sum has to equal 54 and if the sum is 54, the middle number over here is 12 because the sum of the other 8 numbers is equal to 42. Similarly, if you are looking at uh, R1, we know 8 numbers, the sum of the first tree is 10, the sum of the second tree is 20, so the total is 30, 30 plus 1 plus 3 is 34. So, the multiple of 9 which is greater than 34 is 36. So, the middle number has to be 2. We have actually found out all the numbers of each of the slots and of each of the individual pouches also.
what is the total amount of money in rupees in the three pouches kept, kept in the first column of the second row this is second row this is first column so we are looking at uh, this uh, uh, slot and that equals 13 so the answer is 13 how many pouches contain exactly one coin so you can see that there are uh, nine slots each slot contains three pouches so there are a total of 27 pouches of which we'll have to find out how many times one comes so this is one this is three so total is four till now there is five and six and there is seven and eight so the total number of ones is eight let us go to the next question what is the number of slots for which the average amount in rupees of its pouches is an integer so each slot contains three pouches if you want the average to be an integer you want the sum to be a multiple of three so it is not uh, this one because the sum is 10 which is not a multiple of 3 it is not uh, the second one also because it is 20 the sum of these three is 6 so this is a multiple of 3 so we have 1 it is not uh, the fourth uh, slot because 13 is not a multiple of 3 the fifth slot actually works because it's 3 the third one if you uh, count the sum it is 38 so this also is not a multiple of 3 this is also not a multiple of 3 8th one is also not a multiple of 3. The last one, 9th one, if you calculate the sum, it is 10. So the only number is the third one and the fifth one. So the answer in this case is 2. Let us look at the last question. The number of slots for which the total amount in its three pouches strictly exceeds 10. Again, we will go back. Uh, it is not the first slot it is the second slot not the third slot fourth slot works fifth slot doesn't work sixth slot works seventh slot doesn't work eighth slot doesn't work ninth slot doesn't work so the total is three uh, this one this one and this one so again the answer is three if you have all the number of coins in each of the 27 pouches in the nine slots answering all the four questions is very easy and to find out the number of uh, coins in each of the pouches all we have used is that the sum of the number of coins in the pouches of all the rows and all the columns should be a multiple of 9. If you figure it out and if you find it, you can easily solve this problem. Google search Kraku Cat Formulas PDF. Click on the first link. You will get a list of topics for cat. Click on one of the topics. Download the PDF to get a list of formulas for the topic. Hi friends, welcome to Krakow's video series. In this particular video, we are going to take a look at the 2D space Ella puzzle and this is a slightly harder puzzle. It is going to take you some time to solve it. So let's consider the puzzle. Uh, uh, Suresh is an old sharpshooter who frequently participates in uh, games of chance where prizes are, to, uh, are available for winning. He gets a chance to participate in a shooting game show where the contestants can win prizes by shooting down balloons in into a, on a 4 into 4 grid shown below in cell numbers. So this is the 4 into 4 grid, this is cell 1, cell 2, cell 3 and so on, okay. Now uh, behind each balloon is hidden the name of the pri uh, prize that the person wins. So basically there is a balloon, you shoot it and behind that is the name of the prize. Uh, each contestant gets exactly one, one chance to shoot. The grand prize of the contest is the keys to a brand new Toyota Fortuna car. Suresh who is desperate to win the car gets to know a few clues about how the prices are placed along uh, on the grid through the informer. So we need to figure out where the prizes are there on this 4 into 4 grid and we have a few clues. So let's consider the clues. So the first clue is T weighs 1 below the washing machine. So if you have washing machine over here, then you have uh, something like this. So you have TV 1 below it. Gold coin is 1 below and 1 to the left of TV. So this is 1 below and 1 to the left. So this is your gold coin over here. Scooter's immediate neighbors to the sides are the radio and washing machine. So washing machine is a neighbor of scooter. So it can be a neighbor to the left or to the right. So you can have your scooter over here and the radio over here. Or the alternate configuration is basically you have uh, something like this, which is uh, you have scooter over here, washing machine over here, radio over here. And TV is one below the washing machine and gold coin is one below and one to the left of the uh, TV as such. So this is the gold coin as such. Okay, these are the uh, two ways of interpreting uh, uh, the sentence that is third sentence. 
so these three sentences are uh, interpreted the radio is three places above the laptop so if this is the radio this is the laptop similarly if this is the radio this is the laptop the oven is one to the left of the microwave so if this is the microwave then you have uh, so if you have something like this so this would be the oven and uh, the mixer grinder is one to the left and one above the fridge so if you have uh, the fridge over here then you have your mixer grinder over here one to the left and one above the fridge yeah the sari is one to the left of mixer grinder so your sari is over here and uh, one above the phone so this is your phone is over here so essentially i have interpreted these two rules also this rule also the first seven rules are interpreted and i have uh, shown them through the diagram as such the silver coin is vertically between the car key and suitcase and the suitcase has more than two neighbors so basically if you have something like this this means that your silver coin is over here your car key or suitcase is over here and suitcase car key is over here now since it says it is between two neighbors uh, it it is between the two either car key is up and suitcase is down or suitcase is up and car key is down and we have a block of 3 like this the ipad is two to the left of the microwave so the ipad is over here so essentially i get some uh, like blocks which i have to fit in a 4 is to 4 grid this is one block these are the two possibilities of the big block of five uh, of uh, this the remaining are three three this is three vertical this is three horizontal and this is a smaller block of four so essentially i should try to fit the blocks in such a way that i get a four into four grid so let me actually first start off by trying to place the biggest blocks these two blocks into the grid and see what cases are there and based on the cases i'll try to fit the smaller three blocks over there so let me write down the smaller blocks one is a horizontal block of 3 which is this is ipad oven and microwave and this is a vertical block of 3 which is car key or suitcase uh, silver coin and suitcase or car key and this is used i have not used the fact that the suitcase has two more neighbors so i'll keep it as it is and the third one is this basically which is something like this you have sari and uh, phone and you have a mixer grinder and you have a fridge like this so it's like a uh, something like this okay we have uh, one block one block one block and uh, a diagonally block uh, below so you have these are the three blocks that we are still place we'll start start by first placing the bigger blocks as such so let me uh, try to place the bigger blocks so i'll clean this up so that i can show the different uh, ways in which i can keep the big blocks in the uh 4 into 4 grid now if you consider the first block uh if you see the first block this is 4 wide and this is 4 tall so there is only one way in which you can put it in a 4 to 4 grid because essentially this is like a first uh, column this is a uh, fourth column this is first row this is last row so if you have a 4 into 4 grid there is only one way of placing this particular block in a 4 to 4 grid which is like this this is washing machine this is silver uh, this is scooter this is radio this is laptop this is tv and this is gold coin i can't talk, place it in any other way than this way but for this one since this is only three columns wide i have the option that this is like the first two one two three column or this is like one is over here this is two three and four so there are two ways in which i can place that block which is uh, this is one so you have uh, and i'll draw another grid over here which is the second way of uh, putting it so this is one two three four so one way is basically i put radio over here which is in the first column first uh, row it has to be in the first row because this is like four rows wide and there are only four rows in the grid so it has to be in the first row radio scooter and washing machine have to be in the first row irrespective of whatever so this basically means that this is radio this is scooter this is washing machine this is tv this is gold coin and this is laptop or if this since this is three wide it can be in the second column also it can be shifted by one column so this can be radio this can be scooter this can be washing machine tv gold coin and laptop so these are the two configurations from this configuration as such so now that i have placed this i'll remove this configurations and I, these are the three cases that i have and in these three cases i have to see whether i can fit the remaining blocks so consider the first block now i'll go from the largest pieces to the smallest pieces so the next largest piece is this uh, block of four blocks which is sari phone mixer grinder and fridge See the sari is uh, two to the left of fridge. So basically, sari has to be in the first two columns. It can't be in the third column. In that case, fridge will be in like the fifth column, which is not there. So sari has to be in the uh, first two columns. And since phone is below it and fridge is below it, it has to be in the first three rows. 
So if I consider this particular thing, this means that sari has to be here or here uh, or here. These are the three places in which I can place my sari so that I can, uh, it has to be in basically in the first three uh, rows or two columns. So it can be in any of these three places. Sari, I can't place it here because washing machine is there in the place of mixer grinder. Same over here, washing uh, TV is there in the place of mixer grinder. So I can't place sari over here. If I place sari over here, then I get a mixer grinder over here, phone over here, but I can't place fridge over here because laptop is already there. So essentially I can't place this uh, four block grid in this one because there is no place for me to do that. So essentially if this doesn't fit in this uh, particular configuration, this configuration is not possible. So we are left with two cases. Let us try to see if, uh, whether I can fit this sari and um, uh, fridge com uh, configuration in any of the other cases. In this case, basically sari can be over here, here, uh, here uh, and this uh, it has to be in the first two columns and first three rows as such. See, sari cannot be over here because radio is here and mixer grinder had to be there. Sari cannot be over here because it would be sari mixer grinder and instead of fridge you have your gold coin. So, sari cannot be over here also. So, essentially the first two, uh, these are not possible. If I have my sari over here, then this is mixer grinder, this is fridge, this is phone, this is possible. If I have my sari over here, I can't put the mixer grinder, so even this is impossible. If I have my sari over here, this is mixer grinder, this is phone, this is fridge. So I have two ways of placing sari, which is first is that uh, I can place it like this or I can place it like this. So let me consider both cases one by one. So let me say that I place sari over here, this is mixer grinder, this is phone, this is fridge. Now, I need uh, to place a uh, three wide block which is iPad oven microwave. Now, do I have any three wide block? I don't have because essentially this is uh, laptop is in the middle. So, essentially I don't have a three wide continuous block anywhere which means that I cannot place like this and uh, I, in, if I place sorry, my uh, mixer grinder and phone like this, I don't get three contiguous spaces for the iPad uh, block as such. So, this uh, particular configuration is impossible. So that means that I have to place it like this, which is sari, mixer, grinder, fridge and phone. In this case, I have a place uh, for that iPad oven microwave uh, block, but I don't have a three block for that car key, suitcase and silver coin. There has to be a three block with vertical three blocks that I don't have. So clearly, if uh, either position I put of this, this block, I can't place one or the other. So in one position, I can't place this block. In the other position, I can't place this block. So this configuration is impossible as such. Now I'm left with one configuration, this case as such, and I'll try to put my sari uh, mixer grinder phone and fridge block. So over here, essentially these are the three places in which I can put sari. I can't put sari over here because the gold coin is over here. I can't put sari over here because the TV is over here, which should have been the place for mixer grinder. So only one place is sari is over here, mixer grinder is over here, phone is over here, and fridge is over here. So that is the only way in which I can actually place the block as such. Now if I place this block, I need to put a three wide block for iPad oven and microwave. Only three wide block is this block over here. If you can see, so this is iPad, this is oven and this is microwave. I need a three wide block for uh, this which is car key, suitcase and silver coin. So this is car key or suitcase, this is silver coin and this is suitcase or car key. Now it is given that uh, the suitcase has more than two neighbors and the neighboring cell is basically one that shares an edge with a given cell. So if this is suitcase in this corner, it would have only two neighbors, but it is given that the suitcase has more than two neighbors, which would mean that it is not in a corner. So this is car key over here and this is suitcase over here and the uh, silver coin is in the middle. So this is your final configuration. I have used up all clues and I've gotten a four into four configuration. So you have radio, sari, phone, laptops, uh, scooter, uh, uh, mixer grinder, gold coin, iPad, washing machine, TV, fridge, oven, car key, uh, silver coin, I'll use uh, this, so this I'll put as silver. So this is silver coin, this is a suitcase and this is the microwave, okay? So this is basically the final configuration of how the uh, prizes are placed. So now that I have the final configuration of how the prizes are placed, let us try to uh, uh, take a look at the question. So the first question is which cell should uh, Suresh shoot to win the car? So if the car key is below this uh, this one over here in this corner, that is essentially cell 4. So you should uh, shoot cell 4 which is option B.
uh, if Suresh accidentally shoots the balloon in cell 10, what does he win? In cell 10, cell 10 is basically this one over here, which is the gold coin. So he's going to win the gold coin, which is option D. The third question is, if Suresh tries to win the TV instead, which cell should he shoot at? If he shoots or tries to win the TV instead, so TV is over here, which is cell number 7. So he should shoot cell number 7, okay, which is option C. If the iPad has laptop and an oven as two of its neighbors, who among the following can be the third neighbor? So iPad has laptop and oven as the two neighbors, there is only one configuration. So iPad has laptop and uh, an oven. So the third neighbor is gold coin again. So what is the third neighbor of iPad? The third neighbor of iPad is gold coin. So the right answer is option A. So as you could see in this particular uh, set, we had to actually fit different blocks together to get the final answer. This is like a slightly harder version of ar uh, arrangements and in this you have to draw a lot of uh, diagrams to solve. So this is like a typical 2D puzzle where you have to draw a lot to actually get to the answer. Now that you know how to answer such kind of sets, please uh, take more tests from the study room to know how to solve more sets of 2D puzzles as such. Thank you for tuning in. Google search crack for free cat mock. Click on the first link. You can attempt a free mock test which was attempted by 30,000 cat aspirants in the actual exam format. After completing the test, you get detailed solutions, analysis and percentile along with your scorecard to gauge your All India performance. Click on the solution to get video solutions from our expert faculty. In this question, we are given the statistics of 11 players who played for the Indian cricket team. Their names are from A to K. So we have been given their batting average, their strike rate, wickets, catches and runouts. And we are also given three additional statistics about their speed, strength and agility. These three are used to figure out their fitness index. Fitness index is defined as 0.4 into their speed plus 0.3 into their strength plus 0.3 into their agility. Similarly, we have been given some stats about 8 players who played IPL but haven't played for the Indian cricket team. We have been given their runs, strike rate, average and wickets and in addition to it, we haven't been given their individual statistics about their strength, speed and agility but we have been given their fitness index. With this information, let us go ahead and answer the questions that follow. We are asked to find out among the players who played for the Indian cricket team, that is amongst the players from A to K, how many of them have a minimum fitness index of 85. So we are required to find out how many of these guys have a fitness index which is greater than or equal to 85. So for each one of them, we can calculate their fitness index. So for example, for A, we can say that his fitness index is 0 0.4 into 78 plus 0 0.3 into 89 plus 0 0.3 into 90 get the number and figure out whether this is greater than 85 or not. But another way to look at it is to just find out for each one of them, that is for speed, strength and agility, how different each one of them is from 85 and calculate the, weight, calculate the weighted uh, number and see if it is positive or negative. For example, for A, we can say that the new number is 0 0.4 into 78 minus 85, which is minus 7 plus 0 0.3 into 89 minus 85 which is equal to 4 plus 0 0.3 into 90 minus 85 which is equal to 5. If this number is greater than or equal to 0 then A's fitness index will be greater than or equal to 85 and vice versa. For example this will be minus 2.8 plus 1.2 plus 1.5 this is equal to minus 0.1. So A's fitness index is not greater than or equal to 85. We will do the same for B. B is 75, so this is 0 0.4 into minus 10 and next is 91, so this is 0 0.3 into 6 plus 92 is 0 0.3 into 7. This is equal to minus 4 plus 1.8 plus 2.1. This is also equal to minus 0 0.1, so B's fitness index is also not greater than or equal to 85. Next is 67, 99 and 89. 67 will be 0 0.4 into minus 18 because 67 minus 85 is minus 18 plus 99 will be 0 0.3 into 14 and 89 will be plus 0 0.3 into 4. This is equal to minus 7.2 plus 4.2 plus 1.2. Again, we need not calculate the actual number. We just know that this is also less than 0. So, for C also, the fitness index is not greater than or equal to 85. 
नेक्स्ट विल बी सेवेंटी नाइन एटी सिक्स एंड नाइन्टी फोर सेवेंटी नाइन विल बी जीरो पॉइंट फोर इंटू माइनस सिक्स प्लस एटी सिक्स इज जीरो पॉइंट थ्री इंटू वन एंड नाइन्टी फोर इज जीरो पॉइंट थ्री इंटू एट दिस इज माइनस टू पॉइंट फोर प्लस जीरो पॉइंट थ्री प्लस टू पॉइंट फोर सो यू नो दैट दिस नंबर इज ग्रेटर दैन जीरो सो द फिटनेस इंडेक्स ऑफ डी इज ग्रेटर दैन जीरो नेक्स्ट इज एटी वन एटी सेवन एंड नाइन्टी थ्री यू कैन लुक एट इट एंड यू कैन फिगर आउट दैट एटी वन इज जस्ट माइनस फोर एंड एटी सेवन इज प्लस टू एंड नाइन्टी थ्री इज प्लस एट यू कैन फिगर आउट दैट दिस इज ग्रेटर दैन जीरो बिकॉज जीरो पॉइंट फोर इंटू माइनस पॉइंट फोर इज जस्ट माइनस वन पॉइंट सिक्स एंड जीरो पॉइंट थ्री इंटू एट इज टू पॉइंट फोर सो ऑलरेडी इट इज पॉजिटिव इफ यू एड जीरो पॉइंट थ्री इंटू टू यू आर गोइंट टू गेट अनदर जीरो पॉइंट सिक्स सो दिस विल डेफिनेटली बी ग्रेटर दैन जीरो नेक्स्ट इज एटी फाइव नाइन्टी एंड नाइन्टी वन ऑल ऑफ दम आर ग्रेटर दैन और इक्वल टू एटी फाइव सो अगेन यू नो दैट द फिटनेस इंडेक्स ऑफ दिस गई एफ ऑल्सो विल बी ग्रेटर दैन और इक्वल टू एटी फाइव नेक्स्ट इज सेवेंटी नाइन नाइन्टी फाइव एंड एटी एट अगेन यू गेट ए सेंस दैट दिस विल बी ग्रेटर दैन जीरो बिकॉज सेवेंटी नाइन इज जीरो पॉइंट फोर इंटू माइनस सिक्स नाइन्टी फाइव इज जीरो पॉइंट थ्री इंटू टेन सो इफ यू आर जस्ट कंपेरिंग दिस टू इवन इफ यू आर इग्नोरिंग द जीरो पॉइंट थ्री इंटू एटी एट विल बी थ्री दिस इज माइनस टू पॉइंट फोर एंड दिस इज थ्री एंड दिस इज जीरो पॉइंट नाइन सो द सम ऑफ दिस टू इट सेल्फ इज पॉजिटिव सो हिस फिटनेस इंडेक्स ऑल्सो विल बी ग्रेटर दैन जीरो नेक्स्ट इज एटी टू एटी नाइन हंड्रेड अगेन यू नो दिस विल बी ग्रेटर दैन और इक्वल टू एटी फाइव बिकॉज द ओनली थिंग विच इज लेस दैन एटी फाइव इज एटी टू विच इज लेस दैन एटी फाइव बाई अ वेरी स्मॉल मार्जिन बट हंड्रेड ऑन द अदर हैंड इज मच लार्जर दैन एटी फाइव सो द ओवरऑल वेटेड एवरेज विल डेफिनेटली बी ग्रेटर दैन और इक्वल टू एटी फाइव इफ यू डोट ट्रस्ट मी यू कैन कैलकुलेट इट एंड यू कैन फाइंड इट आउट द नेक्स्ट नंबर इज सिक्सटी एट हंड्रेड एंड एटी सिक्स इवन दो वी हैव ए हंड्रेड विच इज अ वेरी हाई स्कोर वी ऑल्सो हैव ए सिक्सटी एट विच इज अ वेरी लो स्कोर वैन यू आर कंपेयरिंग इट टू एटी फाइव सो इट इज इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर एस टू कैलकुलेट दिस नंबर एक्यूरेटली सो दिस विल बी जीरो पॉइंट फोर एंड सिक्सटी एट माइनस एटी फाइव इज इन टू माइनस सेवेंटीन प्लस हंड्रेड विल बी जीरो पॉइंट थ्री इंटू फिफ्टीन प्लस एटी सिक्स इज जीरो पॉइंट थ्री इंटू वन दिस इज इक्वल टू माइनस सिक्स पॉइंट एट प्लस फोर पॉइंट फाइव प्लस जीरो पॉइंट थ्री सो दिस इज लेस देन जीरो नेक्स्ट इज सेवेंटीन नाइन्टी टू एंड हंड्रेड अगेन हंड्रेड इज अ गुड स्कोर बट सेवेंटी इज अ वेरी पोअर स्कोर एंड नाइन्टी टू इज ऑल्सो गुड स्कोर सो वी आर नॉट सो श्योर सो लेट इज कैलकुलेटेड दिस विल बी जीरो पॉइंट फोर इंटू वॉट इज सेवेंटी माइनस फिफ्टीन बिकॉज सेवेंटी माइनस एटी फाइव इज माइनस फिफ्टीन प्लस जीरो पॉइंट थ्री इंटू नाइन्टी टू इज सेवन प्लस हंड्रेड इज जीरो पॉइंट थ्री इंटू हंड्रेड माइनस एटी फाइव विल बी फिफ्टीन द रीजन वी आर कैलकुलेटिंग दिस विद रिस्पेक्ट टू एटी फाइव बिकॉज वी जस्ट वॉन्ट टू फिगर आउट वेदर ईच ऑफ दिस वेटेड एवरेज इज ग्रेटर दैन और इक्वल टू एटी फाइव सो इंस्टेड ऑफ कैलकुलेटिंग द वेटेड एवरेज विद द एक्चुअल नंबर्स वेर विल गेट द एक्चुअल फिटनेस इंडेक्स विल सप्रैक्ट ईच वन ऑफ दम फ्रॉम एटी फाइव एंड विल जस्ट कैलकुलेट द रिजल्ट एंड डिफरेंस If the resultant difference is greater than or equal to zero, the fitness index will be greater than or equal to eighty-five. In this particular case, this is minus six plus two point one plus four point five. So this is six point six minus six. So this is greater than zero. The last one is seventeen, ninety-three, and ninety-five. So zero point four into minus fifteen plus zero point three into eight plus zero point three into ten. This is two point four. This is three, and this is minus six. So the overall number is minus six plus five point four, which is less than zero. So the number of players whose fitness index is greater than or equal to eighty five will be one, two, three, four, five, and six. Let us look at the next question. If all the nineteen players were ranked on the basis of their fitness index, the one with the highest fitness index is given one, and the one with the lowest fitness index is given. 19 who is ranked 13 so we have 11 players who are in the indian cricket team and we are given uh, eight players who are uh, in the ipl but not in the indian cricket team we will make use of the information that we have calculated earlier in the earlier uh, out of the first 11 uh, players in the indian cricket team we know that six are greater than 85 and five are less than 85 we are looking for rank number 13 So we look at who are the players in the remaining eight players in IPL who also have greater than 85. Then at least we have a good sense of the number of players who are above 85 and below 85. Then we will figure out uh, the number 13 quite easily. Because if say we have only five players in uh, the IPL team who have greater than 85, then we have to figure out. Uh, we know that six plus five, that is 11 players overall out of the 19 players have their fitness index to be greater than or equal to 85. using this kind of information that we have already calculated is always useful in arriving at the answer fast so if you are looking at uh, 
uh, the players in the IPL team who have a fitness index of greater than or equal to 85. You have uh, 85, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. So, you have 7 players in the IPL team whose fitness index is greater than or equal to 85. So, you know that there are a total of 13 players out of the 19 whose fitness index is greater than or equal to 85. So, who is the 13th player? The 13th player is the player who amongst these uh, 13 players has the least fitness index. And that has to definitely be P whose fitness index is exactly equal to 85. Remember that in the 6 players that we have calculated earlier, all of their fitness index was greater than 85. And amongst the remaining players in these 8 players, there are 6 players whose fitness index is greater than 85. And there is only one player P whose fitness index is equal to 85. So, the rank 13 has to belong to P. Let us look at the next question. So, before we go to the next question, if say you are asked who has the 12th highest fitness index, then we know that uh, there are 6 guys in the Indian cricket team and say 6 guys in the IPL team whose fitness index is strictly greater than 85. Now, amongst these 12 players, we will have to look at the person who has the least fitness index. We can ignore the rest. Anyway, in this particular question, because we are looking for the 13th uh, player, that answer will be P whose fitness index is 85. Let us go to the next question. This seems like a big question, but essentially the gist is that uh, now selections are being made for the Indian cricket team. So, all the players, the 11 players in the Indian cricket team were arranged according to their fitness index and there was a criteria that was put up. The criteria is that the person who is being selected, either his batting average has to be in the top 6 batting average or the number of wickets he has taken has to be in the top 3 or the number of catches and runouts that he has impacted should be the highest. If any cricketer is uh, who is part of the Indian cricket team is uh, matching any one of these three criteria. If he is satisfying any one of these three criteria, then he is selected to the Indian cricket team. Similarly, for the IPL guys, the eight guys also, there are two criteria. If a person is amongst the top four scorers, run scorers from P2W, that is amongst the eight IPL guys, or the number of wickets taken is in the top three, then even that person is selected to the uh, Indian cricket uh, team squad. Now, what we are required to find out is how many of these players have satisfied any one of these criteria. If you are looking at the Indian cricket team, who are the guys who are the top 6 run scorers? These guys will definitely make it to the Indian cricket team. They will be uh, batting average if you are looking at uh, the Indian cricket team, it is not the total run scored, we are looking at the batting average. So, the top 6 will be 1, 2, 3, 4. 5 and 6. All of these guys, the batting average is very clearly less than uh, the top 6. You can arrange them in descending order, but it is not really needed. We are just looking for the top 6. So, they will be A, B, C, D, E and F. Note that D has the highest uh, average, but again, we are not looking for who has the highest average. We are looking for the top 6 highest averages. So, these guys will definitely qualify to the Indian cricket team on the basis of their batting performance. Now, if you are looking at the bowling performance, who have the top 3 wickets? The top 3 wickets will be the bottom 3 guys. They will be I, J and K. And who is going to be selected on the basis of, uh, on the basis of his fielding? Who has the highest number of catches and runouts? The highest number of catches and runouts is this guy who is F. But F is already selected. So, he has qualified 2 criteria but that does not matter. He is anyway selected to the Indian cricket team. So, that will be equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So, 9 people who are part of the Indian cricket team will now make it to the squad. We will do the same thing for even the IPL guys. If you are looking at IPL, who are the top 4 scorers? The top 4 scorers will be 800 will be 1, this is 2, this is 3 and this is 4. They will be P, Q, R and S in some order. We are not concerned about the order as of now. We just know that 4 of these guys will make it to the squad on the basis of their batting uh, performance, the total run scored. If you are looking at the highest wickets taken, the top 3 will again be the bottom 3. They will be U, V and W. So, the total number of players who make it to the Indian cricket squad based on their IPL performance is 7. Or the overall people who make it to the Indian cricket team will be 9 plus 7 Indian cricket squad which is 16. Let us look at the next question. Again, the information given is the same, but now we are required to calculate the jersey number of P. If you are looking at the jersey number of P, the people from the Indian cricket team are first given the top uh, jerseys. 
there are nine people who qualified to the Indian cricket team. So they will get the first nine numbers. The IPL guys of which P is a part will get the jersey numbers from 10 to 16. And the sorting order is the fitness index. Let us first find out all the people who qualify to the Indian cricket squad based on their IPL performance. These are the seven guys as we have discussed earlier. We are looking for the jersey number of P. What is the fitness index of P? It is 85. Now we will just try to find out how many of these guys have their fitness index which is greater than 85. What is the fitness index of Q? It is 87.5. So he has a better fitness index. What is the fitness index for R? 89. This also is greater than 85. For S it is 81. So this is lesser. For U it is 87.3. So again higher. V it is 89.9. W is 90.5. So, so out of the 7 guys of which P is a member. So amongst the remaining 6 guys. 5 of them have better fitness index. So they will get the jersey number from 10, 11, 12, 13 and 14. And the jersey number of uh, P will be the one which follows 14 which is equal to 15. And the jersey number 16 will belong to S. Anyway, we are looking for the jersey number of P. So that will equal 15. We at Kraku provide all the previous year CAT papers along with many other MBA examinations such as IIFT, ZAT, SNAP, MAT, CMAT, test and PGDBA in the actual exam format. You can attempt them as a test and get a detailed analysis of your performance or download them as PDFs. In this question, the marks scored by four students, Aman, Bala, Chandran and Dinesh is given. And in all the four subjects, Maths, Physics, Chemistry, English is given. Some more clues are given about each one of them. For example, it is mentioned that all the scores by each of the four students are unique natural numbers. So each of the scores is a unique natural number and it is also mentioned that all the numbers lie between 21 and 45. Some more information is given like the scores in uh, chemistry are in arithmetic progression where the common difference is an odd natural number. It is also told that Dinesh scored all the scores by Dinesh are odd natural numbers and that his score in physics is greater than his score in English. We are also told that all the marks scored by each one of them in uh, English are prime. These are all prime numbers. These are in arithmetic progression. And the scores by all the students in mathematics are multiples of 5. So all of them are 5x of some natural number x. We are essentially asked to figure out uh, that is all the scores by each of the four students in each of these four subjects. So before we go further, let us first draw a table so that uh, we can calculate it better. This is A, this is B, this is C, this is D and this is their total. This is their uh, score in maths, this will be their score in physics, this will be their score in chemistry, this will be their score in English and this will be their total. So some of the information is already given. For example, we know that in chemistry Bala scored 25. And in physics, Chandan scored 26. And the total in physics is 114. And the total of Aman is 96. And the total of Dinesh is 160. This is basically the information that is already given in the table. And we have uh, briefly looked at the clues that are given. Now looking at the other clues, we will have to figure out how much each one of them has scored in each of the four subjects. So to start off, one of the things that we can uh, look at is we are told that the scores by each one of them in chemistry are in arithmetic progression and that the common difference is in odd number. So the common difference can be either 1 or 3. Why should be either 1 or 3? Why can't it be more than 3? Because the next odd number will be 5 and as we know that the second score is 25. This would imply that the scores are 20, 25, 30 and 35. But we know that the minimum possible number is 21. The minimum possible score is 21. It can't be less than 21. So the odd difference cannot be 5. Can it be 21? If it is 21, there are two possibilities. The two possibilities are that the scores are either 24, 25, 26 and 27 or they are 26, 25, 24 and 23. So they can be either increasing or decreasing. In either of the cases, 26 will be a score that somebody scored in chemistry. This is again not possible because 26 is a score that somebody scored in physics. So the odd difference cannot be even 1. So the odd difference has to be 3. Now this would imply that the scores 
have to be either 22, 25, 28 and 31 or they will have to be 28, 25, 22 and 19. If they are increasing, this the first one will be the case. If they are decreasing, it will be the second case. Again, because somebody has scored 19, which is not possible because the minimum score is 21, that is not possible. So the only way in which is all the conditions will be met is if the scores are 22, 25, 28 and 31. Now we can actually remove, we have used all the information that has been given in the second uh, statement. So just to help us solve better, just to see if we are missing out on any of the small clues that are there, we'll put a cross mark over here. What this basically tells us is that there is nothing else that can be inferred by just looking at this one statement and try to figure out what are the information we can figure out by looking at the other statements. One of the things that you have to look at is if you're looking at uh, the table and once you're told that the marks lie between 21 and 45, you know that somebody who has scored 160 in four subjects has done very well. It would imply that his average score is 40. So now you should try to see if uh, you can figure out what those numbers are. Why will you be able to figure out what those numbers are? Because uh, if somebody has scored 160 and the maximum possible score is 45, it would imply and all of these are unique. It would imply that uh, he must have scored much higher in all of the four subjects, especially given that one of them is 31. This would mean that the remaining three he has scored 129. This is 160 minus 31. Now 129 using three subjects and if you look at uh, Dinesh, we are told that all the marks that Dinesh has obtained are odd numbers. So if he has scored 129 and in three subjects, 129 by 3 is 43. So in the three subjects, he has averaged 43. Especially considering that 45 is the highest possible score, this seems pretty high. Now the only way, we also know that Dinesh has scored, all the marks that Dinesh has scored are odd numbers. Now the only way this is possible is if the three numbers are 41, 43 and 45. Because if the smallest number is less than 41, this will not happen because the three highest odd numbers that are there, which are less than 45 are 41, 43 and 45. And if he scores all the three as the highest possible uh, values, only then will he score 129. If any one of them is less than uh, any of the three numbers that are given, here then his total will not be 129 and hence his total in all the four subjects will not be 160. Now once you know that he has scored 41, 43 and 45, how will you figure out how much he has scored in each one of them? Here you should uh, remember that the marks scored by each of the students in mathematics is a multiple of 5. So his score in mathematics, Dinesh's score in mathematics has to be 45 and amongst 43 and 41, there is also a clue that uh, his score in physics is greater than his score in English. So in physics he is scoring 43 and in English he has scored 41. Now again you should keep uh, remembering all the information that is given to us. For example the information that is given to us is that all the scores in maths are multiples of 5. All the scores in chemistry we have already figured out are in arithmetic progression and all the scores in English are prime numbers. These are informations that you should always keep at the back of your mind and again try to see if you can use any of the information that is given. Now, for example, if you are told that the marks uh, scored by each one of the students is uh, in English are prime numbers, let us first write down all the prime numbers that are there between 21 and 45. Let us remove the numbers that we have already calculated. So the numbers are 21, sorry, the prime numbers are 23, 29, 31, 37, 41 and 43. These are the prime numbers between 21 and 45. We are told that all the scores in English are prime numbers. Of this, 43 is already used, 31 is already used, 41 is already used in English itself. So the remaining three are 23, 29 and 37. Now 23, 29 and 37 are the scores in English. These are the only three prime numbers remaining and we know that all the scores in English are prime numbers. So we don't know which one has scored what, but we know that all the scores in English are 23, 29 and 37. They will be distributed in the below 3 uh, cells. Now let us again go through and try to see if we have forgotten any of the information that is given. The marks obtained by each of the students is a unique number. Now chemistry we have already completely used. The marks obtained by Dinesh are odd numbers and physics he has scored more than in English. 
This we have completely used off because we have figured out how much uh, Dinesh has scored in each of the four subjects. So we can put a cross. There is nothing we can extract more from it. Now all the scores obtained by the students are uh, lie between 20 and 45. That is fine. All the marks obtained by English are prime numbers. We have obtained some information from this, but we are not able to identify what are the individual scores. Now if you look at the last one, the marks obtained by each student in mathematics is a multiple of 5. This we have used very little. So again, let us try to see if we can use some more. The prime, the multiples of 5 that are there between 21 and 45 are 25, 30, 35, 40 and 45. Of which we have already used 45. This is the score of the nation maths. 25 is the score that uh, uh, B has obtained in chemistry. So the only three remaining are 30, 35 and 40. And the remaining cells in maths are again three. So this would imply that in maths, the scores are 30, 35 and 40. Again, we don't know who has scored 35. We don't know who has scored 30, who has scored 40. But we know that these three numbers go here. Now this is the information that we know. Now let us see if we can try to get some more information from it. One of the other things that you should look at earlier like for example we figured out that somebody has scored 160 so has done very well in all the four subjects. Similarly if you are looking at the score of Aman his total is 96 across four subjects he scored 96 that is his average is 24 which seems to be slightly on the lower side because if you know that the lowest possible mark is 21 and his average is 24 across four subjects. This would imply that there is there is a lot of constraint on the possible values of Aman. So let us try to see if we can figure out more about him. We know one of the score that he got is 22. So in the other remaining three, his total is 96 minus 22. So that is equal to 74. So in the three subjects, he has scored 74, of which we know that he has scored either 30 or 35 or 40 in maths and 23, 29 or 37 in English. Now, if you Figure out the minimum possible score of Aman in maths that is 30 and the minimum possible score of uh, Aman in English that is 23. In this 2 itself his score is 53. So that would imply that in the score of Aman in maths plus English will be definitely greater than 53 because uh, the least possible values of Aman are 30 and 23. So this would imply that his score in physics will be definitely less than or equal to 21 because his overall score in the three subjects is 74. So if he is scoring at least 53, his score in physics, which is the only remaining subject, has to be less than 21, which is the difference between these two. But we know that none of them has scored below 21. So this would be possible only if Aman has scored the least possible value, that is 30 in maths, the least possible value in English, which is 23. And in this particular case, in physics also he is scoring the least possible value, which is 21. Only in this case will his score be 96. In any other case, his score will be greater than 96, which is not allowed. So now, because we know the score of uh, three of the people in physics, we can easily identify the fourth score by just subtracting it from 114. So if you calculate the uh, score, 26 plus 43 is 69. 69 plus 21 is 90. So the score of B in physics is 24. So this is the information that we are able to figure out. We know that uh, B has scored either 35 or 40 in maths and the remaining was scored by C. So if uh, B has scored 35 in maths, A has scored 40 and vice versa. Similarly in English, we know that the two possible scores are 29 or 37 and the remaining number between 29 and 37 is scored by C. This is basically the information that we are able to figure out. We have come very close but we are not able to identify exactly what is the score by each one of them in uh, all the four subjects. Now let us try to go and try to answer the questions. The maximum possible score of the total marks scored by Bala in subjects maths and English is. In maths we know that Bala has scored either 35 or 40. This is in maths. And in English we know that he has scored either 29 or 37. So for the maximum possible value we will take 40 and 37. So, his maximum possible value will be 77. What is the difference in the total marks obtained by A, B and C in maths? So, maths we need to figure out the total of A, B and C and the total marks obtained by them in physics. So, again in physics we will have to figure out the total of A, B and C. In maths we know that the three scores obtained by A, B and C are 30, 35 and 40. Again notice that we know that A has scored 30 in maths. We don't know 
whether B has code 35 or 40, but we know that one of B has code 35, one of B and C, and the other one has code 40. So the sum of the three marks will remain 30 plus 35 plus 40, which will equal 105. Similarly, in physics, we know there are three scores. So the three scores in physics will be 21. The sum will be 21 plus 24 plus 26. This will be 50 plus 21. This is equal to 71. So the difference will be 34. What is the sum of the total marks obtained by the four students in English? We need to calculate the total over here. This is quite easy. This will be 23 plus 29 plus 37 plus 41. Again, like in the first question, notice that we don't know who has scored 29 and who has scored 37. But we know that those two are 29 and 37. So their sum will remain constant. So in this case, if you are calculating the sum, 23 plus 29 is 52. 52 plus 37 is 89. 89 plus 41 is 130. So the answer will be 130. What is the minimum aggregate percentage that Chandan could have obtained in the subjects? So the scores of Chandan, if you are looking, we are trying to minimize the scores of Chandan. So in order to minimize the scores of Chandan, he would score 35 in maths out of 35 and 40. And 26 in physics, this is already known. 28 in chemistry, this is already, already known. And in English, between 29 and 37, because we are looking for the minimum possible value, we will score 29. So Chandan's total in the four subjects will be 35 plus 26 is 61, 61 plus 57, the sum of these two will equal 118. Remember that in each of the four subjects, the maximum possible marks are 50. So in the four subjects, the total will be 200. This will be his aggregate score. And if you want to calculate the percentage, we will sub, uh, multiply it with 100. So that will be 118 by 2. So that is 59%. This is the minimum possible percentage that Chandan could have scored. Google search Kraku Cat Formulas PDF. Click on the first link. You will get a list of topics for Cat. Click on one of the topics. Download the PDF to get a list of formulas for the topic. In this question, we are given the data about the different vehicles which are owned by people across five cities. The five vehicles are private jet, the four vehicles are private jet, four wheeler, bike and scooter and the total number of people who live in each of the city is also given to us in this particular table. Before we look at this particular question, let us first quickly try to revise the concept of maximum and minima. So to do that, let us look at a specific question. Let us assume that there is a city and the number of people in the city is say yes and each person in the city reads at least one newspaper amongst four newspapers. Let us assume that the four newspapers are one. 2, 3 and 4. The number of people who read the first newspaper is say X. The number of people who read the second newspaper is say Y. The number of people who read the third newspaper is say Z. And the number of people who read the fourth newspaper is say W. Let us also try to understand that A number of people read exactly one newspaper. B people read exactly two newspapers. C people read exactly 3 newspapers and D people read exactly 4 newspapers. Now what is the sum of A plus B plus C plus D? The sum of A plus B plus C plus D is equal to the total number of people who are living in that city which is equal to S. And what is the total number of newspapers read by each of these uh, people? These A guys read exactly one newspaper each. So the total number of newspapers read by them is A. These B people read two newspapers each. So the total number of newspapers read by them is 2B. Similarly, the C people read three newspapers each. So the total number of newspapers read by them will be 3C. And these D guys read all the four newspapers. So the number of newspapers read by them will be 4D. So A plus 2B plus 3C plus 4D is equal to X plus Y plus Z plus W which is the total number of newspapers read in that particular city. If you assume that x plus y plus z plus w is another variable which is equal to t, just for the sake of explanation, and if you subtract the first equation from the second equation, b plus 2c plus 3d is equal to t minus s. So now if you are asked to maximize the value of d, you first calculate 
the value of t minus s and then you try to minimize b and c because if you minimize b and c then you are going to get the maximum value of d you can also try to make b to be equal to 0 and c to be equal to 0 in most cases this will work but in some cases this won't work that is you can't make b and c both of them to be at the same time equal to 0 we'll look at that particular case later but if you are trying to maximize d you should try to minimize b and c and if possible make b and c to be equal to 0 if you are asked to make maximize a if you are trying to maximize a then look at b plus c plus d you would want to minimize b plus c plus d because a plus b plus c plus d is a constant which is equal to s so if you have to maximize a that is the number of people who read exactly one newspaper you will try to minimize b plus c plus d and if you are trying to minimize the sum of b plus c plus d you also have to take care of the equation b plus 2c plus 3d is equal to t minus s so you can't just make b c and d to be equal to 0 because this equation will not be satisfied so how are you going to minimize b plus c plus d in order to minimize b plus c plus d first maximize d once you maximize d and if you are uh, satisfying and if you are able to get b and c to be equal to 0 then you are done but if that is not possible then maximize c and also at the end you will be getting a value for b because once you maximize d and once you maximize c you have the equation b is equal to t minus s which can be calculated you have the value of c and d then you will get the value of b then use b c max and d max in the first equation that is a plus b plus c plus d is equal to s to actually find out the value of a and that will be the maximum possible value of a now let us first write this down somewhere else so that uh, we also quickly revise it so if you are trying to maximize d that is the maximum possible value of d you will try to minimize b and c if you are trying to maximize a that is the number of people who read exactly one newspaper or in this particular question if you are trying to maximize the number of people who uh, drive just one vehicle then you first maximize d then you maximize c and once you find out the value of d max and c max you will be able to figure out the value of b because you have the equation b plus 2c plus 3d is equal to t minus s and from that you will calculate the value of b c and d and you substitute it in the first equation of a plus b plus c plus d is equal to s to calculate the value of a which will be the maximum value of a now let us try to understand why if you are trying to maximize d you can't always make b and c to be equal to zero because that will also depend on the distribution of the number of people who are reading the particular newspapers for example if you are looking at a distribution where there is only one person who is reading a particular newspaper and there are 100 people who are reading the second newspaper say there are 200 people who are reading the third newspaper and uh, say there are 300 people who are reading the fourth newspaper and the total number of people who are living in that particular city is say 350 and every person is reading at least one newspaper in this particular case when we are looking at the explanations x is equal to 1 y is equal to 100 z is equal to 200 w is equal to 300 and s is equal to 350 what is the value of t which is equal to x plus y plus z plus w that will equal 1 plus 100 plus 200 plus 300 which is equal to 601 so what is the value of t minus s which is equal to b plus 2c plus 3d this is what we have derived earlier b plus 2c plus 3d will equal 601 minus 350 which is equal to 250 now if you are making b and c to be very small 3d will be equal to 251 but 251 is not a multiple of 3 the smallest uh, number or the greatest number which is less than or equal to 251 which is a multiple of 3 is 249 so you will make d to be equal to 249 by 3 which is 83 now you have b plus 2c to be equal to 2 again you are trying to minimize b and c so you will make c to be equal to 1 and the equation is solved so you can say okay i am making d to be equal to 83 c is equal to 1 and b is equal to 0 the problem with this is that there is only one person who is reading a particular newspaper so the number of people who read all the four newspapers has to be less than or equal to one you can't find 83 people who are reading all the four newspapers because as we have discussed the distribution is such that only one person is reading a particular newspaper so the number of people who are reading all the four newspapers has to be less than or equal to one 
So d max will be less than or equal to the smallest number. If you have uh, four numbers, the number of people who are reading all the four newspapers or the number of people who are reading all the four vehicles has to be definitely less than or equal to the smallest possible number amongst the four numbers. Similarly, an extension of the same, we can derive it, but for the sake of this examination, it is not needed. C max plus 2 times D max, that is, in this particular question, the number of people who are riding 3 vehicles plus 2 times the number of people who are riding 4 vehicles is always less than or equal to smallest number plus second smallest number. Once you remember these formulas and once you understand how these formulas have uh, been arrived at, answering maximum and minimum questions is not very difficult. You should always first uh, calculate the value of A plus B plus C plus D which is mostly given to us. In this particular question, the number of people who are living in all the four cities is given to us. And you should also calculate the value of A plus 2B plus 3C plus 4D which is the sum of uh, all the four vehicles, the number of people who are riding all the four vehicles. Let us try to calculate that and keep it so that uh, we can answer the questions quite fast. So for each of the five cities, let us calculate the value of A plus B plus C plus D and put it down. The number of rows will be 5 and the number of columns will be say 3 and suppose it looks like this. This is let us look at all the five cities, Hyderabad, Bengaluru, Chennai. This is Hyde. This is Bengaluru. This is Chennai. Then you have Vijayawada and Vishakhapatnam. And Vishakhapatnam. For each of them, what is the value of uh, A plus B plus C plus D? The value of A plus B plus C plus D is already known to us. This is given to us. This is the number of people who are living in that city. Again, A is the number of people who are riding exactly one vehicle. B is the number of people who are riding two vehicles. C is the number of people who are riding uh, three vehicles. And D is the number of people who are riding all the four vehicles. The sum will equal the total number of people in each of the cities. That is 897, 986. 897, 986. 1034, 564. 1034, 564 and 1067. And what is the value of A plus 2B plus 3C plus 4D? This is the total number of vehicles which are owned in the city. This will be equal to 61 in case of, uh, let us clear this so that we can easily calculate it. 61 in case of Hyderabad, 61, 131. 707 and x. 61 plus 131 is 192. 192 plus 707 is equal to 899 plus x. So this is equal to 899 plus x. So the value of b plus 2c plus 3d which is the difference between the first column and the second column will be equal to x plus 2. If you are looking at Bengaluru, it is 57 plus 237 plus 971 plus y. 57 plus 237 is equal to 294. 294 plus 971 will equal 5, 6, 2, 1. 1, 2, 6, 5 plus y. So this is equal to 1, 2, 6, 5 plus y. So the difference between these two will be equal to 1265 plus y minus 986 which is equal to 279 plus y. Similarly in case of Chennai, the sum will be equal to 24 plus 567 plus 1032. 24 plus 567 will equal 591. 1032 plus 591 will be equal to 1623. 1623 plus Z. So the difference will be equal to 1623 plus Z minus 1034. This is equal to 9, this is 8 and this is 5. 
So this is equal to 589 plus Z. If you are looking at Vijayawada, the sum will be 45 plus 432 which is equal to 477. So this is 477 plus P plus Q. So the value of B plus 2C plus 3D will be equal to 477 plus P plus Q minus 564. In this particular case 564 is actually greater than 477. So what is 564 minus 477? This is equal to 7 and this will become 5. So this is 87. So this is actually P plus Q minus 87. If you are looking at uh, VSKP that is Vishakapatnam, the sum will be 960 plus 342 which is equal to 2, 0, 1, 12, 1, 3, 0, 2. So this is equal to 1, 3, 0, 2 plus R plus S. So the value of B plus 2C plus 3D which is the difference between the first column and the second column will be equal to 1302 minus 1067. This will be equal to 5 that will become 9 so this is 3 and this is 2. So this is equal to 235 plus R plus S. In the examination you will have a calculator so even if you are not able to calculate these things fast that is okay. So now let us go ahead and answer the questions that follow. It is known that all the people in Hyderabad own at least one vehicle. So we are looking only at the first row which is at Hyderabad. Each person either owns uh, one or all the four vehicles. In our uh, initial explanation we assumed that A is the number of people who own exactly one vehicle, B is the number of people who own exactly two vehicles, C is the number of people who own exactly three vehicles and D is the number of people who own all the four vehicles. Using that for Hyderabad we calculated that a plus B plus C plus D is 897 which is the total number of people who are living there. A plus 2B plus 3C plus 4D is equal to 899 plus X. So we got B plus 2C plus 3D is equal to X plus 2. We don't know the value of X but we know that this is equal to X plus 2. Here we are told that each person either owns only one vehicle or all the four vehicles. That is the value of B and C is equal to 0. There is no person who is owning exactly two vehicles or owning exactly three vehicles. This would imply that the value of 3D is equal to X plus 2. Or X plus 2 has to be a multiple of 3. Amongst the given options, 23 plus 2 is 25 which is not a multiple of 3. So this is not the correct answer. 64 plus 2 is 66. So this is possibly the correct answer. 184 plus 2 is 186. This also is possibly the correct answer. 120 plus 2 is 122 which is not a multiple of 3. So this is not the correct answer. Amongst 64 and uh, 184, if the value of X is 64, the value of D, which is the number of people who own all the four vehicles is equal to 22. If the value of X is 184, X plus 2 will be 186. So the value of D will be equal to 186 divided by 3, which is equal to 62. Now remember what we have said, the maximum value of D will be the smallest number amongst the four numbers. Now we know that the number of people who are owning a private jet is only 61. So D cannot be equal to 62 because D has to be less than or equal to 61. So the only possible value for X is 64 in which case the value of D which is the number of people who own all the four vehicles will equal 22. Now let us look at the next question. What is the absolute difference between the highest possible value and the lowest possible value of X plus Y plus Z plus P plus Q plus R plus S? Assume that all the people have at least one vehicle and all the unknown variables are necessarily natural numbers. Let us first try to understand what is the smallest possible value of X plus Y plus Z plus P plus Q plus R plus S. The smallest possible value of X because it has to be a natural number is equal to 1. The smallest possible value of Y is also equal to 1. The smallest possible value of Z is also equal to 1. Can the smallest possible value of P and Q also be equal to 1? This is not possible because if you remember, we have calculated the value of B plus 2C plus 3D and P plus Q minus 87 is equal to B plus 2C plus 3D. B is the number of people who own exactly two vehicles. C is the number of people who own exactly three vehicles and D is the number of people who own exactly four vehicles. All of these are non-negative. So B plus 2C plus 3D has to be non-negative. 
it has to be either greater than or equal to 0. It has to be either 0 or greater than 0. So, the minimum value of p plus q is equal to 87. We do not know the distribution of p and q, but we know that their sum has to definitely be greater than or equal to 87. Next, if you are looking at r and s, there is no such restriction on any of the other variables. Because if you see, if you put the other variables to be equal to 1, in all other cities, b plus 2c plus 3d is greater than or equal to 0. The only restriction comes in case of Vijayawada, where p plus q has to be greater than or equal to 87. Anyway, the minimum possible value of r is again equal to 1 and the minimum possible value of s is also equal to 1. So, the minimum possible value of x plus y plus z plus p plus q plus r plus s, this is going to equal 1 plus 1 plus 1, so 87 plus 5 which is 92. Now, if you are trying to maximum possible value of x, y, z, p, q, r and s, the maximum possible value of x which is the number of people who own a scooter in Hyderabad is equal to 897. We can assume that everybody who is living in uh, Hyderabad owns a scooter. There is nothing which is stopping us from doing it. So, the value of x maximum is 897. Similarly, the maximum possible value of y is equal to 986. The maximum possible value of uh, z is 1034. We are essentially assuming that everybody who is living in that particular city owns this particular type of vehicle and there is no restriction on that. Similarly, p will be 564. Q will be 564, R and S will be 1067. So, what is the maximum possible sum of X plus Y plus Z plus P plus Q plus R plus S? Again, you can use your calculator to calculate it or if you are trying to calculate it manually, 6 plus 4 is 10, 10 plus 8 is 18, 18 plus 14 is 32, 32 plus 7 is 39. So, this is 9 and this is 3. 9 plus 8 is 17 plus 3 is 20. 29. 29 plus 18 will be 47. So, this is 7 and this is 4. This is 8, uh, 12. 12 plus 9 is 21. 21 plus 10. 21 plus 10 is 31. 31 plus 10 is 41. 41 plus 20 is 61. So, the maximum possible value is 6179, the minimum possible value is 92. So, the difference will be 6179 minus 92, which is equal to 7806. So, the difference will be 6087. Let us look at the next question. If the total number of bikes in all the five cities combined is 2816. We are told that the number of bikes in all the 5 cities, that is the sum of all the numbers in the bike column is 2816. This will help us in calculating the value of z. Because we know the number of bikes in the remaining 4 cities. So, if you sum up the number of bikes in the 4 cities and subtract it from 2816, you will get the value of z. Let us try to do that now. The bikes in the remaining cities are 707, 971, 432 and 342. If you are summing this up, this will be 7 plus 5 which is equal to 12, you have a 1 here, this is 10, 15, so 5 and again a 1, this is 16, 17, 20, 24, 2, 4, 5, 2. This is the number of bikes in the remaining 4 cities combined, so the value of z will be equal to 2816 minus 2, 4, 5, 2. This is equal to 4, 1, this is 6, 8 minus uh, 4 minus 1 is 3. So, the value of z is 364. So, the number of uh, vehicles in Chennai, if you are uh, writing them now, down, will be 24, 567, z is 364 and 1032. And the total number of people is 1034. What we are required to calculate is the maximum possible number of people in Chennai who own at least 3 vehicles. Again, coming back to what we have discussed earlier. We are assuming that A is the number of people who own exactly one bike, B is the number of people who own exactly two bikes, C is the number of people who own exactly three bikes and D is the number of people who own exactly four bikes. So, now we are looking to calculate the maximum possible value of C plus D. This is what we are trying to calculate. So, what we will do is again quite simple. Remember what we have done earlier, we will first calculate the value of B plus 2C plus 3D and try to maximize the value of C plus D. 
what is the value of b plus 2c plus 3d that is equal to 589 plus z so the value of b plus 2c plus 3d is equal to 589 plus z which is equal to 589 plus 364 this is going to equal 3 8 plus 6 is 4 so 5 9 so this is equal to 953 so the value of b plus 2c plus 3d is equal to 953 we are looking to maximize the value of c plus d so you can write b plus 2c plus 3d as b plus 2 times c plus d plus d or this is equal to b plus d plus 2 times c plus d this is equal to 953 so now if you are trying to calculate the value of c plus d we are trying to maximize c plus d so we will minimize b and d so let us assume that b and d are 0 so 2 times c plus d will be 953 but that is an odd number so let us assume that one of these say d is equal to 1 and so the value of c plus d will be equal to 952 divided by 2 which is equal to 476 so we are saying d is equal to 1 c plus d is equal to 476 or essentially the value of c is equal to 475 because that is 476 minus d now can c be equal to 475 and d be equal to 1 again we have to go back and check whatever we have uh, learnt the value of c plus d has to be c plus 2d has to definitely be less than the smallest number plus the second smallest number in this particular case c plus 2d the smallest number is 24 and the second smallest number is 364 so in all the cases c plus 2d has to be less than or equal to 24 plus 364 which is 388 using the equations we found the value of c to be 475 and d to be equal to 1 or there will be some small changes we can also assume that d is equal to 0 here and b is equal to 1 but irrespective of it the value of c is quite high the value of c is close to 475 so the value of c plus 2d will not be less than or equal to 388 so now the restriction or the bottleneck is the equation that we have the inequality we have to ensure that both of them are always satisfied that is b plus 2c plus 3d has to equal 953 and this inequality that c plus 2d is less than or equal to the smallest number plus the second smallest number so the bottleneck over here is this inequality so now if you are trying to maximize the value of c plus d you can express c plus 2d as c plus d plus d so if you are trying to maximize this you have to minimize d and the minimum value of d is equal to 0 so the maximum value of c plus d will equal 388 in this particular case because we assume d is equal to 0 the value of c will be equal to 388 and if you know the value of c to be 388 and d to be equal to 0 you can substitute that in the equation b plus 2c plus 3d to calculate the value of b and once you calculate the value of b c and d you can calculate the value of a because we know that a plus b plus c plus d is 1623 plus z so essentially once you calculate the value of d and c you can calculate the value of b and a anyway for this particular question we are asked to maximize the value of c plus d so the maximum value of c plus d will equal 388 let us look at the next question In Bengaluru, the number of people who own zero vehicles is zero. The number of people who, who own two vehicles is 163. So the value of B is equal to 163. The number of people who own three vehicles is 36. So the value of C is equal to 36. And the number of people who own all the four vehicles, that is D, is greater than or equal to the number of people is actually more than. So D is strictly greater than the number of people who own all the three vehicles so that is d is greater than 36 this is the information that is given to us what is the maximum value that y can take again let us look at the equation that we have in bengaluru the value of b plus 2c plus 3d is equal to 279 plus y we know the value of b and c that is given to us so what is the value of uh, b that is 163 plus because c is 36 the value of 2c will be 72 plus 3d is equal to 279 plus y or the value of 3d is equal to 
What is 163 plus 72? This is 235. What is 279 minus 235? That will be equal to 44. So this is y plus 44. So we know that 3D is equal to y plus 44. And now we are looking to maximize the value of y. So if you are trying to maximize the value of y, you have to maximize the value of d. And what is the maximum possible value of d? The maximum possible value of d, if you are looking at the distribution of Bengaluru, is 57. That is the smallest possible number amongst the four numbers that are given. And we know that d cannot be greater than or equal to the smallest number. So d max is equal to 57. Therefore, the value of y when it is maximized is equal to 3 times that, that is 3 into 57 minus 44. 3 into 57 is 171 minus 44 is equal to 127. So, the maximum possible value of uh, y is 127 which is option A. Now, let us look at the next question. It is given that all the values of the unknowns is equal to 150. So, x is equal to y is equal to z is equal to p is equal to q is equal to r is equal to s is equal to 150 in this given table. What is the maximum number of people in all the five cities combined who own exactly four vehicles? Assume that every person in the five cities owns at least one of the vehicles. So, for each of the five cities, we are required to calculate the maximum possible value of d. For this again, having this table is quite useful. Let us calculate the maximum possible value of d using the b plus 2c plus 3d value and we will also look at the smallest number amongst the four numbers in each of the cities. Using these two equations we will find out which of them is smaller that will be the maximum possible value of the number of people who own all the four vehicles. That is if you are looking at Hyderabad for example, the value of b plus 2c plus 3d is equal to x plus 2 x is equal to 150, so this is equal to 152. So, the maximum possible value of d is equal to 152 divided by 3, that is equal to 50.66. You want it to be a natural number, so this is equal to 50. Similarly, if you are looking at Bengaluru, b plus 2c plus 3d is equal to 279 plus y. 279 plus 150 is 429. So, the value of D, D max is equal to 429 by 3 which is 143. Similarly, for Chennai, B plus 2C plus 3D is equal to 589 plus 150. 589 plus 150 will be equal to 739. So, the maximum positive value of D will be equal to 739 divided by 3 which is equal to 246. In case of Vijayawada, B plus 2C plus 3D is equal to P plus Q minus 87. P is 150, Q is 150. So, that is 300 minus 87 which is equal to 213. So, the maximum possible value of D is equal to 71. Finally, in case of Vishakhapatnam, B plus 2C plus 3D is equal to 235 plus 300. So, that is equal to 535. So, the maximum possible value of D is equal to 535 divided by 3 which will equal 178. Now, we can't just add all of these up. For each of the cities, we also have to check whether this can be a valid answer. In case of Hyderabad, the maximum possible value of D is 50 which is less than the smallest number amongst the four which is 61. So, this is valid. So, in Hyderabad, the maximum possible value of the number of people who own all the four vehicles is 50. In Bengaluru, the smallest number is 57. This is less than 143, which we got using the equation. So, now we check the two numbers, 57 and 143, because 57 is lesser. In case of Bengaluru, the answer will be 57, which is the number of people who own all the four vehicles. That is what we have discussed over here also. The maximum possible value of D, which is the number of people who are owning all the four vehicles, will be definitely less than or equal to the smallest number. Next, if you are looking at Chennai, D max from the equation we got as 246, but the smallest number over here is 24. So, again we will have to pick 24. For uh, Vijayawada, we got 71 as the value of D max, but the smallest possible number is 45. So, this will be 45. For Vishakhapatnam, using the equation we got D max as 178. The smallest possible number amongst the four numbers will be R and S, both of which actually equal 150. 
So again, because 150 is less than 178, the maximum possible number of people in uh, Vishakhapatnam who own all the four vehicles has to be equal to 150. Now, if you sum this up, 50 plus 57 is 107. 24 plus 45 is 69 plus 150. 107 plus uh, 69 is 176. 176 plus 150 is 326. So, the required answer is option D which is 326. Let us look at the next question. It is given that all the unknowns are 150. So, the situation is similar to the earlier question where x is equal to y is equal to z is equal to p is equal to q is equal to r is equal to s is equal to 150. What is the absolute difference between the maximum number of people in Hyderabad and Bengaluru combined who own exactly one vehicle that is a max. So, for both the cities, we have to calculate the maximum number of people who own exactly one vehicle. And we have to calculate the maximum number of people in Hyderabad and Bengaluru who own exactly four vehicles. So, again, we have to calculate D max. So, we have to calculate uh, the maximum number of people in Hyderabad who own exactly one vehicle. We should do the same for Bengaluru, add those two numbers up. And we should do the same thing for uh, Hyderabad and Bengaluru, but now for the number of people who own all the four vehicles. So, we should try to maximize it. And then we have to calculate the difference between this. D max we already calculated in the earlier question. D max for Hyderabad is 50, D max for Bengaluru is 57. So, this is 50 and this is 57. So, the sum is equal to 107. What we are required to calculate is the maximum number of people in Hyderabad who own exactly one vehicle and the maximum number of people in Bengaluru who own exactly one vehicle. And in order to maximize A, we should first maximize D, then we should maximize C. Using these two, we will get a value for B. Substitute the values of B, C and D in the equation A plus B plus C plus D is equal to S and calculate the value of A. That is how we should proceed. In case of uh, Hyderabad, we know that B plus 2C plus 3D is equal to X plus 2. X is 150, so this is equal to 152. And we also know that the value of D is 50, but the, the maximum value of D. So, B plus 2C will be equal to 2. Once we have maximized D, we should try to maximize C. And the maximum possible value of C will be equal to 1. And in this case, B will be equal to 0. And D is equal to 50. So, the value of B plus C plus D is equal to 51. Now, what is the value of A? We know that A plus B plus C plus D is the number of people who are living in Hyderabad, which is equal to 897. So, the value of A will be equal to 897 minus 51, which is equal to 846. Now, let us calculate the number of people who can own exactly one vehicle, maximize it in case of Bengaluru. In case of Bengaluru also, we know that B plus 2C plus 3D is equal to 279 plus Y. Y is equal to 150, so 279 plus Y is 429. In case of Bangalore also, we know that the maximum value of D is 57. So, D is equal to 57. 3D is equal to 171. So, the value of B plus 2C is equal to 429 minus 171, which is equal to this is 8, this is 258. So, we know that B plus 2C is equal to 258. Now, we should try to maximize C. In order to maximize C, can we put B to be equal to 0 and C to be equal to 129? If we put B to be equal to 0 and C to be equal to 129, C plus 2D, that is 129 plus 114 will equal 3, this is 4 and this is 2. It will equal 243 which is greater than the smallest number plus the second smallest number. You want C plus 2D to always be less than or equal to the smallest number plus the second smallest number. In case of Bengaluru, the smallest number is 57 and the second smallest number is 150. So, the sum has to be less than 57 plus 150 which is equal to 207. So, this is a contradiction. So, we can't assume that B is equal to 0. In the earlier case, if you are putting the value of C to be equal to 1 and 2D to be equal to 15 to 2 that is 100, C plus 2D will be equal to 101. That is lesser than private jet that is 61 plus 131 which is 192. So, there is no contradictions there. So, we went ahead and did that. 
In this case, we are getting a contradiction. C plus 2D cannot be greater than or equal to the smallest number plus the second smallest number. So, the value of B cannot be equal to 0. And the value of C cannot be equal to 129. D is equal to 57. C plus 2D, which is the now bottleneck equation, is equal to 207. Because the smallest number is 57 and the second smallest number is the value of Y, which is 150. So, 150 plus 57 is 207. So, the value of C will be equal to 207 minus 2 times 57, which is 114, which is equal to 93. So, C is equal to 93, D is equal to 57. We can calculate the value of B. Because we know that B plus 2C has to be equal to 258. So, B plus 186, which is 2 times 93, is equal to 258. Or the value of B is equal to 72. B is equal to 72, C is equal to 93, D is equal to 57. So, the value of B plus C plus D will be 57 plus 93 plus 72. This is 165. 165 plus 57 is 222. So, the value of B plus C plus D is 222. We know that A plus B plus C plus D is 986. So, the value of A is equal to 986 minus 222 which is equal to 764. So, A max for Bengaluru is 764. So, the sum of A in Hyderabad and Bengaluru will be 846 plus 764, which is equal to 0, 1, 6, 1. So, that is 1610. And the value of D max is 107. So, the difference between these two is 1503. This is the answer. We at Kraku provide all the previous year CAT papers along with many other MBA examinations such as IIFT, ZAT, SNAP, MAT, CMAT, TIS and PGDBA in the actual exam format. You can attempt them as a test and get a detailed analysis of your performance or download them as PDFs. In this question, we are told that a shopkeeper has 5 mobiles. A, G, S, K and I and we have been told that the cost price and the selling price of all the 5 mobiles are, bit, are amongst 4000, 5000, 6000, 6500 and 7500. We have been given some more clues about uh, the cost price and the selling price of these mobiles and we have to uniquely identify what is the cost price, what is the selling price and therefore what is the profit and profit percentage for all the 5 mobiles. So let us go ahead and look at the clues that are given. We are told that no two mobiles cost the same and no two mobiles are sold at the same price. That is the cost price and the selling price are unique for all the uh, five mobiles. We are also told that no mobile is sold at its cost price. Therefore, the cost price and selling price for all the five mobiles are different. Further additional information has been given. It is mentioned that exactly three mobiles were sold at a profit. So you have three mobiles who were sold at a profit and two mobiles who were sold at a loss because the total number of mobiles is 5. The profit percentages of two mobiles are equal. So this seems to be an important clue. Normally in these kind of uh, questions, we will first go through all the clues that are given so that we get a sense of what are looking like the important clues and then come back and try to uh, make more use out of it. So this seems to be important because you have a limited set of cost prices and selling prices. So there will be a limited uh, set of profit percentages also. So here if you are told that two of the profit percentages are equal, that seems to be an important clue which will maybe help us in identifying the cost price and selling price of mobiles. The cost price of mobile i is equal to the selling price of mobile k. So we will assume that the cost price of mobile i is a. So the selling price of mobile k is also a. The cost price of mobile k is equal to the selling price of mobile s. So if you are assuming that cost price is B, selling price of S is also B. The selling price of mobile G is same as the cost price of mobile A. So if you are assuming that this is C, selling price of G is also C. Mobile G is sold at a loss of 20%. So this is minus 20%. Two mobiles were sold for the same profit and no mobile is sold for a profit greater than 40%. This also seems to be an important clue. Because again, if two mobiles are sold for the same amount of profit, the possibilities for the profits is also limited because 
cost price and selling price have to be amongst this five value so again it is possible that we will be able to identify the profit and uh, the cost and selling price for the uh, mobiles neither the cost price nor the selling price for mobile less is 4000 so this is basically the information that is given to us now let us go back and look at the important clues that we thought existed so these are the two clues which we felt were important so if you are looking at the different profit percentages possible for the mobile whose cost price is 4000 if the cost price is 4000 the selling price can be any of the other uh, values so if the selling price is 5000 the profit percentage will be 5000 divided by 4000 minus 1 so this is 125 percent minus 1 so this is equal to 25 percent if the selling price is 6000 and cost price is 4000 the profit percentage will be 6000 by 4000 that is 150 percent minus 1 that is 50 percent which is greater than 40 percent so this would imply that for the mobile whose cost price is 4000 the selling price has to be 5000 and this would imply that the profit percentage is definitely 25 percent because if the selling price is greater than 5000 the profit percentage will be greater than 40 percent which we were told is the limit note that we don't know which mobile uh, the cost price is 4000 but we just know that if the cost price is 4000 the selling price has to be 5000 now let us look at the possibility for the mobile whose cost price is 5000 then the profit percentage possible will be 6000 by 5000 minus 1 which is equal to 20 percent or 6500 by 5000 minus 1 which is equal to 30 percent note that the selling price cannot equal 7500 because in that case the profit percentage will be 50 percent which is not allowed so if the cost price is 5000 the profit percentage can be 20 percent or 30 percent if the cost price is 6000 there are only two possibilities for the profit percentage that is 6500 by 6000 minus 1 so this is equal to 1 by 12 that is 8.33 percent or it will be 7500 by 6000 minus 1 so this is again equal to 25 percent note that we have 225 percent but there is still a possibility so let us look at even the mobile whose cost price is 6500 if the cost price is 6500 the only way in which it will make a profit is if the selling price is 7500 so this will be 7500 by 6500 minus 1 which is equal to 10 by 65 10 by 65 is not a proper easy to calculate value but it will be something like 2 by 13 which is approximately equal to 15 point dot percent uh, you can actually calculate it but the whole point of this exercise is to identify which are the two profit percentages which are equal so you can identify that there is only one pair of profit percentages which are equal that is if the profit percentage of the mobile which is sold at 4000 whose selling price is 5000 and the mobile whose cost price is 6000 its selling price has to be 7500 even in this case the profit percentage is 25 percent these are the two uh, only two uh, pairs of mobile phones whose profit percentage will be the same again we don't know which is the mobile whose cost price is 4000 and which is the mobile whose cost price is 6500 but we know that only these two have equal profit percentages now let us look at what are the remaining cost prices the remaining cost prices are 5000 6500 and 7500 we are told that three of the mobile phones have a profit and two have a loss so this is definitely a profit because it is bought at 4000 and sold at 5000 this is also a profit because it is bought at 6000 and sold at 7500 the mobile whose cost price is 7500 is definitely a loss because 7500 is the highest so if it is being sold at less than 7500 it will definitely be a loss now amongst 5000 and 6500 we have one who is a profit and one who is a loss one which is sold at a loss note that it can't be the phone the phone which is sold at which is bought at 6500 this can't be sold at 7500 because 7500 is already taken by the phone whose cost price is 6500 so for 6500 the selling price has to be less than 7500 and because cost price is not equal to selling price it can't even equal 6500 so it has to be actually sold at a loss so this will also be a loss therefore this is sold at a profit so now we know which are the three phones which are sold at a profit 
and we know which are the three phones which are sold at a loss we also know the profit uh, the selling price of two of the five mobile phones we have to identify the selling price for the remaining three mobile phones and then we can go ahead and answer the questions that follow one of the clues that is given is that for mobile G the loss percentage is 20 percent so amongst 6500 and 7500 if the loss is 20 percent what is the possible selling price the possible selling price will be 0 0.8 into 6500 and 0 0.8 into 7500 this will be the possible selling price so this will equal either 5200 or 6000 5200 is not a possible value for the selling price therefore the mobile g has to be bought at 7500 and sold at 6000 so it has a loss of 20 percent so this is equal to g this would imply that the mobile which is bought at 5000 it is sold at a profit so the only possibilities for the selling price of the mobile which was bought at 5000 is either 6000 or 6500 or 7500 only then will it be making a profit it can't be 7500 it can't be 6000 so its selling price has to be 6500 therefore the only remaining selling price for the mobile which is sold at which is bought at 6500 will be 4000 so now we have filled in the cost prices and the selling prices and we can easily calculate the profit percentage and the profit or loss for all of them. The only thing remaining is we have to identify which phone is what based on the cost price and the selling price. We have identified the cost price for G. We have identified the cost price and selling price for G. For G so let us fill it up. So this is 7500 and this is 6000. So A has to be 6000. And therefore its uh, selling price has to be 7500 now how can we identify which is s k and i we can identify that because if you remember there is one clue that has been given that the cost price and selling price of s neither of the two is equal to 4000 if you look at the options that are available this has been taken this is actually a and this is g so the options for S are only three. Now out of these three, one of them has 4,000 as a cost price and one of them has 4,000 as the selling price. So the remaining one has to be S. That is 5,000 and 6,500. So this is 5,000 and this would imply that this is 6,500. Therefore the cost price of K has to be 6,500 and its selling price is 4,000. Therefore the cost price of I is 4,000 and its selling price will be 5000 so now we have the cost price and the selling price and we can easily calculate the profit percentage for all the five mobile phones let us go ahead and answer the questions that follow what is the profit realized by selling mobile s the profit realized by selling mobile s is 6500 minus 5000 which is 1500 The two mobiles that were sold for the same profit percentage are we are looking for same profit percentage we have calculated it very early they are the mobile phones whose cost price and selling price is 4000 and 5000 and 6000 and 7500 for both of them the profit percentage is the same and it equals 20 percent so the names are 4000 and 5000 is i and 6000 and 7500 is a so the answer is a and i which is option d The cost price of mobile K is 6500. What is the profit or loss obtained by selling mobile A? Mobile A was bought for 6000 and sold for 7500. Therefore, the profit obtained is rupees 1500 profit. Google search Kraku Cat Formulas PDF. Click on the first link. You will get a list of topics for Cat. Click on one of the topics, download the PDF to get a list of formulas for the topic. In this question we are told that there are 6 students, Abhishek, Barman, Chandu, Divakar, Ishan and Parhan. They have taken 3 dash cats, dash cat 1, dash cat 2 and dash cat 3. And we have been given how they have performed in each of the 3 dash cats. 
but we haven't been given their exact scores in the three sections. So as you know, CAT has three sections. It has quant, verbal and LRDI. And in a normal examination, the total will be just summing up the scores in all the three sections. But in this particular examination, the total is given by a formula. It is told that this is equal to 1.5 times how much each person has scored in verbal plus 1 times into how much he has scored in LRDI plus 0.5 times of his score in quant. This is given as his total. Now the table across uh, all the three dash cats has three individual columns. So for example, if you are looking at dash cat, the first column represents the percentage of uh, marks, percentage of the total marks that each of the person has got. So if you for example sum up their scores in the first column, it will total up to 100. For example, 25 plus 20 is 45, plus 15 is 60, plus 20 is 80, plus 10 plus 10 is 100. It will be the same for all the three dash cats. If you sum up the first uh, column in all the three dash cats, you will get 100. For example, in the second one, it is 15 plus 10 is 25 plus 30 is 55, plus 10 is 65, plus 35 is 100. Similarly, in the third dash card, it is 20 plus 15 is 35, plus 15 is 50, plus 20 plus 15 plus 15, again we'll add up to 100. So the first column represents the percentage of marks, percentage of the total marks that uh, each of the individual persons has received. That is the first column's uh, contribution. If you're looking at the second column's contribution, it represents the percentage of marks of verbal divided by the total of that person. For example, if you are looking at Abhishek's score in uh, the first dash cat, 30 over here is the percentage that is 30% is equal to Abhishek's verbal score by Abhishek's total score. Similarly, the third column which is 25% is Abhishek's LRDI score divided by his total score. That is 25% will be his LRDI score divided by his total score. This is the information that is given to us across all the three dash cats for the six friends. Now based on it, we have to calculate and we have to answer the questions that follow. But before we go there, let us first get an understanding of how we can extract the verbal LRDI and quant score based on the total that uh, is given. So for example, in any of the dash card for any of the person, because we know how much is given in the second and third columns, for each of the individual person, let us call that to be 2 and 3. These numbers, for example, if you want Chendu's uh, second column in dash cat 2, we can easily find out that it will be 20. So we'll represent this as 2 and 3 and based on this 2 and 3 columns, we'll find out his verbal score and his LRDI score and his quant score, assuming that we know his total score. So if Chendu's, if you are looking at anyone's uh, second column, this is equal to verbal by total or verbal is equal to T that is his total marks into whatever number is there in the second column. The number is a percentage so that is something that we should keep in mind. Similarly if we have the third column value which we have from the table and we have his total score if we assume that the total score is T then his score in LRDI will be his total score into the number in the third column. We know the verbal and we know the LRDI so we can easily find out even the quant score. How are we going to calculate it because we know that T is equal to 1.5 into V plus L minus plus 0.5 into Q the value of 0.5 into Q is equal to T minus 1.5 L minus 1.5 V minus L or Q is equal to 2T minus 3V minus 2L. Now what is the value of V? The value of V we can find out from here and the value of L also we can find out from here. So this will equal 2T minus 3 into T into the number in the second column minus 2 into t into the number in the third column or the value of his quant score will be you can take t common this will be 2 minus 3 into the number in the second column for any individual person minus 2 into the number in the third column for any person so if you are given the total of any person we can easily calculate his uh, LRDI score his verbal score and his quant score using the table that is given to us now this is what we know, now let us go ahead and try to answer the questions that follow. Let us look at the first question. If the marks scored by Chindu in DLR section of Dashcat 1, that is Chindu in Dashcat 1 in LRDI and Dashcat 2 LRDI and Dashcat 3 LRDI these are in the ratio of 15 is to 40 is to 12. We are required to find out the 
ratio of the marks scored by Divakar in quant section in the dash cat. So that is we have to find out how much Divakar has scored in quant in DC1, DC2 and DC3. How are we going to do this? We will assume that the scores of Chindu in LRDI in dash cat 1 is 15x. So his score in uh, LRDI in dash cat 2 is 40x and his score in dash cat 3 will be in LRDI is 12x. Once we know this, because we know Chendu's score in LRDI, we can find out Chendu's score, Chendu's total score in all the three dash cats. Once we find out Chendu's total score in all the three dash cats, we will find out what is Divakar's score in all the three dash cats because we have a comparison of the individual total scores. Once we know Divakar's total score in all the three dash cats, using the formulas that we have, we can calculate what is Divakar's quant score in all the three dash cats and we will find out the required ratio. So for example, the total score of Chendu in the three dash cats that is DC1, DC2 and DC3 we will calculate. In DC1 for example his score in LRDI is 15x. This is Chindu. 15x is 50% of his total marks. So his total marks will be 15x by 0.5 so that will be 30x. Now if you are looking at uh, uh, Chindu in the second dash cat in LRDI he has scored 40x. So in LRDI he has scored 40x, 40x is 20% of his total marks. So his total marks will be 40x by 20, so that will come to 200x. Similarly in LRDI in dash cat 3, Chendu has scored 12x, that is 6% of his total score in dash cat 3. So Chendu's total score will be 12x divided by 6%, so again that will be 200x. This is the score of Chendu, the total score of Chendu in the 3 dash cats. Now what will Divakar's score be in all the three dash cats because Divakar is to Chindu's ratio is known to us. The ratio in dash cat when the total uh, score is 20 by 15 that is 4 by 3. So Divakar's score will be 4 by 3 into 30x so that is 40x. This is Divakar's total score in dash cat 1. Similarly in dash cat 2 the ratio is 1 is to 3 because the ratio is 30 is to 10. So if 30 is equal to 200x the total of Divakar will be 200x divided by 3. In dash cat 3, Chendu scored a total of 200x and again the ratio is 15 is to 20. So the total of Divakar will be 4 by 3 into 200x that is 800x by 3. So now we have Divakar's total score in all the three dash cats. We can find out his quant score based on the formula that we have derived earlier which is total into 2 minus 3 into 2 minus 2 into 3. So let us first find out the term in the bracket first for Divakar for all the three and then we can multiply it with the respective totals. So if we call this the quant term QT, QT for all the three dash cats for Divakar will be 2 minus 3 into 2 minus 2 into 3. If you are looking at dash cat 1, this will equal 2 into 2 minus 3 into 0.4 minus 2 into 0 0.2. This is because his second term is 0.4 and his third term is 0.2. As far as the second dash cut is concerned, it is 0.3 and 0.25. So this is 2 minus 3 into 0 0.3 minus 2 into 0 0.25. And the third one is 18 and 23. So 0.18 and 0.23. So this is 2 minus 3 into 0 0.18 minus 2 into 0 0.23. We can simplify this. So the QT of uh, this will be 2 minus 1.2 minus 0.4 so that is 0 0.4 and this will be 0 0.9 and uh, 0 0.5 so 1.4 so this is 0 0.6 and this is 0 0.54 minus 0 0.46 so that is 1 2 minus 1 is 1. Now we can calculate Divakar's score in quant by just multiplying QT with the total marks that he got that is we are just multiplying 2 minus 3 into 2 minus 2 into 3 with the total marks that he got. So this is equal to 0 0.4 into 40x so that is 16x, 0 0.6 into 200x so that is 120x by 3 so that is 40x and this is 800x by 3. So this is the required ratio 16 is to 40 is to 800 by 3. We can simplify this by multiplying all the terms with 3 so that will be 48 is to 120 is to 800 all of them are multiples of 8 so we can divide all of them by 8 so this is 6 is to 15 is to 100. So the ratio of Divakar score 
in all the three dash cats in quant is 6 is to 15 is to 100. You can look at the options, you are going to get one of the options that is option A. So the required answer is 6 is to 15 is to 100. Now let us look at the next question. If the marks obtained by Chindu in VARs in Dashcat 1 is the same as the marks obtained by Farhan in DILR section of Dashcat 3. So Chindu in VARC in DC1, we will assume this to be equal to K. Therefore Farhan in DILR of DC3 will also be equal to K. What are we required to find out? We are required to find out what is the ratio of the total marks scored in DC1 to that of DC3 by all the students put together. So how are we going to do this? Based on the verbal and the LRDI scores of Chendu and Parhan, we will find out the individual total marks of Chendu and Parhan in DC1 and DC3. Then we have what percentage they represent of the total mark. So based on it, we can calculate the total scores of all the students in DC1 and the total scores of all the students in DC3 and we can just find the ratio. But the first step is we will first calculate the total marks of Chendu in DC1. This will equal K divided by his percentage. That is K divided by his verbal percentage in DC1. For Chendu it is 20%. So this is K divided by 0.2. So that is 5K. So Chendu's total marks in DC1 is 5K. And total marks of Farhan in DC3 will be again Farhan's uh, score in LRDI which is K divided by the percentage. Farhan this is 21. So the total marks of Farhan is K divided by 0 0.21 in DC3. Now each of them represents a certain percentage of the total marks in that particular uh, dash cat. For Farhan that is 15% and for Chindu also that is 15% actually. So the total marks of all the people in DC1 will be 5K which is Chindu's uh, score, total score divided by how much percentage is contributing that is 0 0.15 and the total marks in DC3 is K by 0 0.21 which is Farhan's total score in DC3 divided by how much percentage is contributing which is again 0 0.15. Now what are we required to find out? We are required to find out the ratio of DC1 to DC3 the total. So we are just required to find out these two ratios. So we are required to find out 5k by 0 0.15 divided by k by 20 0 k by 0 0.21 by 0 0.15 we can cancel 0 0.15 we can cancel k so this is equal to 5 is to 1 by 0 0.21 you can multiply both sides the of the right hand side with 100 so this will be 100 divided by 21 or it will be 21 is to 20. We are dividing both the sides with 5 and multiplying with 21. So the required ratio is 21 is to 20. Let us look at the next question. If Ishan scored 120 marks in DC2, Ishan score in DC2, the total score is 120. And Divakar scored 90 in DC3. In DC3 it is 90. Find the sum of the marks to the nearest integer scored by Abhishek and Burman in QA sections of the two dash cards. So we need to find out how much Abhishek has scored in DC2 and in DC3. We have to find out how much Burman has scored in DC2 and DC3 and calculate the sum of all the four numbers. To do that let us first find out Abhishek's score in DC2. We will find out uh, Burman score in DC2. Then we will calculate Abhishek score in DC3. And we will calculate Burman score in DC3. Once we calculate their total scores in each of the dash cards, both the dash cards, we can find out how much they have scored in quant in both the dash cards. So we will get four numbers and we will have to add them up. How can we find out Abhishek score in DC2? Because we know Ishan score in DC2, this is 120. So Abhishek score will be 120 into how much percentage did Abhishek contribute? 25%. Oh, sorry, that is in DC1. So in DC2, it is 15% divided by how much Ishan has contributed, which is also 15%. So 15 by 15. So Abhishek's total score in DC2 is 120. 
what is Berman score in DC2? It is 120 into how much percentage did Berman contribute? Berman contributed 10 and Ishan contributed 15. So if 120 into 10 by 15, so this will be 120 into 2 by 3, so that is 80. This is Berman's total score in DC2. We will calculate the same for even DC3 for both. A, we know that Divakar scored 90 in DC3, Abhishek contributed 20%. And how much did Divakar contribute? Divakar also contributed 20%. So Abhishek's total score in DC3 is 90. What is Berman's total score? It is 90 into how much did Berman contribute? Berman contributed 15. So this is 15 by 20 or 90 into 3 by 4 or 45 into 3 by 2. So that is 135 by 2 or that is 67.5. So now we have how much each one of them has contributed. How much each one of them has totaled in all the two dash cats. We need to calculate their quant scores. So to calculate their quant scores, we'll first have to calculate the term in the bracket for DC2 and DC3 for both of them. Then we can easily multiply uh, it with the total score that they have to get their score in the quant section. So for Abhishek in DC2, the second term is 24 and the third term is 24. So his term in the bracket will be 2 minus 3 into 0 0.24 minus 2 into 0 0.24 this is equal to 2 minus 1.2 so this is 0 0.8 this is in dc2 for abhishek what is dc3 for abhishek again it is 27 and 16 so 2 minus 3 into 0 0.27 minus 2 into 0 0.16 so that is 81 plus 32 that is 113 so this is 0 0.87 for Burman in DC2 it is 36 and 18. So this is 2 minus 3 into 0 0.36 minus 2 into 0 0.18. So this is 1.08 and 0.36 so 1.44 so this is 0 0.56. For Burman in DC3 it is 22 and 16. So this is 2 minus 3 into 0 0.22 minus 2 into 0 0.16. So that is 0.66 plus 32 so that is 0.98 so this is 1.02 so their total scores will be in quant is 120 into 0.8 so that is 96 80 into 56 so that is 56 into 8 is 448 so this is 44.8 90 into 87 is 870 minus 87 so that is 3 8 and 783 so this is 78.3 and 67.5 into 1.02 also can be calculated so this will come to you can use your calculator to find out this will come to equal 67.5 into 1.02 this is 68.85 so we just need to sum these up to get the fine uh, total score in quant of all the people so this is 196 plus 44.8 is 140.8 78.3 plus 68.15 will be 130, 146, 147.15. So the total is 287.95 or approximately equal to 288. So the sum of the scores is 288 in quant for in both the sections for both of them. Let us go ahead and do the last question. If it is known that the total marks scored by all the students put together in DC1 is 2000. So in DC1 the total scores is 2000 by all the students put together. Find out the sum of the marks in the VARC section and the quant section in Dashcat1 for all the students put together. So we need to find out what is the score of verbal plus quant for all the students. So because we know the total score of all the students in DC1. We can easily calculate the individual total scores by multiplying each one of them with the number in the first column. Once we do that, we can calculate their verbal and their quant and then just add them up. So the verbal score will be equal to the total score into the second column and the quant score is equal to t into 2 minus 3 into 2 minus 2 into 3. As we are required to find out verbal plus quant for all of them. We can sum them up. So this will be 2t minus 2 into 2 minus 2 into 3. So what we have to do is we'll just uh, 2 into t into t. 
So we'll just take 2t common. So this will be 1 minus 2 minus 3. So what we'll do is for each one of them we'll calculate the individual score and we'll calculate what is 1 minus the second column number minus third column number and then just multiply it with uh, 2t for each one of the students. So for example for Abhishek, Barman, Chendu, Divakar, Ishan and Farhan because the total score is 2000 and Abhishek contributed 25 his total marks is 500 that is 2000 into 0 0.25. For Barman it is 20% so that is 400. For Chendu it is 15% so 2000 into 15% is 300. For Divakar it is 20% so this is again 400. For Ishan and Farhan it is 10% so that is 200 and 200. Now for each one of them we can calculate what is 1 minus 2 minus 3. So for Abhishek it is 1 minus 0 0.3 minus 0 0.25 or 1 minus 0 0.55 so this is 0.45. For Burman it is 30 and 30, 60, so this will be 0.4. For Chendu it is 20 and 50, that is 70, so this is 0.3. For Divakar it is 40 and 20, 60, so again it is 0.4. For Ishan it is 34 and 19, so that is 53, so that is 0.47. And for Farhan it is 30 and 40, so this is 0.3. So we have to for each one of them multiply 500 with 0 0.45 into 2 to get uh, his score his uh, total score in verbal and uh, quant. So we'll just multiply the first, uh, we can easily do that. So this will be equal 500 into point. We'll first multiply all of them with uh, just these two and then multiply the total with two to make it easier. So this will be 225. This is equal to 160. This is equal to 90. This is equal to 160. This is equal to 94 and this is equal to 60. So we'll total this up and multiply it by 2 to get the required answer because the first column represents t and the second column represents 1 minus 2 minus 3. So we shouldn't forget to multiply the whole with 2. So this is equal to 225 plus 160 is 385. 90 plus 160 is 250. 94 plus 60 is 154. So if you again add this up 250 plus 154 is 404. So 404 plus 385 is 789. This we have to multiply with 2 to get the total score or the answer. This is 8, 1, 7, 5. So this is 1, 5, 7, 8. So the required answer is 1, 5, 7, 8. Google search crack for free cat mock. Click on the first link. You can attempt a free mock test which was attempted by 30,000 CAT aspirants in the actual exam format. After completing the test, you get detailed solutions, analysis and percentile along with your scorecard to gauge your All India performance. Click on the solution to get video solutions from our expert faculty. In this question, we are told that there is a person called Akash and he owns a jewelry store. And in the jewelry store, he has uh, two balances. The first one is a beam balance. A beam balance is an analogous balance. So it will be something like a beam. And you can put one weight here and you can put one weight here. So you can measure the relative weight of two objects, but you can't measure the absolute value of one of the objects. So and the second one is a spring beam. Is a spring balance. The spring balance will help you in identifying how much the exact absolute weight of any of the items is. So you can put one uh, object on the spring balance and you'll get a reading which says okay this is like say 2 kgs. In case of a beam balance it will only tell you which of them is heavier and which of them is lighter for two objects but it won't tell you absolutely what is the weight of any of the two objects. So this is the information that is given to us. We are also told that there are four people who come to his store. Tilak, Girish, Kiran and Lalit, all of them bring different number of coins. Now uh, Akash feels that one of the uh, coins from each one of them is a fake coin and he has to identify the fake coin. So the questions that follow will be based on whether he is using the beam balance or whether he is using the spring balance and how many times he has to use each one of them. So this is the information, let us go ahead and solve the questions that follow. Now in this question we are told that Tilak comes to Akash store and he brought some coins with him. 
and Akash realizes that the fake coin that is there with Tilak weighs lesser than the standard coin. So Akash knows a couple of things. He knows that there is exactly one fake coin and he also knows that this fake coin is lesser than the standard coin. Let us assume that Tilak has brought say n coins. It is also given that Akash needs to use the weighing four times and if he uses it four times he will be able to figure out whichever is the fake coin. Now we are supposed to find out what is the maximum possible value for n such that by using four uh, times the uh, balance spring balance we will be able to identify which is the fake coin. Now if say there are only two coins that are brought that is if n is 2 you can weigh the first coin and you can weigh the second coin and whichever is lighter is the fake coin. So it is quite easy for 2. Similarly for 3 also it is quite easy we will weigh the first coin and then we will again weigh the second coin. If the weights are the same then you know that the third coin is the defective coin. If the weights are different then whichever is the lighter coin is the defective coin. So again you can just get it done in 2 weighings. If you are looking at 4 coins. Now you divide these 4 coins into first you put 2 coins you measure the weight then you put another 2 coins and then you measure the weight. Now based on whichever is lighter you know that that 2 coins will have the fake coin. So then measure one of the 2 coins. So remember that in a spring balance because you know the weight the weight is displayed you will be able to identify after the first 2 readings what is the standard weight of the gold coin. So for example if you are identifying if you if the first two coins weigh say 10 grams and if the second two coins weigh 12 grams what does this mean this means that because 12 grams is the heavier it means that the fake coin is in the 10 grams it will also tell us that because you put two gram uh, two coins and they weigh 12 grams the standard weight of a gold coin is 6 grams and you will also know that the fake coin is going to weigh 4 grams this you will figure out after doing the first two readings. Then for the third reading you measure, you take one of the coins out of the two coins which contain the fake coin and you measure it. It will be either 6 or 4. If it is 6 you know that the coin you didn't uh, measure is the fake coin. If it is 4 you know that that is the fake coin. So again you can get uh, this done in 3 weighings. Similarly for even 5, if you divide them into 2 plus 2, that is you measure the first two coins you measure their weight then you measure the weight of the next two coins if they are the same then the fake coin is the fifth coin if they are different and if one of them is uh, lighter the situation will be exactly like with the four coins so again you can do it in three wings suppose you have six coins if you have six coins you divide them into three plus three you measure the weight of the first three coins then you get an answer you measure the weight of the next three coins you're going to get a different answer whichever is lighter suppose the second one is lighter again just for ease let us assume that uh, because we are saying that the standard coin is 6 grams and the fake coin is 4 grams if the first uh, three coins give you 18 grams and the second one gives you 16 grams you know that the second one is lighter so the first three coins are standard coins and they weigh 18 grams so again you can say that the standard weight is 6 grams and the fake one is 4 grams now out of the three coins you measure the first uh, say one coin and then you can measure the second coin again basically you can get it done in four ways after four weighings, you can easily find out the weight of the six coins if you have say seven uh, coins again you do the same thing you take the first three uh, coins you measure their weight then you take the weight of the next three coins you measure their weight if they are the same then the fake coin is the seventh one if they are different you can easily identify which of the three coins have the fake and you can find out the fake in another two tries so again you are going to figure it out in four ways if you have eight also it will be the same it is three plus three and then there is only two if these two are the same you can easily find out the fake in the two coins by measuring one if these two are different again you can easily figure out which of the three is the fake by using two tries so again this can be done in four ways now once you have nine coins Again you measure 3 coins and 3 coins and then there are 3 coins left. After you measure the first 2 times that is after you measure this 3 coins and this 3 coins. You can easily figure out which of the 3 coins have the fake coin. The same thing we are saying that if the weight of these 3 coins is the same as the weight of the second 3 coins. The fake will be definitely there in the last 3 coins. If one of them is lighter say the first one is lighter. 
then you know that the fake is in the first three coins and after the first two efforts you also know what is the standard weight of a gold coin so then you divide this three into say one plus one plus one you measure the first one you measure the second one and by then if again the standard coins weight is the same as these two weighings without measuring the third one you know that that is the fake coin so again you can get it done in four ways now let us see for 10 coins if you have 10 you will measure this as 3 plus 3 plus 4 again in this case if the 3 and 3 are the same you know that the fake coin is in the fourth uh, in the group of four coins later if one of them is lighter you can measure which one it is using two more tries so you can get it done in a total of four but suppose three and three the first three coins weigh the same as the next three coins then after using two weighings you have been able to identify that the fake coin is definitely there in the four coins over here and you are also able to know the weight of the standard coin because you have two weighings of three coins each which will be the same so you can easily calculate how much the standard coin is supposed to weigh and you are done with two wings. Now the four coins that are there, divide them into two plus two. And you weigh the first two coins. If the weight is the same as the standard weight that is expected, then you know that the fake coin is in the last two. And you have used three wings. And in the last two, weigh one of the coins. And based on the weight, if it is the same as the weight of the standard coin, then the fake is the last coin which is left. If it is lesser than the standard weight, you know that that is the fake coin. Again, you can figure it out in exactly four wings. Now, if you're going for 11, the 11, you'll divide it into four plus four plus three. So you measure four coins first, and then you measure another four coins and you take the weighings of each one of them. Suppose this four coins uh, weigh 24 grams. And suppose the second uh, four coins also weigh 24 grams. Then after using two weighings, you know that the fake coin is in the three coins that are left. And you also know that the standard coin will weigh 24 by 4, that is 6 grams. So you can measure two of the three coins, find out their weights. If both of them come to 6 grams each, then the fake coin is the last coin which is left. If one of them is less than 6 grams, then you know that is the fake coin. So that is easy to identify. But what will happen if one of them measures 24 grams and the other one measures 22 grams? So after using two tries, you know that the fake coin is in the second group of four coins. You also know that the standard coin will weigh six grams because it is 24 by four. And you know that the fake coin is lighter. So fake coin cannot be in the 22 grams. So after using two tries, you know that the fake coin is in the four uh, coins in the second group. Now you divide them into two plus two. You measure the weight of the first two coins. If they are 12 grams as expected, then the fake coin will be in the last two coins and you measure one of them. Again, you have used four wings, but you have been able to figure out which one is the fake coin after using four wings. But as you can observe, we are getting very close to our limits. By using only four wings, it is now getting very difficult to identify which is the fake coin. The last that you can do is for 12 coins. You divide them again into four plus four plus four. Again, you measure the weight. If both of them are the same, we do exactly what we have done earlier because after using two weighings, you know that the fake coin is in the last four coins. You measure them as two plus two and you identify which is lighter. So after three weighings, you have boiled it down to the last two coins which contain the fake coin and you measure one of them. If one of them is lighter, again, you know the standard weight of the gold coin by using the heavier uh, group of four coins. And you do the same thing that you have done. Divide these four coins, if they are containing the fake coin, into two and two. Measure one of the twos. If it is equaling 12 grams as expected, then the fake coin is in the other uh, two coins. Say if this is coming out to 12 grams, then you know that the fake is in the last two coins and you measure one of them. Again, you can get it done in four weighings, but this is the last. If you have 13 coins, by using only four weighings, you will not be able to figure out which of them is the fake coin. Because in this case, if you have say 4 plus 4 plus 5, and if you identify, if you use two weighings like we have done earlier, and you get both of them to be the same. Again, you get them as say 24 grams and 24 grams. At the end of two weighings, you know that the fake coin is in the five coins, and you know that the standard weight is six grams. But you have used up two weighings, and you have only two more weighings left. And you have five coins to figure out where the fake coin is. 
Now, if you divide this 5 into 2 plus 2 plus 1 and you measure the weight of the first two and here if you are getting 12 grams, then you know that it is the fake coin is either in this one or this one but you have used 3 already. Now, if you are checking the weight of the remaining two and say if this comes to 10 grams, then you have used up all your four weights and you know that the fake coin is definitely one of these two but you will not be able to pinpoint which of the two it is. You would need one more weighing to weigh one of them to identify the fake coin accurately. So if you have 13 coins and you can weigh the spring balance only four times, you will not be able to identify where the fake coin is, which of them is the fake coin. So the number of coins that Tilak has cannot exceed 12. Let us go to the next question. Akash knows that the coin that Girish added weighs less than the standard coin. So there is another guy called Girish who came. He also bought a fake coin. This fake coin also weighs lesser than the standard coin. And over here we are told that Girish has brought 13 coins with him. And Akash is again using the spring balance like he has used earlier. Now the minimum number of weighings needed to determine the fake coin always is. This is what we need to do. Now when you are told the minimum number of weighings, you have to look at the worst possible case scenario. So we are not looking at the best case scenario. What do I mean by the best case scenario? The best case scenario is if you are getting 13 coins and you measure the first coin and it comes to 6 grams and you measure the second coin and it comes to 4 grams, then you can easily say that okay the second coin is lighter. So the second coin is the fake coin. But this is the best case scenario. Your algorithm should be designed or your strategy should be designed in such a way that wherever the coin is, it can be the second coin or it can be the 12th coin or it can be the 13th coin, wherever the coin is using x number of tries you should be able to figure out which is the fake coin. So to do that divide this 13 as we have done earlier into 4 coins plus 4 coins plus 5 coins. Now measure the weight of the 4 coins. Again as we have done earlier suppose the uh, number that you got is 24 grams. Then measure the weight of the next 4 coins. If the number you get is say 22 grams then you know that the fake coin lies in the second group. That is case 1. That is in the second group you are getting 22 grams. Now suppose if both of them are 24 grams each then you know that the fake coin is in the remaining 5 coins. So that is the second case. That is in the 5 coins the fake coin is there. Now in both these cases we have already used 2 weighings. Let us see how many weighings we would need in the first case. Now you have identified that the fake coin is in the second group of 4 coins. You also have identified that the standard coin weighs 24 by 4 that is 6 grams each. So now this 4 you divide it into 2 plus 2 coins. And you weigh the first 2 coins. In this case if you are getting 12 grams then you know that the fake coin is in the last 2 coins. But suppose you are getting 10 grams, you know that the fake coin is in this 2 uh, coins. Anyway, after you weigh 3 times, you are able to identify the last 2 coins in which the fake coin is present in. Then you measure one of them, one of the 2 coins. If you are getting 6 grams, then the remaining coin is the fake coin. If you are getting 4 grams, you have identified the fake coin. So anyway, in the first case, you can identify it by using 4 weighings itself. This is if one of the 4 grams in the first two weighings is less than the other four. Then you can identify which is the fake coin in a maximum of four weighings. But what will happen if the first time you measure both of them are the same and you have used two weighings. Now you have been able to bottle it down. You have been able to iron it down that okay the fake coin is in the last five coins and you also know that the standard weight is six grams and you have used two weighings. Now divide this 5 coins into 2 plus 2 plus 1 and you measure the weight of the first 2 coins. If they are 12 grams then go ahead. If they are not 12 grams if it is say 10 grams then by measuring one of them you will be able to identify which is the fake coin as we have done earlier. So if uh, the first 2 coins you measure is less than 12 grams you can identify the fake coin in just 4 tries in a total of 4 tries. If the first 2 coins give you 12 grams then you have used up 3 weighings. And you know that the fake coin is in the last three. Then you measure the second two coins. Again if this is 12 grams you know that the fake coin is not present in them and the fake coin will be the last one. So again by using four weighings you have been able to identify which is the fake coin.
the only case left if these two coins give you instead of 12 grams if it gives you a weight of say 10 grams now you know for sure that after you have done four weighings these two coins will contain the fake coin but you don't know which of the two coins is the fake coin for which you need to weigh one of them again so you divide this two into one plus one and you weigh the first one if this is six grams then the last remaining one is the fake one if the first one gives you a number which is less than six say four grams then you know that this is the fake coin anyway in this case you need a total of five weighings so when you're designing your strategy and when you are giving the answer when you have 13 coins and you know that one of the fake coin is lighter than the standard coin you would still need five weighings to be sure that you will identify the fake coin now let us look at the next question in this question we are told that kiran bought some gold coins and they are greater than three we are told that akash knows that the fake coin that kiran has added weighs more than the standard coin so the fake coin weighs more than the standard coin and we are also told that using two weighings akash is able to figure out which is the fake coin then what is the sum of all the possible values of n now let us assume that n is equal to 4 because we know that n is greater than 3 in four cases suppose he has one beam uh, he has a beam balance and say he has put uh, two coins each in both of them then one of them it is going to slide down then you know that that is the heavier one and so you are going to know which of them is the <coughs> heavier set of two coins after using one weighing then you divide these two into one and one and you again measure the weight whichever is heavier you are able to identify that this is the fake coin so if n is equal to 4 using two weighings you can easily identify which is the fake coin if n is equal to 5 you do the same thing instead of uh, uh, dividing them as uh, 2 and 2 we'll do the same thing we'll divide it as 2 plus 2 plus 1 now if one of the two uh, in the first two when you are uh, weighing the first uh, set of two with the second set of two if the beam is balanced you know that the fake coin is the third one if the beam is not balanced and if one of them is heavier than the other one then you pick the one which is heavier and you measure them individually and whichever is heavier in this set of two coins will be the fake coin again with n is equal to 5 using two weights you can easily identify the fake coin now what will happen when n is equal to 6 when n is equal to 6 we'll divide it into 3 plus 3 we'll measure three coins and three coins first one of them will definitely be heavier whichever is heavier say this is heavier contains the fake coin now you divide it into 1 plus 1 plus 1 and you measure the beam of the uh, first two coins if they are uh, balanced then you know that the third coin remaining is the fake one if they're not balanced and if one of them is heavier then you know that the heavier one is the fake coin that is the fake coin similarly when n is equal to 7 we'll divide it into 3 plus 3 plus 1 we'll measure the first three coins and the second three coins in a beam balance if the beam balance is balanced then the fake coin is the seventh one which is the last one which is not measured but if say one of them is heavier than the other then we take the heavier side and we'll divide it into one plus one plus one and we measure the first two in the beam balance whichever is the heavier contains the fake coin and again if they're balanced it would imply that the remaining coin is the fake coin so even for n is equal to seven using two wings we can easily identify it similarly for n is equal to eight the strategy is the same we'll use it as 3 plus 3 plus 2 we'll use the first beam to measure the first three coins versus the next three coins if they're again balanced we know that the fake coin is in the last two we'll divide them into one and one and we'll measure them and whichever is the heavier is the fake coin if they are if one of them is heavier in the first set of three we'll do the same thing we'll divide it into one one and one and we'll measure the first two coins if they're again balanced then the last one which is remaining is the fake one if one of them is heavier then that is the fake coin We'll do the same for even n is equal to 9. We'll divide it into 3 plus 3 plus 3. And after using the beam balance for the first time, if both of them are balanced, then the fake coin is in the last third. If uh, the beam doesn't balance and if one of them is heavier, then we can identify which of the three coins are heavier and they contain the fake coin. So after using the beam for the first time, you can pinpoint that uh, which three coins contain the fake coin and then you divide these three coins into one one and one we'll use again the beam balance on the first one and one 
and again if it is balanced then the third coin is the fake if it is not balanced then whichever is heavier is the fake coin so for even n is equal to 9 using two weighings we can figure out which is the fake coin but for n is equal to 10 this is not possible for n is equal to 10 if you are dividing it as 3 plus 3 plus 4 and if in the first case the first set of three coins and the second set of three coins suppose they are matching then you know after weighing once that the fake coin is in the four coins which are to the end now using only one weighing which is remaining you will not be able to identify which of the four coins is a fake coin for example if you divide it into two plus two then by using the beam balance once you can pinpoint it to which two coins contain the fake coin that is whichever of the of this beam is heavier contains the fake coin so you can pinpoint which of the two coins contains the fake coin but you can't pinpoint which of those two is the fake coin so for n is equal to 10 you need a minimum of three wings to be able to identify the fake coin so for n is equal to 4 or 5 or 6 or 7 or 8 or 9 you will be able to identify the fake coin in exactly two tries so the total is 9 plus 8 is 17 17 plus 7 is 24 24 plus 6 is 30 30 plus 5 is 35 35 plus 4 is 39 in general whenever you're given this kind of a question you can identify in one way the maximum number of uh, coins that you can identify the fake coin is for n is equal to 3 for whenever the number of coins is less than or equal to 3 you can identify it in one way from 3 to 9 greater than 3 and less than or equal to 9 you need two weighings and greater than 9 and less than or equal to 27 you would need at least three weighings this is basically an exponent which is growing at uh, three times the previous time because if you remember when you have three coins and you divide them as 1 1 1 by using one try you will be able to eliminate three of them so by adding one extra weighing you can multiply the n three times that is basically a theory but anyway the answer for this uh, question is 39 uh, is the sum of all the possible values of n Lalita has 15 coins with him Akash knows the fake gold coins weigh more than the standard coin which balance should Akash use and what is the least number of weighings uh, in which Akash can determine the fake coin so Akash wants to determine the fake coin in the least possible number of times if you remember earlier in one of the questions for 13 coins using a spring balance it took us five attempts to actually figure it out uh, using a beam balance we can do it in just three tries now we'll uh, figure out how we can do that so the 15 coins that we have we'll divide it into five five and five and we are using only the beam balance so after you weigh for the first time you weigh the first five coins with the second five coins if both of them are the same then you know that the fake coin is in the third five coins if one of them is heavier say the second one is heavier then you know that the fake coin is in this five uh, coins anyway after using one weighing you know which five coins the fake coin contain uh, is present in now these five coins you divide it into two two and one and for the second weighing you weigh the first two coins with the second two coins if they are the same then you know that the fake coin is the coin which is left out if one of them is heavier say the second one is heavier then you know that the fake coin is one of these two coins and you have used up two weighings now for the last weighing you just weigh one of them with the second one whichever is heavier is the fake coin so you have used a total of three weighings using a beam balance you can use three weights to get the answer so that is option a for spring balance we have figured it out earlier that for 13 coins you need at least five uh, attempts we can do the same even now when you have 15 coins and you have a spring balance which actually tells you what is the weight of each of the coins you may uh, you divide them into again five five and five you measure the weight of the first five coins and you measure the weight of the next five coins suppose the weight of the first five coins that you got is say 30 grams and the weight of the second uh, five uh, coins you got is say 28 grams then you know a couple of things you know that the oh sorry because this is heavier you will get 32 grams so now you know that whichever is lighter is the standard coin 
Why do you know that? Because over here we are told that the fake coin weighs more than the standard coin. So whichever of these five coins weighs lesser contains all standard coins. So in this case, you know that the standard weight of a gold coin will be six grams. And you also know that the fake coin is present in this in the second set of five coins. What will happen if uh, both of them weigh 30 grams each? Then you know that the fake coin is present in the last five coins. Anyway, after you are doing two weighings, you know which five coins the fake coin is present in and you know that the standard coin will weigh six grams. These are the things that you know after you weighed two times. Now the five coins you divide again into two, two and one. You measure the weight of the first two coins. You would be expecting it to be 12 grams if both of them are standard. Now if both of them are not standard and if one of them is fake, you split them into one and one and you can identify easily with one more weighing whichever is the fake coin. So in this case, you will need four weighings. But suppose you are going to get this as say 12 grams. Then you have used up three weighings and you have pinpointed the fake coin to be present in the last three. Now you measure the weight of the two coins. If they are 12 grams, then you know that okay, the fake coin is the last coin remaining, but you have used up four weighings. Now the worst case scenario will happen if the two coins that you measure instead of weighing 12 grams, they weigh say 14 grams. Now you have used up four weighings and you know that they contain the fake coin. So again, you have to use one more weighing to divide it into one and one and weigh one of them. If the first one you weigh is say six grams, then you know that the remaining one is the fake one. If the coin that you have measured, this comes out as eight grams, then this is the fake coin. Anyway, you need a total of five weighings using a spring balance to figure out which is the fake coin. So the correct answer is beam balance and three, which will take the minimum number of weighings required to find out which is the fake coin. We at Traku provide all the previous year CAT papers along with many other MBA examinations such as IIFT, ZAT, SNAP, MAT, CMAT, TIS and PGDBA in the actual exam format. You can attempt them as a test and get a detailed analysis of your performance or download them as PDFs. This is a games and tournaments question. In this question we are given two tables. We are told that this is uh, this represents the hockey tournament that uh, in which six teams have participated. The six teams are Australia, Pakistan, India, Brazil, South Africa and France. The first table gives us two informations. The first table will tell us uh, between any two teams who has won the game and it will also tell us the goal difference between uh, in, in that particular game. The second uh, table tells us the overall cumulative goals scored and goals uh, that were scored against a particular team. For example, if you are looking at the first table, if you are looking to find out who has won in the Australia versus Pakistan match, you have to look at the first column and in Australia versus Pakistan, find the row of Pakistan and here you see W. What does this W mean that? This means that the name of the country which is the column heading acts actually won the game. That means Australia has won the game. And what is the goal difference for the win that Australia has? If you are looking at the goal difference, then search for the other column which is Pakistan versus Australia. So this is 2. Essentially you can divide this uh, table, this square so to say because it has 6 rows and 6 columns into 2 parts. There is one diagonal and all the data which is below the diagonal will tell us who has won the game and all the data which is above the diagonal will tell us the goal difference of the win. For example, just to clear confusion, if you want to see what has happened between the India versus South Africa match, figure out uh, South Africa in the column as well as in the row, figure out India in the column and in the row. So this is India and this is India. So if you see the intersection, India versus South Africa has happened here. Now the column name is India. So it means that India has won the game. And what is the goal difference of the victory? Then search for the other uh, overlap intersection. So this is South Africa versus India. So this number. So the goal difference is 2. What this essentially says is that India has won the game and the goal difference of the win is 2. So this is how you can read the first table. The second table is quite easy to read. Amongst all the games that were played, the total number of goals scored by Australia is 8 and the goals that were scored against Australia is 7. And you can look at it for each of the 6 countries. This is the information that is given. Now, once you look at this table before you actually start answering the table, it is always a good thing to first go through all the questions that are asked so that you can figure out what is the data that needs to be actually found out. 
Second, to get an internal sense of what uh, is actually happening, you can figure out that there are six teams and each of them has played the against the other ones. So the total number of matches is 6 C2, that is 6 into 5 divided by 2, that is 30 by 2, so there are 15 matches. Now, it is always a good thing to keep these kind of things in mind. Just keep thinking about what exactly has happened in the tournament so that you will be a lot more comfortable when you're actually trying to answer this question. Now, just quickly go through the question so that you again know what exactly has to be found out. If you look at the first question, it says that we should find out the scoreline between Brazil and France. So for one particular match, we have to find out the scoreline. The second one is the total number of scores between the match of Australia versus India. Third one is scoreline of South Africa and Brazil. Fourth one is total number of sco uh, goals scored between Pakistan and Brazil. So you would immediately figure out that, okay, the way to go ahead is figuring out the score line for all the 15 games that are there or as many of the 15 games as possible. This is what is expected of us when we are trying to solve this question. Now you have to take a step back and figure out whether you actually want to attempt this question or not. If you look at it and if you are trying to attempt this question, what are the things that you should keep in mind? Now the pros for attempting these kind of questions are, if you can get the 15 uh, scores correct, you are definitely going to get all the 4 questions correct and it won't take any more time other than actually figuring out the scores. Once you figure out the scores, answering all the 4 questions is very easy. So your accuracy will be very high if you are able to solve this. Now the con, that is the thing that you should consider not solving this is because there is a lot of chance that you will make a mistake in this. because the information that is given, uh, you'll have to go through each one of them. So, because if you are editing or if you are trying to actually read the table correctly and you make one mistake. For example, instead of figuring out that in Australia versus Pakistan, you that Australia has one, if you have figured out that Pakistan has one and the goal difference you got correct as two, just one mistake in reading the entire table will make you lose a lot of time. Because by the time you solve it, in the middle only you'll be most likely face a contradiction where you feel that okay, I have gotten something wrong because something is not adding up. But for you to again come back, it will waste a lot of time. So when you're solving it, you have to be very, very crucial. It is very, very important that you concentrate quite well. Now another thing that you should see when you're looking at the information that is given is, there is one more information which is given that uh, in all the matches in which Brazil and South Africa did not play, the both the teams have scored at least one goal. So this also seems to be an important clue. So when you're again solving, if you have decided to solve this question, what are the things that you should uh, focus on? What are the things that will give you more clues when you're trying to fill in the uh, match scores? You don't want to fill in in a brute force manner where you assume that uh, the scores of one is A and B and C and D and then you try to get any linear equations going about the total number of scores that Australia has scored or the total number of goals that Australia has conceded. You don't want to do it in a brute force manner which takes a lot of time. You want to be a lot more strategic about it. So what are the clues that you should look at? One of the clues that you should look at is go through the goals for and goals against column. See if there are any numbers which are very low. For example, the first thing you should notice is that Brazil has scored only one goal. So that seems to be a big constraint. So it will help us in filling out some of the scores quite fast. Similarly, the goals considered by South Africa is only two. So this also seems to be a small number. So probably you will be able to make use of it. The next thing that you should identify is if there is any big goal difference in any one match. Because we have been told that in every match other than Brazil and South Africa, there were always a lot of goals. That is both the teams have scored. So there are a lot of goals. So if the goal difference itself is quite high, then again that seems to be a match that will help us in filling out information. So if you're looking at it, there are India and Pakistan have scored three and South Africa versus Pakistan also there was a goal difference of three. So this seems to be something which is again important. These are the things that you should understand before you actually start answering the question, before you are trying to fill up the 15 uh, score lines. Once you are set, then we can go ahead and start filling the data. And then after that, we can go ahead and answer the questions that follow. So now let us try to fill in the scores for all the 15 games. As we have discussed earlier, one of the bottlenecks that you feel is that uh, Brazil has scored only one goal. Now let us see if Brazil has actually won any game, because to win any game, you have to score at least one goal. So if you are looking at Brazil, we know that it has lost to South Africa and that it has lost to France. So even before you go here, let us also try to fill in who has won each of the game in the ones that we have actually put in here. Why are we doing this? Because again, we are doing this just to ensure that we are not going to commit any silly mistakes. The only thing that is going to stop us from answering this question correctly is that uh, we are making any silly mistakes which we don't want to do. So in Australia versus Pakistan, for example, Australia won. So the winner is Australia. In Australia versus India, Australia lost, so the winner is India. 
in australia versus brazil the winner is australia so it is a in australia versus south africa australia lost so the winner is south africa in australia versus france the winner is australia so this is a in pakistan versus india the winner is pakistan so this is p and pakistan lost all the three remaining matches so this will be b s and f in for india india won the remaining three matches all of these three so this is going to be india india and india for brazil brazil lost both of its matches over here so this is south africa and this is france and in the final match between uh, south africa versus france south africa won so this is s so this is basically the information that is given to us so we have figured out that who has won and who has lost again just to avoid any confusion and ensuring that we are not going to make any silly mistakes over here we will keep track of how many games that each of these teams have actually won so for example australia won one two and three games so this is the win counter there are three games which australia has won out of the total games that it has played which is five for pakistan pakistan has won against india one and that is about it pakistan lost to australia pakistan lost to all the three remaining uh, teams so this is only one India won against all the three teams over here that is Brazil, South Africa and France and India even won against Australia. So India has won four games. For Brazil, Brazil lost to South Africa, lost to France, lost to India, lost to Australia but Brazil won against Pakistan so this is one. For South Africa, South Africa has uh, won against France so that is one. South Africa won against Brazil so it is two. South Africa lost to India. South Africa won against Pakistan, so that is 3. And South Africa won against Australia also, so this is 4. If you are looking at France, France lost to South Africa. France won against Brazil. France lost to India. France won against Pakistan. And France lost to Australia, so this is 2. Once you do it, again just to keep sure that you are not making any mistake, one of the things that you should do is total up the number of wins. The total number of wins should equal the total number of matches, which is 15. So 3 plus 1 is 4, 4 plus 4 is 8, 8 plus 1 is 9, 9 plus 4 is 13, plus 2 is 15. So this is totaling up. So there is a good chance that till now we have not made any mistake. Now if you notice it, one of the things that we wanted to focus on was that Brazil has scored only one goal. In the entire tournament, Brazil has scored only one goal. And we also know that Brazil has won one match. So it would imply that in the match that Brazil has won, it has scored its lone goal. And which is the match that Brazil has won? It has won the match against Pakistan. So here it has scored one goal. So the only way for Brazil to win by scoring one goal is if Pakistan has scored zero. Just to read this correctly, P and B, the first one before the hyphen is Pakistan's uh, number of goals and the one after hyphen is Brazil's score. So Brazil has scored once against Pakistan. In all the other games, Brazil has not scored. So we know the goal difference of the wins. So we will be able to easily fill in by how many goals uh, the other teams have scored against Brazil in all of its remaining four games. For example, if you are looking at Brazil's, uh, the goal difference of Brazil against South Africa is 1 and against France it is 2. So this would imply that in Brazil versus France, because Brazil has scored 0, it would imply that France has scored 2. And in Brazil versus South Africa, South Africa has scored 1. So this is 0 and 1. How do we know this? Because we know that there is only one goal that Brazil has scored in the entire tournament and that one goal has to be against Pakistan. So in any other uh, game, Brazil has not scored any goal. So this is the score for Brazil against South Africa and Brazil versus France. We will do the same for Brazil versus India and Brazil versus Australia. If you are looking at India, India versus Brazil over here. Uh, against uh, Australia, the goal difference is 1. So Australia has scored once. And against Pakistan, the goal difference is 1, which we have just filled in, that Brazil has actually won. And against India, the goal difference is 2, so India has scored 2 times. And Brazil has scored 0. So now we have figured out Brazil. Just to ensure that you are not making any mistake, keep a count of the total number of goals that Brazil has conceded. It should equal 6. If you are looking at it, it will be 1 plus 2, that is 3, plus 1 plus 2, that is 3. Again, 3 plus 3 is 6, so this is fine. So we have finished Brazil. This is done. We need to just figure out for the remaining five teams. But before we go to the remaining five teams, let us clear off the goals that uh, were accounted in the matches against Brazil. So Australia has scored one. 
So instead of 8, we need to figure out for 7 other goals. Pakistan has conceded 1. So instead of 10, we need to figure out for 9. India has uh, scored twice. So instead of 10, we need to figure out for 8. South Africa has scored 1. So instead of 7, this is 6. And France has scored twice. So instead of 6, this is 4. So again, now if you are looking at it, the number of wins that are needed for each one of them is 2, 1, 3, Brazil is over, South Africa is 3 and France is 1. We have decreased everything by 1 except in the game against Pakistan, which Pakistan has actually lost. Now let us look at what is the next concern that we should keep in mind. One of the things that we discussed is South Africa has only considered twice. So that is one thing that we should keep in mind. And the next thing is that Pakistan had uh, a goal difference of 3 against India and a goal difference of 3 against uh, South Africa. Now we can look at each one of them. Clearly in the goal difference of Pakistan versus South Africa where uh, South Africa has won, it would imply that South Africa has scored a lot of goals. But in the goal difference of Pakistan versus India where it is 3, both of them have to score at least one goal. If you remember the constraint that we have actually placed. That is in all the games where Brazil and South Africa were not involved, each of the uh, two teams have scored at least one goal. So if Pakistan has won uh, by three goals against India, it would imply that Pakistan has won either 4-1 or 5-2 or 6-3. Now what is the total number of uh, goals that Pakistan has scored which are unaccounted for till now? It is 6. And what are the total number of matches that we have to figure out? Pakistan has to play against the remaining four teams which we haven't figured out. That is Pakistan versus Australia is remaining. Pakistan versus India is anyways there. Pakistan versus South Africa is there and Pakistan versus France is there. Now Pakistan versus India the scoreline is either 4-1 or 5-2 or 6-3. Now can it be 6-3? You know that it can't be 6-3. Why can it not be 6-3? Because in the game of Pakistan versus Australia in which Brazil is not involved and South Africa is not involved and in the game of Pakistan versus France where again both of those teams are not involved Pakistan has at least scored once. We know that Pakistan has lost those games, but it has scored at least once. So out of the six goals that Pakistan has scored, at least one of those goals was scored in the games of Pakistan versus Australia and Pakistan versus France. So 6-3 is not possible. 5-2 is also not possible. The only thing that is possible is 4-1. So now let us fill out the score line for Pakistan versus India. This is 4-1. So for Pakistan, it has scored a total of six goals and two goals are remaining. So surely one of the goals has to be in Pakistan versus Australia and one of the goals has to be in Pakistan versus France and in the match of Pakistan versus South Africa, Pakistan has not scored any goal. So let us fill those in. So in this game, Pakistan has scored once. In the game against uh, South Africa, Pakistan has not scored and in the game against France, Pakistan has scored once. Now we again know the goal difference in all of these three games. So let us try to fill in how much the other team would have scored. In Australia versus Pakistan, the goal difference is 2. This would imply that Australia has scored thrice and Pakistan has scored once. In the game of uh, Pakistan versus South Africa over here, the goal difference is 3. So it would imply that South Africa has scored 3 times. So it is 3-0. In the goal difference for France versus Pakistan, the goal difference is 1. So the score is 1-2. So again, we have figured out everything for Pakistan also. Just to ensure that we are not making any mistake, let us count the goals for and goals against of Pakistan and they should also match. So they should actually be 6-10 which was the original score. We have removed uh, 9. So if you are looking at Pakistan, the goals conceded, it is 3 plus uh, 1, 4 plus 1, 5, 5 plus 3 plus 2, 5 plus 5 is 10 which was the original number. We have just uh, removed it because we put the number for Pakistan versus Brazil. Similarly, for the goals uh, scored by Pakistan, they scored 1 against Australia, they scored 4 against India, so that is 5, and they scored 1 against uh, France, so that is 6, so that also matches. So we have done with even Pakistan. Before you go any further, let us again update the table. We are doing this again just to ensure that we are not going to make any mistake. So. In the Australia versus Pakistan, we have accounted for 3 goals by Australia. So from 7, it will become 4. And in the goals conceded by Australia, we have uh, Pakistan has scored 1. So we'll decrease this by 1. So this will become 6. 
and there is only one game that australia has won which he are uh, yet to account for pakistan is also done for india india has conceded four so this seven becomes three and india scored one so this becomes seven the number of wins is not altered because india lost its game against pakistan for south africa south africa scored three times it was three zero so this will be three and we have to account for two wins of south africa and france scored two times so this becomes two and conceded one so this becomes five so this is two five and france has won so this is basically what is left we are done with pakistan we are done with brazil we have only four teams left that is australia india south africa and france and now if you look at the table you know that france has scored only two times and france has to we have to account for four of the games of france what are the four games of france the four games of france are against france versus australia france versus india we have to account for three games and france versus south africa now we know that france has scored at least once against australia and at least once against india it has lost all the games but it has scored at least once and if the total number of goals that france has scored is two it would imply that against australia and india france has scored once and against south africa it has scored zero times so let us fill that in so this will be zero this will be one and this will be one we'll again look at the goal differences and we'll fill in how many goals australia has scored how many goals india has scored and how many goals south africa has scored against france so if you're looking at australia versus france over here france versus india the goal difference is one so india won two one france versus australia also the goal difference is one so australia also won two one and france versus south africa the goal difference is one so south africa won one zero so let us again go ahead and update the tables so you can always uh, the good measure is to figure out uh, the number of goals scored of france goals per and goals against we can do that but most likely it is going to remain the same i don't think we have made any mistake till now now if you are updating for australia we have to decrease the goals for by two goals so this becomes two and goals against you have to decrease by one so this becomes five similarly for india you have to decrease the goals for by two so this becomes five and goals against by one so this becomes two for south africa you have to decrease just the goals for by one so this becomes two and france is also done so now we have only three teams remaining just to avoid any confusion let me write them down australia india and south africa the goals for and goals against of australia is two and five for india it is five and two and for south africa it is two and two and how many games are won by each one of them australia has lost both the remaining games against india and south africa so australia has won zero india has won both the remaining games against south africa and australia so india has won two and south africa has won one game against australia and lost one game against india so this is one so if we can actually figure out uh, the scores in these three games we are actually done so let us look at the goal difference in each of the three games that is australia versus india australia versus south africa and india versus south africa if you're looking at the goal difference of australia versus india it is one so india won by one goal against australia and if you're looking at the goal difference of south africa versus australia it is two so south africa won by two goals against australia and in india versus south africa the goal difference is again two but the key thing that you should notice is we know that south africa has scored a total of two goals and we also know that it has won by two goals against australia this would imply that in the game against australia south africa has scored two goals so this would imply that the goals for of south africa will become zero and the goals against of australia will become three now we know that india also has won against south africa by two goals and there's only one match left for south africa so india won by 2-0 against south africa so this will become zero we are done with south africa and five will become three and in the only game remaining between australia and india the goal difference is one and australia has two four and three against and india has the exact opposite this would imply that india won three two against australia so this is basically the score lines we have figured out the scores for all the 15 uh, matches we have just we are looking at the constraints we are looking for numbers which are very low and we are trying to strategically fill in the matches and we are keeping we are updating the table also consistently so that we won't make any mistakes now let us go ahead and answer the questions that follow what is the score line in the match of brazil versus france 
the score line in Brazil versus France is 0 2 so this is what is the total number of goals in the match of Australia versus India that is the match we have figured out last it was 2 3 so the total number of goals is 5 what is the score line in the South Africa versus Brazil match in the South Africa versus Brazil match it is 1 0 or 0 1 Now the last question says that what is the total number of goals in the game between Pakistan versus Brazil? The Pakistan versus Brazil game the score was 0-1 so it is 1. So the correct answer is 1. Google search Kraku Cat Formulas PDF. Click on the first link. You will get a list of topics for cat. Click on one of the topics. Download the PDF to get a list of formulas for the topic. In this question, we are told that there are seven students. Let us call them A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. And they go to classes. There are uh, seven subjects, psychology, English, geography, physics, biology, chemistry, and maths. And they have to attend classes on four days. On each day, a maximum of two classes are held and a minimum of one class is held. So if you think about it, the total number of classes that should be held is seven. They have to be held across four days. And on each day, a maximum of two classes are held and a minimum of one class is held. So there will be three days on which exactly two classes are held and one day on which exactly one class is held. These four days have to be amongst Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. We have been given some clues. Using these clues, we have to identify which student went to which class and on which day. So let us first draw a table. The table is going to have seven rows and it is going to have three columns. This is the name of the student. This is the subject that the student has studied. And this is the day of the week that he or she had to attend the class. The names of the students are A, B, C, D, E, F and G. While going through the clues, we will first go through all the clues. If there is any information that we are able to infer, we will fill the table up. Otherwise, we will make a mental map of how each of the clue is related to the others. And then we will continue to reiterate until we are able to fill the table to the best of our abilities. Let us start. Isha has a class on Saturday. So, the day of the week Isha goes is Saturday. And along with the person who studied psychology. So, this would imply that the person who is studying psychology goes to class on a Saturday and we know that that person is not Isha. The person studying English doesn't go to college on Sunday. The person who is studying English doesn't go on Sunday. So this person either goes on Thursday, Friday or Saturday nor does he go to the college along with Dhanush or Firoz. This would imply that Dhanush and Firoz are also first of all not studying English and the day of the week on which Dhanush and Piroz go to the school is different from the day of the week that the guy who is studying English goes to school. Arun who studies geography, Arun is studying geography, is the only person who has a class on Thursday. So now we have figured out which day of the week exactly one class is held that is Thursday. This would imply that on Friday there are two classes, on Saturday there are two classes and on Sunday there are two classes. Geeta has a class on Friday, Geeta goes to school on Friday and she doesn't study English. So English is again not studied by Geeta. Now we know that English is not studied by either D or F or G. Chendu has a class on Friday. Chendu also goes to class on a Friday. And Firoz doesn't study psychology. So psychology is not studied by Firoz. So Firoz doesn't study psychology or English. Psychology is not studied by either Isha or Firoz. So again, we are just keeping a map of how each of the clue is related to the others. Physics and English classes are held on the same day. So whichever day English is held, 
on the same day physics is also held. So, this would imply that physics is not held on a Sunday. Biology class is held on a Saturday. Psychology is held on a Saturday. Similarly, biology is also held on a Saturday. Now, if you think about it, Isha goes to school along with the person who has studied psychology. There are only two students who go to class on Saturday. This would imply that Isha is studying biology. Bharti neither studies chemistry nor psychology. So, Bharti is neither studying chemistry nor is she studying psychology. Now, if you think about it, psychology we know that is not being studied by Isha who actually studies uh, biology, nor Firoz, nor Bharti. So, who can actually study psychology? If you think about it, the only people remaining are B, C, D, F and G. It is not B because it is just mentioned that psychology is not studied by B. It is not F. So, it has to be either C or D or G. C and G, both of them have classes on Friday. This would imply that D has to study psychology. And therefore, D has to go to school on a Saturday. So, amongst the people, we know the one person who is having a class on Thursday. We know the two people who are having classes on Friday. We know the two people who are having class on Saturday. So, the remaining two people should have classes on Sunday. The only thing which is remaining is now trying to identify what is the subject for each of them. Now, let us go through all the clues again. If a clue is completely used up, we will put a cross over there. If a clue is not completely used up, we will try to infer it and use it for the future use. Isha has a class on Saturday along with the person who studies psychology. This is completely used up. Isha is studying biology and she has a class on Saturday along with D who is studying psychology. The person who is studying English does not go to college on Sunday. Now, this would tell us that the person who is studying college has to go on either Friday or Saturday. We know both the people who are going to school on Saturday. So, English has to be studied on a Friday. So, it has to be either C or G. But we know that Geeta who has a class on Friday and she does not study English. So, this would imply that C has to study English. Anyway, does not go to college nor does he go to college along with Dhanush and Piroz. This is known to us. C is going on, uh, the person who is studying English is C. That person is going on Friday. Dhanush is going on Saturday. Firoz is going on Sunday. So, again this is completely used up. Arun who studies geography is the only person who has a class on Thursday. This also is completely used up. Geeta has a class on Friday and she does not study English. This is known to us. English is studied by C. And we also know that Geeta has a class on Friday. So, this clue also is not really helping us much. Chendu has a class on Friday and Firoz does not study psychology. This also is known to us. Chendu is studying on Friday and Firoz has a class on Sunday and Firoz is not studying psychology. Psychology is, studying, is being studied by Thanush. So, again this is not really helping us much. Physics and English classes are held on the same day. English is held on Friday. So, physics also is held on Friday. So, this would imply that Geeta has to study physics. So, we will again put a cross over here. Biology class is held on a Saturday. This also is known to us that is studied by Isha. Bharti neither studies chemistry or psychology. There are only two classes left. One of them is maths and the other is chemistry. Bharti does not study chemistry. So, that has to be studied by F. And therefore, B has to study maths. As you can see when we are reiterating through all the clues, we have been able to fill the entire table up. Now, let us go ahead and answer the questions that follow. Who studies psychology? Psychology is studied by D, Dhanush. What is the correct order of the following classes? Geography is held on Thursday, so that has to come first. Biology is held on Saturday, so that will come third. Chemistry is held on Sunday, so that will come last. English is held on Friday, 
so that will come second so the order is geography english biology chemistry that is option b who goes to class on saturday the two people who go to class on saturday are dhanush and isha so that will be dhanush and the person who is studying biology which is isha if the timings of physics and english are interchanged physics and english both of them are interchanged both of them are actually held on friday which of the following is true isha and chendu go to college on friday isha goes to college on saturday that won't change so this is not true chendu and geeta go to college on saturday this also is not true because chendu and geeta would continue to go to school on friday only bharati and arun go to college on sunday bharati goes to college on sunday arun goes to college on thursday so this also is not true none of the above so the correct answer is option d none of the above google search crack for free cat mock click on the first link you can attempt a free mock test which was attempted by 30000 cat aspirants in the actual exam format after completing the test you get detailed solutions analysis and percentile along with your scorecard to gauge your all india performance click on the solution to get video solutions from our expert faculty A new airlines company is planning to start operations in a country. The country has identified 10 different cities which they plan to connect through their network to start with. The flight duration between any pair of cities will be less than 1 hour. To start operations, the company has to decide on a daily schedule. The underlying principle that they are working on is as follows. Any person staying in any of these 10 cities should be able to make a trip to any other city in the morning and should be able to return by the evening of the same day. Same day. so uh, this is the basic setup that uh, there are 10 cities uh, that there are 10 cities and uh, anybody should be able to make a trip in the morning and should be able to come back in the same day in the evening so if the underlying principle is to be satisfied in such a way that the journey between any two cities can be performed using only direct flights then the minimum number of direct flights to be scheduled is this what so uh, so let's first understand what the question is asking so there are 10 cities and uh, you should be able to go like suppose uh, there are two cities a and b so you should be able to go from a to b in the morning and go from b to a in the evening but you should be also be able to go from b to a in the morning and come back from a to b in the evening so between any two cities these are the morning flights these are the evening flights so between any two cities you will need total of four flights two in the morning one from a to b and one from b to a and one in the evening one from b to a and the other from a to b so between any two pairs of cities any pair of uh, two cities you need four flights now if there are 10 cities how many such pairs will be there so number of pairs will be 10 c2 essentially that is 10 cities picking two at a time you will get 10 c2 pairs like that that and for each pair you need four flights so you get the total number of flights required as 10 c2 into 4 so this will be equal to 10 into 9 divided by 2 into 4 that is essentially uh, 10 into 9 into 2 that is 180 flights so you would need 180 flights for uh, you to satisfy this underlying principle suppose three of the 10 cities are to be developed as hubs A hub is a city which is connected with every other city by direct flights each way both in the morning as well as in the evening. The only direct flights which will be scheduled are originating or terminating in one of the hubs. Then the minimum number of direct flights that need to be scheduled so that the underlying principle of the airline to serve all the 10 cities is met without visiting more than one hub during a trip is so essentially uh, instead of having all the 10 cities connected to each other you will have all the uh, Uh, seven cities connected to a particular hub so suppose this is hub a then it will have seven connections essentially this 5 6 and 7 and these are the smaller this and it will also be connected to the other two hubs that is a b and c and all of b and uh, c will also be connected to the same seven cities so let's first consider the hub and the cities so for the hub to be connected to the remaining seven cities so how many uh, connections that would be so that would be seven connections and between each connection as i said 
between any two pairs of cities you would need four flights two in the morning so so suppose this is like x so you would need uh, a to x in the morning so in the morning you would need a to x as well as x to a and in the evening you would need a x to a and a to x only then can you start off at a city and end up in the uh, another city at uh, like start in the city and go to another city and come back in the evening only if all four flights are present so as far as a is concerned uh, it would need four flights per each of these seven connections so uh, for each of the hubs you would have for one hub you would have seven connections and each of these will require four flights so for three hubs you will have 3 into 7 into 4 so this is equal to this is 21 into 4 that is 84 flights now you would need interconnection between these uh, uh, hubs as well so there are three hubs so the number of connections between the three hubs is essentially 3c2 and the number of flights per connection is 4 so that is 3c2 into 4 that is essentially 3 into 4 that is equal to 12 so the total number of flights that are needed are 84 plus 12 that is 96 flights so the answer to this question is 96 flights now let's go on to the next question suppose the 10 cities are divided into four distinct groups g1 g2 g4 g3 g4 having 3 3 2 2 and 2 respectively such that uh, and g1 consists of a b and c Further, suppose that direct flights are allowed only between two cities satisfying the following thing. Both cities are in G1, between A and any city in G2, between B and any city in G3, between C and any city in G4. Then the minimum number of direct flights that satisfy the given principle is. So let's figure out how many connections are there. For each connection, we will need four flights. So all cities in G1 have to be interconnected. So there are three cities in G1. So essentially that will be 3C2 into 4. This is equal to 3 into 4 that is 12 flights. Now between A and any city in G2. So between A there are 3 cities in G2. So between A and any city in G2, G2 there will be 3 connections essentially. Start between A and any city. So for each of these 3 connections we need 4 flights. So this is equal to 12 flights. Now between B and any city in G3. There are 2 cities in G3. So between B and uh, the two cities in G3, we will have two connections and for each of these two connections, we will need four flights. So that will be eight. And for between C and any city in G4, there is there are two cities in G4. So there will be two connections and two connections into four, that is eight. So the total number of flights will be eight plus eight plus 12, that is 28. 28 plus uh, uh, 12, that is 40 flights. So the answer is the number of direct flights minimum uh, number of direct flights would be 40 flights now let's go on to the next question suppose the 10 cities are divided into four distinct groups so the essentially the same thing as such uh, however due to operational difficulties at a it would was later decided that only the flights that would operate at a would uh, be those to and from B. G2 would have to be assigned to either G3 or to G4. What would be the maximum reduction in the number of flights as compared to the situation before the operational difficulties arose? Now, so if you see that uh, this, uh, if you see that what happened with G2 and G3, so for each city in G2, we had to add four flights essentially. So if we transfer uh, all these cities that are there in G2 to G3 or G4, there won't be any change as such because you would have to add four flights to B from B or from C. So there would be no difference as a result of that. So whether you put all of these G2 uh, cities in G2 to G3 or to G4, for each city in G, uh, G2, you would have to add four flights again. So those flights will be compensated as uh, B to uh, th that city or C to that city. The only change that will happen if you don't allow any uh, flight from A1 is if you don't uh, if uh, if you allow only flight from A to B that means you are not allowing earlier you had uh, 3 C 2 into 4 right only this part will change because uh, the uh, all the cities of G2 will be added to G3 and G4 this part will remain the same this part will remain the same 
these 12 flights will go to one of these two. So essentially the 8 plus 8 plus 12 will remain unchanged. The only thing that will change is this 3C2 into 4. So instead of 3C2 into 4, now you would lose the connection between A and C. So only two connections will exist between A to B and uh, A and B and uh, B and C. So now this will be essentially two connections into 4 that is 8. Earlier it was 3C2 into 4 that is 12. So the change would be 12 minus 8 that is 4. Another way to think of it is that if uh, because of uh, operational difficulties at A, it is only allowed to uh, send flights to B and G2 and G3, uh, G2 is shifted to either G3 or G4. The only change is the flight between A and C. If you are just stopping the flights between A and C and there were four flights between A and C. So the number uh, change, uh, maximum reduction in the number of direct flights as compared to the situation before would be four flights. So the answer is four. So this is how we solve this set. Uh, this wasn't a tricky set, a, a difficult set, but it was slightly tricky. Uh, I know a lot of students faltered here because they did not consider the fact that there would have to be two flights, that one in the morning, there would have to be like A to B and B to A and vice versa. So many students just counted this as that between each connection, they need two flights and then they messed up uh, royally because as you saw in each, uh, this we had to multiply by four. If you multiplied by two, you'd get the entire set wrong. So this set was not difficult as such, but it was tricky. If you didn't read the question properly, you would get the entire set wrong and you would lose a lot of marks. So always make sure that you read uh, this. As you saw, we didn't take a whole lot of time to solve these kind of questions. So always make sure that the first case led that is given, the uh, first introduction, introductory paragraph, that you read it very carefully. Each sentence has an implication. When the sentence says that somebody should be able to go to and from, that also means that if A can go to B and come back in the evening, somebody has to be able to go from B to A in the morning and come back in the evening. Always think carefully when you are reading the initial paragraph. So as you saw, this was not a difficult set if you did not get that part wrong. Mm -hmm.